It's joke. Hello, viewers, and welcome back to Kokomimi's AI presidential D&D &D campaign. Hopefully, you've returned to us from the Halloween special episode. We're getting back to the main campaign. That episode is not mandatory viewing, but it is still canon to the story. So you may want to give it a watch for something fun. All right, I believe it is Joe's turn to give the recap. Joe? I'm here. So in the last, last episode, we traversed some ruins of an old castle and found lots of strange murals. Marek sketched them out in one of his books. Donna found an old greatsword with a strange blacksmith's mark on it. I found an old book of music. We fought some ice methods on a bridge, and I think that's everything. Good enough. I'm surprised you managed to remember all that. Want to do a recap of the Halloween episode? Sure. So we all traversed a magical forest in a pocket of Feywild and met some cute little girls whose hair smelled like pumpkins. Then we found magic lights in a swamp and picked apples with some hags. Donna carried me like a princess to safety. We had mushroom stew with Mem and her house scared me because it was dark. And Mem is not suspicious at all, in no way whatsoever. All right, you kind of fell apart at the end there. Do either of you want to clean that up? We caught will-o'-wisps in a swamp, had to sort poison apples from good ones, went to a party at Mem's house, and got back some items that her myconettes had stolen. And Mem is definitely suspicious as hell. I told you all that there was something weird about her, but you wouldn't listen. No, I believed you. I just didn't want to anger her while we were trapped in our own plane of existence. That would have been an easy way to get killed. Hmm, fair enough. Anyway, no one has helped me figure out the blacksmith's mark on my new greatsword? Plenty of the comments made guesses, Donald. Anyway, I think I have an idea. Let me see your character sheet. Ah, yep. Remember that weird dagger we found in the very first temple? We haven't mentioned it much since finding it, so it doesn't surprise me that it sort of slipped our minds. Oh yeah, that thing, I forgot about that. I searched it for magical properties, but I don't believe Ben gave us more information about its appearance. We pretty much ignored it as far as I remember. Ben, anything to say about this dagger we found? <laughs> you got it. As you three turn the dagger in hand, you notice a very small sigil on the handle of the dagger. It matches the sigil encrusted on Donna's new greatsword. Cool. So the great sword and the dagger share the same smith. That's all well and good, but what does it mean for the rest of the story? Good question. I'm not sure yet, but we found that dagger in a chest in the first temple, right? And Mem suggested that the goddess herself can influence the treasure found in the dungeons. It's interesting, at least. I'm not sure what it means either. Speaking of, we should talk about Mem. We left the last episode with a huge bomb of information. And do you remember what that information was, Joe? In the last episode, Mem told us that she is a red cap, a type of blood, thirsty monster. Joe, we talked about this. You can't use the teleprompter when we play Dungeons and Dragons. How did you know? I've known you for many years, Joe. You can't hide these things from me. Joe's teleprompter aside, I told you guys that there was something up with her, and surprise, surprise, I was right. I already told you that I agreed with you, Donald. I just didn't think it was a good idea to bring it up around Mem. How were we supposed to escape that pocket of Feywild without her help, or the Myconets? Ben would have given us a way out. Or you three could make new characters to investigate the disappearance of Merrick, Donna, and Benjen. Wouldn't that be a way to start a campaign? Of course, I'd have to find a way to circumvent all the world knowledge that you've accumulated. But I could figure something out. And go through those two dungeons again? Hell no, Ben! Then let that be some motivation for you not to die or kill one of us off, Donald. Regardless, you all got out. That's what matters. We're back to the main campaign, or are we? Merrick, perhaps you do know of a way you all could have escaped that pocket of Feywild. Oh, are we doing that now, as part of a regular episode? Yep. Donald and Joe, here are some temporary character sheets. Hold on to those for just a minute. What, what's going on? Who the hell is this Mary Vineweather? Donald is going to play my mom. What? Your mom? What? It, no way. Are we doing his backstory right now? I don't want to play his mom. Make Joe do it. That would be difficult since he's playing Merrick's father. Um, say hello to Papa. 
No fair, he got to be the dad last time. It's my turn. Trust me on this, guys. I don't want to do this. I didn't agree to this. It won't be for the whole episode. Just give it a try. You can't make me do this. You can't make me play a loving, doting mother or whatever. I didn't say you had to. That's how I knew you would be perfect for this role. Now, are we all ready? Merrick, you decide to finally tell your companions a bit more of what you know about the Feywild and your experiences therein. Perhaps your past will shed some light on Mem's nature. Perhaps not. We'll see. Right. Guys, I think I should tell you a bit more about myself, especially how I knew so much about the Feywild. If I remember correctly, you didn't know all that much. Just some general information. Shut it, Donna, and play along. Anyway, let me tell you two how I ended up here in the first place. It's only fair since Donna told us all about her home tribe. Merrick is recounting the days that led up to his prophetic dream and recounting the events just prior to his journey to Melodia and meeting with Donna and Benjen. Let's introduce our characters for this double feature. I'll still be playing Merrick, same as always. Apparently I am playing Mary Vinweather, a wood elf ranger, but I'm not happy about it. And I am Chadwick Purbit, a nobleman who sometimes moonlights as a bard. Oh, a bard just like Benjen. I bet they would be good friends. Ben, you've told us nothing about how these characters are supposed to act. This is Merrick's backstory, isn't it? Because I know both you and Joe will fulfill the roles perfectly without direction. Play them as you like. I have a bad feeling about this. A bit of background, if you will. Chadwick, you are a med noble that oversees the town of Arborage, a holding situated near lush forests. The main source of income for the town is as a resting location for travelers and merchants exporting goods, as the town is situated smack dab between several large cities. Travel to and from these larger cities can take over a week, so Arborage was created as a go-between and resting spot for busy travelers. It also often serves as a mediator between the cities. Thus, it has developed the reputation of being a town in good balance. Good people, good manners, and a good life for all. It is a quiet town with calm fields, and the local noble, Chadwick Purbet, is well-liked by the people. Of course, I'm a man of the people if we ever saw one. Where the hell do I come in with all of this? I'm getting to that. The town was even welcoming when Chadwick announced his marriage to an elven woman, despite the fact that the town is mostly inhabited by humans and the odd halfling and dwarf household. Mary, you were welcomed with open arms into this town and became the honored wife of a med noble. Hold up, what do you mean by med noble? If we were ranking the power structure of this world, Chadwick would be in the middle. He's not a lesser noble, but he's also not an arch noble. Tell me that I married up in class, Ben. Tell me that I'm not that stupid. Ah, Mary. You were born in a village of wood elves inhabiting the Feywild. Your community was very exclusive, thriving off the magic of the forest and revering the god of nature. You almost never welcomed visitors to the village, with the exception of a few. Among those, years ago, was a young traveler who had gotten lost in the plain. You fell for his angelic voice and talent with a lute, but the village abhorred your relationship. If you were to be with him, you would have to leave your village and live with him in the material plane. Well, at least he's a noble. I can respect her for marrying up. Granted, he did promise you riches and a comfortable life in his home when you both returned. It was almost enough to make you feel less bitter about leaving your village. No way, if I'm marrying rich, I'm fine with it. It's just a shame that Chadwick's supposed life of comfort was nowhere near what you were accustomed to. And once your son was born, things only got worse. Your home village no longer allowed you to visit with your child. What the hell? I got exiled for getting married and I didn't even marry Uppy? When your son began to show an interest in magic, things grew even more difficult. Your family despised his use of magic, saying that it was an affront to nature magic that ran through the veins of your home village. It would have been so much easier if he showed an interest in the bow or swords, or even if he liked druidic magic, but that wasn't so. What the hell? This is even worse, and it's all Merrick's fault. Without him, I could go visit home or whatever. Now I'm exiled for good. Hey, <laughs> hey. Well, now, let's start. We open this memory with the family at the breakfast table in Arbridge. Merrick, you finished the coursework of yet another tutor, provided by your loving father. 
Of course, anything for my lovely son. How did you find this teacher? You always get through their work so quickly. You're smart as a whip, my boy. Haha, <laughs> thanks, Dad. Father. I'm so very proud of you, my son. You have the makings of an archmage. We shall have to send away for another tutor for you so that you can continue your studies. I am so very eager to feed that growing brain of yours. Mary, my love, do you have something to say to our boy? Screw this kid. I hate this life. I hate this place. I knew this would be the perfect dynamic. Surely you don't mean that, mother. You ruined my life, both of you. I could be living in the Feywild as a queen instead of this shitty little town. What, I fell in love with some bard and he lured me back here? I feel cheated. Don't be like that, dear. Don't you start with me. I won't stand for this. At least not in front of our beloved son, dear. Don't you talk to me like that. Hmm. You're such a delight, mother. I simply cannot believe that Mary was tricked into coming to this plane only to live a life of squalor and destitution. We're looking at the same image of the house, right? You call that destitution? Ben said that I would have had a better life in the Feywild. Therefore, this is destitution. Mary has been lied to. Donna would never stand for this outrage. Ben, how do I get out of here? I'm going back to my home village. I'll tell them that I was charmed or put under a spell. They'll let me back in. You're just going to abandon me and father like that? You can't be serious. This may be your backstory, Merrick, but I won't stand for this outrage. Screw this. Mary, if you would like to leave for your village, there is a way to do so. Given to all who leave, the village is an amulet that will allow you to open a portal to the Feywild. Together with the right incantation, you can attune the amulet to deliver you back to your home village. Sounds a lot like what Mem did to get us out of the pocket of Feywild in the Halloween episode. Indeed. That jogged a bit of Merrick's memory, I suppose. You know, this was supposed to be my backstory. Mary is sort of turning it into a story about her. Just like you meant to trample on the plight of a woman. I'm kidnapped and forced to live her as a slave, and now you are taking away my voice. That's a little dramatic, Mother. Shut up. This is all your fault. If I hadn't had a son, then everything could go back to normal. That isn't exactly... Ah, uh, Mother, I'm sure if I demonstrated my prowess to the elders of your village, they would welcome you back. And me as well. I don't want to be disinherited by the village of my ancestors. Ben, how do we make the village see that my son isn't a failure? Ah, well, first of all, he isn't a failure. He's gifted with magic. But secondly, like I said, your village doesn't appreciate an interest in magic like he has. They revere nature and would only accept druidic magic. Easy, I'll pay Withers a hundred gold and you can change your class, my son. It is a mere pittance of coin. Yeah, what the hell are you talking about, Joe? Isn't that how it works? We're not playing Baldur's Gate, Joe. Damn, I was sure I had it that time. Mother, let me try to prove myself to your village. I know I can do it. Isn't there some sort of elder or someone we can talk to? Is there, Ben? You'll have to go and find out. Then let's go. All of us? I guess we have to bring your father, too. Fine. Come on, Chadwick. Gonna meet up with the in-laws, are we? I should prepare a gift for them. I don't think there's time for that, father. Nope. We're leaving now. All right, then. Mary, you produce an intricate amulet adorned with complex elven sigils and seals. As you hold it above your head, it glows a vibrant green, and you sing an ancient melody passed down through generations of your home village. The light envelops yourself and your family, blinding you. When your vision clears, you find yourself in the familiar village of your home in the Feywild. Nothing has changed in these years, though perhaps it hasn't been so long after all. Time, as you know, moves differently here. Hold on, blow up that picture of the village so I can see it better. What the hell, Ben? You said I was living in luxury here compared to my life in the material plane. What the hell is this? Tree houses? Gross. I changed my mind. Take me back. But mom, we've just arrived. You can leave, Mary, but you'd be leaving your husband and son here. Done. I'm out. And also, you'd be absent from the rest of this backstory. What do you mean? You just have to sit back and be quiet while we play out the scenario. Never mind, I'm staying. Thought so. All right, then. Let's continue. Like I said, as your vision clears, you can see a village built among the trees. The buildings are carved from wood and adorned with intricate designs. The smell of wildflowers and honey wafts through the village. Marek, the village is distantly familiar to you.
Perhaps you have visited her once before, when you were very young, but the memory is faint. Mother, have you brought me here before? Apparently so, since I got exiled for having a wizard as a son. I'm rather proud of our boy. Your family should be too, Mary. Look around. His home is wonderful as you imagined in your nostalgia. I have to admit, I thought it would be better. Back home on the material plane is better than this. I knew you'd come around, dear. When we married, I promised that I would take care of you, and I've kept my promise, haven't I? Apparently so. Apparently it's our dungeon master who is a liar. So, are we just going to go back home now? Are you kidding? We're going to rub it in everyone's faces and make them regret cutting me out of their life. Donald, don't forget that this is supposed to be my character's backstory. Now it's our backstory. I thought you were allergic to communism, Donald. What? Never mind that. Let's get back to the story. Right. Upon the arrival of Merrick and his parents, several wood elves of the village descend to them from their tree houses. Their frowns deepen upon seeing Mary. One of them speaks up, who Mary recognizes as Ilthorn, one of the village leaders. Mary, I didn't expect you to return to our village. Mostly because the last time you were here, we told you that you were no longer welcome. So why have you shown up again? Leave. Or we shall make you. Uh. Well, Matt, I am... I know who you are. More importantly, I know what you are. Excuse me? Wow, even in fantasy, I can't escape racism. What are you talking about? We don't care about your race. Well, not as much as other things. Then what exactly is the problem? We are more concerned with your interest in magic than your being half-human. Your studies in the arcane do not align with our village's interests. I am shocked that your mother permitted such things. It goes to show how ill-aligned she is with her former home. Ben, I'm confused about something. Yes? I thought all elves were in tune with magic and such. Why is it that these elves don't like it? A part of their culture and world building. But is it the case for all wood elves or just this village? Perhaps we'll explore the answer to that question as the campaign continues. Listen, my son is a super genius who inherited his intellect from his mother. How dare you spurn the both of us? What about me, darling? And my husband's rich, so you should accept him too. We have no interest in material wealth either. Clearly you learned nothing, living in our village. I'm ashamed to see you here, Mary. Hey, listen. Just because she doesn't ascribe to your beliefs doesn't mean you can talk to her that way. Yeah, what he said. Hmm, he is not a total disappointment after all. I can't tell if Mary loves or hates me. You claim that your son is not a disappointment. That you have not betrayed all that this village has taught you? A test, then. We will put you to a test to see if you truly retain the spirit of this village. Very well. I will pass your test and prove myself. What do I have to do? Bring us the acorn of a dryad to commune with our village. That's all? That's all? You say. We will see how difficult a task you find it to be. Go now. Do not return until you complete the task. Bring us a fresh acorn. We will be waiting. He turns away from the family, sending them off with a blast of magic that repels them from the village and deeper into the Feywild. We had better do this quickly. No telling what we'll run into out here. Mother, how should we go about finding a dryad for this trial? Mary, you know much about dryads, a fey creature bonded to a tree. Each dryad protects her tree with reverence as their life is tied to the growth of the tree. If the tree were to die, then so would the dryad. Wish I had my ax if we're going tree chopping. Mother, I doubt your nature revering village would want us to chop down a tree. Indeed, besides, we weren't tasked with hunting a dryad, but instead bringing an acorn back to the village. Do we know if they will easily part with one? Mary can also recall that the fruit of dryads trees is a precious resource, one that they treat like children. They care for the seeds of their trees with gentle magic until the seeds are ready to grow into their own trees. So it isn't going to be easy to get one if they regard them similar to their own children. Don't worry, my darlings. We can do this if we work together. We are a wonderful team. All right, Ben, we got to find a dryad tree or whatever. Indeed you do. Why don't you roll nature, Mary? Wait, let me do it. This trial is to prove my worth to the village after all. 
I rolled an 18. Marek, thanks to your study of magic, you were able to navigate the dense trees and hone in on the arcane aura of a dryad's tree. The one you find is a medium-sized tree with broad leaves and ample shelter, shining in the middle of the forest. As you approach, the figure of a woman peeks out from behind the trunk, watching Marek and his parents. The woman speaks in a low voice, in an unknown language. Mary, it is somewhat familiar to you, but you can't figure out the meaning of the words. It's a language you've heard in hushed tones around your village growing up. Do I know what it is? Even if I can't understand the meaning, maybe I can figure out what language it is. Or Mary can roll for this, since she sort of recognizes it. All right, what am I rolling? Roll religion. 17. Nice. I was going to let you roll with advantage, but you didn't need it. Mary, the language the Dryad is speaking is Druidic. She's speaking Druidic. Not, none of us speak that, I don't think. Ah, Druidic, the secret language of Druids. Chadwick has been pretty quiet this session. How about he rolls history to fill us in a bit about Druidic? 19. The good luck continues. Chadwick. You can recall that the secret language, Druidic, is passed down through circles and only taught to fellow Druids. It is forbidden for others to learn the language. Huh, a special language passed down only to Druids. Interesting. Maybe the Dryad speaks another language. Excuse me, miss. The Dryad speaks another sentence in Druidic and her face drops with annoyance. Finally, she clears her throat and speaks again, this time in common. What are you doing here? What do you want? She regards the family with suspicion. We were sent on a trial by my mother's home village of Wood Elves. They want us to bring back. I'm not sure if I should actually tell her what we're seeking. Let's ask nicely. We were sent to fetch an acorn and bring it back to the village. The Dryad's eyes narrow. My acorns are not for you to pluck and take away. Ah, I forgot to ask nicely. Miss Dryad, please may we have one of your lovely acorns to take back to the village? No, you may not. Pretty please? No, that is my final answer. Now go. I guess we have to do this the hard way. Combat it is. Somehow it always comes to this. I'll tell the Dryad. If you won't give us an acorn, then we'll just have to take only by force. That's what the character sheets are for. For those listening or visually impaired, Chadwick the Bard is level 4 with 27 hit points and a 14 armor class. Mary the Ranger is level 5 with 39 hit points and an armor class of 15. Finally, Marek the Baby Wizard is level 1 with 6 hit points and an armor class of 11. Ah, the good old days. Make sure you hide behind Papa Marek. I will keep you safe. Let's all roll initiative. I got 15. I got 19. I got 14. The Dryad got a 13. The initiative order will go Mary, Marek, Chadwick, and then the Dryad. Then I'm up first. I'll attack twice with my longbow. 21 and 23 to hit. Both hit. Give me the total for your damage. 17 total damage. Want to narrate how it goes down? I string my bow and stretch back the strings, letting out a war cry. My years of training and precision have taught me well, and my deadly aim hits the dryad with devastating force. They're arrows, mother. You're not swinging an axe. Shut up, Merrick. You're grounded. I... Yes, mother. The arrows hit the dryad, causing significant damage, but she's not down for the count yet. It's Merrick's turn. I will make you all proud. Uh, I will cast magic missile. That hits automatically. Roll for damage. The darts do five, four, and two damage, so 11 total. Excellent. How does it go down? Sticking behind father, I let out the missiles from my hands, just as I have studied and practiced at home it is exhilarating to be able to use my magic in real combat, if not a little frightening. The missiles hit the Dryad one after another, and she flinches in pain. After the attack of Mary and Merrick, she is looking quite tired. Then it's my turn. Ben, does a Dryad count as a person? Hmm. In what context? I was going to try casting Charm Person on her to keep us safe. I'll allow it for now. Let's see what happens. Got it. In that cast, I cast Charm Person on the Dryad. The wisdom save is 13. The spell fails. Why dang it. Good try, though. 
I'll also use Bardic Inspiration on Mary, since she's probably going to be our main damage dealer in this fight. Go, Mary. I'll keep our son safe and protected. And I'll handle this tree lady. Give us your best shot. She certainly will. It's the Dryad's turn. First, she casts Entangle around Chadwick and Merrick. Both of you make strength saving throws and tell me what you get. I got a six. I got a four. As the vines sprout up underneath the two of you, you find your legs and feet entangled. You are now restrained and unable to move unless you succeed at a strength saving throw. Oh no. Oh dear. Worry not, son. Papa will protect you. Merrick is an adult in this story, isn't he? It's kind of pathetic that he has to hide behind his father. Dang. The Dryad also targets Mary with her Fey Charm. Mary, make a wisdom saving throw. 21. Mary, you are able to shake off the magical charm of the Dryad. She cannot target you with this charm again. Sweet, anything else or is it my turn now? Your turn now. The Dryad remains rooted to her tree, so to speak. Very funny. All right, I'll hit with my longbow again. I go hide behind a tree or something, but I don't want to leave Merrick and Chadwick. Oh, honey, that is so sweet. Shut your mouth and let me roll these hits. 14 and 17 to hit. Both of those hit. Then that's 17 damage. Mary is a beast. I let out another war cry and pew, pew. Two more arrows at the Dryad. Take that stupid tree. As the arrows hit, the Dryad stumbles. You hear her voice, somewhat small and weak. I will protect them. An abomination like you cannot have them. The acorns. All this fuss for some stupid acorns. Oh, well, sounds like she'll be dead soon. My turn. I'll use magic missile again. The missiles do eight total damage. Is that enough to finish off the Dryad? Yep, go ahead and narrate how it goes down. Following Mother's battle cry, I ignore the vines twisting around my legs and release three more missiles of magic force right at the Dryad. And as they hit her, the Dryad stumbles again and again, breaking her concentration from the entanglement spell and slamming her against the tree. As the last missile hits, she collapses against the trunk, dead. Nice, that's my boy. We did it. Go ahead and pick a nice acorn, my boy. You earned it. The Dryad's tree is laden with plump acorns on each branch, many within reach with a simple stretch, Merrick. I'll grab one. That's that, I suppose. Let's see what the village has to say now. Indeed. The three of you quickly make it back to the village within a half hour, only to find the displeased frown of Ilthorn at the entrance. We fetched the acorn, as you requested. Here you go. Bet you're feeling real stupid now. I told you my boy was strong. You should be honored to accept us back into the village. Strength was not what we were looking for in this test, Mary. How far you have fallen. He shakes his head in disappointment. You forgot the most important tenet to our life. One must respect the balance of nature and the natural order. Is he mad because we killed the Dryad to get the acorn? Killed. No, you did not kill her. As long as her tree remains, she'll be able to regenerate. Your mistake was in gathering the acorn. You did not understand the fundamental of this trial. You asked for a fresh acorn. We brought you one. The Dryad wouldn't let us take one, so we had to take one by force. Ilthorn lets out an irate huff. Patience, Mary. I did not instruct you to pick an acorn from the tree. The Dryad's seed children are dropped from the branches when they are ready to part from their home and they fall to the ground. But you asked for a fresh acorn. That would imply... You might have sat and waited for a fresh acorn to drop, couldn't you? Instead of plucking it from its home yourself. Ah. You have much to learn, all of you. I'm ashamed that you, Mary, even came from our village. You have learned nothing living here nor living away. I am... disappointed. And especially... of you. He looks right at Merrick. Your mother may have failed to learn, but it is not too late for you. If you truly wish for acceptance back into your ancestral home, then you must learn. You must learn balance. You must learn the ways of nature, and you must give back to it to help right the balance of nature, where others destabilize it. Merrick, the elf's words ring in your ears. A new quest given, one to learn and grow your power not simply for knowledge and power's sake, but to serve as a protector of balance in nature. 
to promote the ideals and beliefs of your mother's family. And soon, you would hear the exact call you needed to set forth on this path of learning. Wowie. So, that's how I ended up here. And why I had so much knowledge about the Feywild before. Fascinating, and your dad was a bard too. What a nice guy. I knew there was a reason we got along so well, Merrick. True. I carry one of my father's instruments, a flute, with me. So, so you just left home to go on this journey? Your family isn't dead or anything? No. And you can go back home anytime? Yeah. Then what the hell are you doing out here? I'm pretty sure we've had this argument before, Donald. Or Donna. Besides, not everyone needs a tragic backstory. Maybe one day in our campaign we can travel back to meet my family. That might be a fun little trip. I can play music with your papa and make much merriment. Oh, let's visit soon. Sure, once we get things settled here. Fine, sure, we can go. Donna needs a taste of the good life so she can prep for living in luxury when she destroys Bam's ass. You got it, Donald. Well, now you both know more about me. I think we should keep going where we left off on our trek. We have another temple to traverse. Sounds like a plan. The party's trek through the mountains is labor intensive. Although compared to the heavy foliage of the forest, it is much easier to see oncoming ambushes or approaching monsters. Thus, your journey through the terrain is peaceful apart from the hike. After a day or so in the rocky landscape, the party comes across the shadow of a village on the horizon. As they approach, what appeared to be a village clears up as little more than a collection of three or four makeshift houses. In the center of the homes is a gigantic pine, atop of which you can spot the outline of a nest as well as the foundations of a building. Around the tree, closer to the makeshift homes, are smaller saplings of pine, cypress, and other evergreen varieties. As the party approaches the village, you hear the caw of a bird high above your heads and the flap of feathered wings. An Arakakra male lands before you, wielding a wooden spear. He is armored with light plate and preens his bright red plumage. It has been many years since we had a visitor to our settlement. We were expecting more of you much sooner. What a magnificent being. I've never seen such fine feathers in my life. Benjamin's words seem to please the stranger. Hmm, you have good taste, friend. Hark, look at how my wingspan shines in the sun. He stretches out his wings for the party to admire and waits for more words of praise. Oh, that's a guy, right? Damn it, Ben. You broke the tradition of giving us waifus when we enter a new town of this campaign. I was so excited to see what you had prepared for us this time. Don't discount me just yet. I have something prepped. Don't you worry. I'm surprised you've adopted that lingo, Donald. You're starting to sound like Joe. Yeah, about that. I've been bored during trial, so I asked Joe to send me some show recommendations, and he introduced me to anime. Oh, dear. Oh, no. What shows have you been watching, Donald? Don't worry. I've only been showing him the most cultured titles in order to cultivate a sophisticated palette of taste in anime. I've been watching Monster Musume to prep for all the monster girls and waifus in our campaign. Haven't you watched more from the list I sent you? I prefer to marathon the shows one at a time, Joe, instead of watching five different shows episode by episode. Besides, I have to double check some of the titles you send me because I learned recently that some of these shows are made for girls. What are you trying to say, Joe? You know, that's just an arbitrary genre classification, Donald. So you say, but I started watching Vampire Night because I thought it was going to be some badass story about hunting vampires. Imagine my surprise that it's just a story about a stupid love triangle with angsty teen romance. That's an old classic, Donald. You got to work through the old classics to appreciate newer titles. I'll stop you all there before we get more off topic. I have some shows to recommend to you later, Donald. I'll trust your recommendations over Joe's. Right. Anyway. Back to meeting this NPC. He's waiting for you all to compliment him on his feathers. They are very beautiful, sir. Very well-kempt. Ah, I do apologize, but my companions and I are on a journey to... To the temple, right? That's the only reason travelers come this way. Though, like I said, we haven't had any in a number of years. I'm surprised you even know about the temple, to be honest. The Arakakra's feathers fluff in outrage. Excuse me? Do you think me to be ignorant? Of course I know about the temple. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to imply... It's just that, uh... The only settlement that knew about the temples 
was the goblin village in the middle of the rainforest. When we stopped by Saltwish on our pilgrimage, no one had any idea what the temple was there for. The Arakakra's feathers settle, but he is still noticeably annoyed. Do not group our people with those others. We answered the call to guard this temple, and that is what we plan to do. Of course, that is, as long as we can resolve the little harpy problem. Harpy problem? This is something you'll want to speak with our leader about. I must stay at my post to keep watch for ne'er-do-wells. I shall send him down to speak with you shortly. Good day. The Arakakra takes off with a flap of his wings, ascending up into the nest of the Great Pine. In another moment, he is replaced with the form of another Arakakra, this one covered in feathers, reminiscent of a bald eagle. Ah, uh, what a perfect symbol of freedom he is, yes. Gotta agree with Donna. That makes three of us. The Arakakra lands before the party and straightens his wings. He is much larger than the one before, with a grander presence, armored in finer metalwork and an enchanted spear. Well met, travelers. I am Quail, the one in charge of this outpost overlooking the cliffside temple of the Goddess of Harmony. Wow. Good to hear that we're already on the same page. Makes things faster. I'm Merrick, and this is Donna and Benjen. Yes, I gathered that much. Though... We were expecting you much sooner than this. What in the world kept you all for so long? Ah, uh, sorry? Did you receive a message from the Goddess of Harmony about us? No. It was the Druid who spoke of you. She warned us of an adventuring party who would be coming this way to access the temple. Had it been anyone else waiting for you, they might have forgotten after all this time. But I pledged to stay and wait for your arrival as well as guard the temple with my life and the lives of my men. I'm confused. Me too, something is up. Hmm, Ben, have you done something? Who is this Ben you speak of? Never mind, the druid you spoke of. That wouldn't happen to be Mavanna, would it? The very same. Her magic helped us grow this great tree as the center of our settlement. We have since been working to expand into a village that will rival Saltwish and Melodia City. I thought Mavana was going to the Rainforest Temple first. That was the plan. Unless things got a little weird. Weird how? Remember what I said about the Feywild before? Things can get a little weird in there. Especially with... time. How do you mean? Time can pass differently in the Feywild. The whole place is mad. Oh my god, so how long has it been? What is going on? Uh, Mr. Qual, how long has it been since Mavana visited you? The Arakokra thinks for a few moments before responding. Since I first met her in Melodia City and then established this outpost, I suppose it's been around four years, maybe five. Five years, are you kidding? We're the ones who are surprised. What took you three so long? What in the world have you been doing? It's a long story. Suffice it to say, the Feywild. Ah, uh, the Feywild. But I haven't heard of travelers in Melodia getting pulled to another plane. That's strange. The circumstances of us getting pulled in there were also strange, believe me. Was there a red-haired witch with Mavana when you met her? Mem, you mean? Yes, I met Mem. We're gonna need you to fill us in a bit. We're quite out of the loop. From our perspective, it's only been a few days, at most a week, since we saw them. But five years have passed? I see. This is surprising news. We can attempt to fill you in as best we can. Ben, what time of day is it? Would it be best if we made camp and talked before setting off in the morning? It's mid to late afternoon. Up to you guys what you want to do. You could chat for a bit and then set off if you like. Sounds like a plan. Quail leads the party to one of the many makeshift homes built around the patches of saplings. Since you three have no wings, you'll be staying down here, away from our main outpost. He points at the structure on top of the large evergreen, but don't fret. You three will be safe here. We keep watch from above with the utmost diligence. Thank you very much for your hospitality, Qual. I'm eager to hear the story of this village since Mem and Mavana visited. Of course, granted we haven't seen many travelers since them, but we have taken their directions to heart and begun to establish the beginnings of a town. Qual escorts you three inside one of the dwellings, a humble shelter with the bare essentials and outfitted with furs. Reminds me of home. I'm glad you are pleased. These homes are not as well built as our main outpost. As soon as the saplings grow tall enough, 
We will continue the development of the village. Until then, we have harpies to deal with. Right. The guard who met us mentioned something about that. But maybe we should start from your meeting with Mavana. Of course. It was about five years ago when I first met Miss Mavana, as she was traveling across Melodia, looking for an Ara Kokra to help reach the temple on the cliffs. I received word from the Adventurers Guild in Melodia City, who had sent out the request. I don't remember such a place in Melodia City when we visited. It's a fairly new structure, organized within the last decade, I'd say. I think Ben has more explaining to do. It's possible it's been longer than five years. The exact wording you got from Quell was, since I first met her in Melodia City and then established this outpost, I suppose it's been around four years, maybe five? Ben, time travel stuff confuses me. It's hard enough for me to keep up sometimes. And this time we're confused right alongside Joe. Now what hope do we have of straightening him out? We'll keep it in mind and keep going. Our main objective remains the same. Access the final temple in Melodia. So, Quell, about this adventurer's guild. It was established to help combat monsters in the forest and has become a source of income for many in Melodia. The guildmaster, Locke, personally helps train new adventurers in the perils of the rainforest. Of course, having wings makes navigation that much easier. Once can simply fly over the treetops as necessary. Hey, maybe when we get to a higher level, I'll be able to fly in my beast form. That seems kind of broken. But it is an interesting thought. I'll have to consider it more and try to balance out the idea. Might make some combat and problem solving more fun. Anyway, Qual continues his recounting of meeting Mavana at the Adventurer's Guild. I met the druid in Melodia City in response to the request and was able to bring her to the temple from across the cliffs. She mentioned the importance of making it easier for adventurers to reach the cliffs and asked me if I would be willing to establish a village here. I thought you were an adventurer, though. Which would you rather be? An adventurer wandering from place to place for odd jobs or the governor of a prosperous town? Huh, good point. Mavana had us set up an outpost as a way to access the temple easier. To get there, you need wings. It's much easier with our settlement nearby. Makes sense. The harpies are a new development, however. We'll need to clear them out before we can access the temple freely. We can help you clear out the harpies. Have you had to deal with them before? No. Seems they migrated from elsewhere. Ordinarily, we would not have a problem dispatching such trifling monsters, but our low numbers at this outpost puts us at a disadvantage. Your arrival will be enough to help turn the tide. But where did they migrate from? It's possible they were living in the rainforest and relocated once we set up our syrup farm. Say what now? Syrup farm! The cold temperatures up here are perfect for cultivating maple syrup. No, this isn't an American Aracocra. He's Canadian. Ben, you lied to me. I have high hopes for our syrup cultivation bringing in new arrivals and visitors. Salt Wish has their ale, and we'll have all manner of maple products. Sounds like a great plan. It'll surely pick up in popularity, and you'll have a good source of income for the village. Please cultivate ice cream for me. It's all that I want in this world. Perhaps we'll look into creating this for you. But for now, we must keep guard over our maple syrup farm. The harpies have settled close to it and are ruining our taps and stealing produce. It is a mess. We would be glad to help. Once that's taken care of, you can help us to the temple. That sounds like a plan. I feel so lied to. Is your friend all right? Just ignore her. Donna can be a bit of a drama queen. Anyway, should we deal with the harpies today or is it too late to set off? I believe if we set off, we can make it to the syrup farm quick enough before nightfall. We'll need two more flyers for your party, though there aren't many fighters in our village. We'll be relying on your prowess to win the fight. You can count on us. Then let's set off right away. Uh, how exactly are we going to get there with these Arakakra? I don't believe we can ride them like ponies. We'll slide right off. Fear not, Lady Donna. My talons shall hold you nice and secure as we fly. Ah, this seems kind of dangerous. Fear not, I'm an excellent flyer. Two more Arakokra joined Qual and the party outside, including the red-feathered guard who greeted you all as you entered the village. A white-feathered Arakokra accompanies him. This is one of our guards, Prepti. 
and an overseer of the maple farm, Zent. I would very much like to speak with you, good sir, as I have a keen interest in all things sweet and delicious. The white-feathered Aarakocra ruffles up and squawks. I'm female. Oh, my apologies. I don't know how I didn't see it. Your feathers are so, um, shiny. I thought Ben promised us more waifus in this village. This is not a waifu. Maybe you're the only waifu we need, Donna. Hmm. You're starting to get on my good side, Merrick. Quile clears his throat. If we're all ready to go, Lady Donna with me, please. I'm not carrying that rude bard. I'll take the wizard. And thus, Benjen, you'll be riding with Prepti. The Arakokra flap their great wings, sending gusts of wind in all directions, and lift off into the air. They hover in place, and then lower themselves to wrap their talons around the arms of each member of the party, lifting you into the air. Hold on tight! You're each lifted up, and cold air whips your cheeks. From the air, you can see over the island of Melodia, mostly covered in dense forest, but the area around you is made up of jagged peaks and barren rock. Deeper in the forest, Jutting out from the leaves is a solitary mountain ordinarily covered from view by foliage. Up in the air, you have a clear view of the natural feature, including the obsidian rock covering the mountain. If our flyers take a look ahead, you can see a beautiful view of Melodia's mountain, an unexplored feature of the island usually closed to adventurers. And all around you can see the dense rainforest, complete with winding rivers. Many an adventurer has come to help subdue raging wildlife, making the forest a unique source of revenue for the more foolhardy adventurers. As this is your first flight with our service, I hope you have enjoyed this brief tour of Melodia's sights. Now, onward to some harpies. Quell flaps his wings, and Prepti and Zent follow him in flight, carrying the party with them. The six of you journey northward, where the crags dip into canyons and cliffs. The land looks as if it has been drilled through from a divine tool, leaving a patchwork of plateaus standing above deep crevasses. Some of the plateaus are host to a few maple trees here and there, and you can see nests built around the trees. You hear the harpies before you see them, a soft melody rising over the sound of wind. Quell lets out a warning cry. Stay sharp! Do not let their song draw you in! Quell and the Arakokra land on the thin plateaus, setting you down safely. Prepti and Zenti fly out of combat range as they are not equipped to deal with this fight though Prepti readies an arrow in case you are in need of assistance. Quail holds a longbow, ready to join the fight. In the area are four harpies, each guarding a separate nest, though they seem to belong to the same tribe or family. Each of the harpies is singing, and their voices join together in a choir. Are the nests on the map here? They're the yellowish, bushy things around the trees. I count five of them. So you do. And there's four harpies? Yes, that's what I said. Ah, shit, Ben, we can smell your stinky BS a mile away. Let's start by rolling initiative. Before that, however, I need you all to make a wisdom saving throw. Let's see how well you all are able to resist the Harpies' luring song. 23. Harpies ain't got nothing on me. I rolled a four. This is bullshit. I have danger sense. Let me roll again with advantage. That only applies to effects you can see. The Harpies are singing to lure you in. When the comments take my side, you'll be sorry. Benjen, what did you roll? I got a seven, not good. Benjen and Donna are now charmed. On your turns, you will be forced to move closer to the harpies that charmed you. I'll note which ones you more towards when we get to your turn. The landscape of this battlefield is treacherous. To move closer to the harpies, you will need to jump from cliff to cliff. However, because the terrain is so difficult, you will be able to make a saving throw against the harpies' charm before you jump over a crevasse. And if we fail the saving throw in the jump, We'll deal with that if or when it comes to it. Ben, you are trying to kill us every session, I swear. Isn't that his job? You can also make saving throws at the end of your turn, or if you take damage. If things get bad, I guess I can always throw a fireball to wake you up. Now let's roll initiative. 10. Not good, not bad. 19. Yes, first. I rolled a 22. Looks like I'm first, Donna. Damn it. Doesn't really matter anyway. You're both charmed for your first turn. Quell rolled a nine, and the harpies rolled five, six, four, and two. The combat order will go Benjen, Donna, Merrick, Quell, and then the four harpies. Benjen, you will go first. While you are charmed, I'll narrate your movement. Okie doke. Benjen, you start off on one of the lower cliffs of this map, behind a large tree with a tap. 
You have been charmed by the top left harpy. Benjen, you step towards the harpy, coming into next to the cliff's edge. You must jump to your left in order to reach the next ledge. I'll need you to roll athletics to see if you can make the jump while charmed. Got it. I rolled a seven. Not good. Not good. You will need to make a wisdom saving throw to see if you can break free of the harpy's charm. Uh, a 10. Is that good enough? Ah, uh, so close, but no. You remain charmed by the harpy. So what? Is he just going to walk off the cliff? Before Benjen can walk off the cliff, Qual flies over and pulls him up into the air. Since he needed to save Benjen, however, that will consume his turn this round. Donna, you're up next. Donna, you begin the combat on the same cliff as Benjen, but closer to the right edge. Just like Benjen, you are charmed, but this time by... The bottom left harpy. You cross over the tiny plateau and prepare to make the same jump that Benjen was going to make. Donna, roll athletics. I rolled an eight. That is some bullshit. Make a wisdom saving throw to see if you can break the harpy's charm. All right, I rolled an 11. Is that enough? Yes, you've done it. Donna, thanks to your terror and nearly tumbling over the cliff, you managed to break through the harpy's charm. You can no longer be charmed by this harpy, but next turn, you will need to make another throw to see if you get charmed by a different harpy. Since you didn't make the jump, I'll allow you to make an action this turn. What would you like to do? I'm going to rip a section of my shirt and stuff it in my ears. Hmm, not a conventional action, but I'll allow it. Since you're a barbarian, I'll say it automatically succeeds. You can easily tear a section of your clothing off in mere moments and block out the harpy's song with the fabric. Good thinking, Donna. However, Donna, I'm going to deafen you when it isn't your turn. You can't hear what your teammates are saying during their turn. Makes sense. We can't exactly formulate an easy plan. Fair enough, Ben. You can still hear me giving instructions, of course, but make sure you cover your ears during Benjen, Merrick, and Qual's turns. Fine, I'm going to make a, an attack with my crossbow. I want to target the harpy that charmed Benjen. Got it. I rolled an eight to hit. That will miss. Donna, even as you load a crossbow bolt and send it soaring to one of the harpies, the monster laughs and twists out of the way. She continues with her song, keeping Benjen charmed. Damn it! Merrick is up next. Merrick, you start off the combat on a very small cliff just above Benjen and Donna's position. No problem. I can use Misty Step to move around. But first, I want to kill off one of these harpies if I can. I'll cast Fireball as a third level spell and aim for the harpy that is charming Benjen. Deck save is 13. And the harpy rolled a critical failure. This means that, Merrick, you're doing max damage on this harpy. So that's 48 damage. Holy shit. Merrick, that will one-shot the harpy. Consumed with rage at the harpy charming my friends, I gather flaming magic in my hands and hurl it at the monster. What happened? The harpy is dead already? Even if Donna can't hear me, she can see me nod, grin, and flash a thumbs up. Are you done with your turn, Merrick? As a bonus action, I'll misty step to the bottom rightmost cliff. I don't like being stuck on that tiny little cliff. I can just imagine one of the harpies pushing me to my death. Now it's Quail's turn. Luckily, he can fly while holding onto Benjen with his feet and still attack with a longbow. I think I forgot to mention this, but he's classed as a ranger. Just like Mom! Quell notches two arrows, one after another, hitting one of the harpies with deadly precision. He has aimed for the top right harpy, and the arrows hit their target, doing 16 piercing damage. Now it is the harpy's turn. The bottom right harpy flies over to Marek and Donna. She lands before them, swiping at Marek with her claws, but in her rage, she only manages to tear at the air. She continues singing her song. We'll wait until your turns to see if you become charmed by the harpies, so don't worry about that for now. The bottom left harpy flies to the nest situated in the middle of the cliffs and continues her song. The top right harpy also flies towards Merrick and Donna, similarly making an attack with her claws. Her claws barely graze Merrick, not doing any damage apart from giving you a nasty shock. Dang. I thought those would hit. Now we're at the top of the round. Benjen. You are restrained by Qual's talons holding you up in the air, but you are no longer charmed since Merrick killed the harpy whose song enamored you. Yes, time for me to shine. Not so fast. Make another wisdom saving throw to see if you become charmed by the other harpy's songs. Dang it. Oh, never mind. I rolled a dirty 20. All good. Benjamin, you are safe. You are able to fight off the harpy's charm. Um, then I will cast 
hideous laughter on the harpy in the middle nest, the one far away from Merrick and Donna. I don't want them to get charmed and try to make a jump like I did. All right, let's see how that goes. Wisdom save is 14. The harpy rolled a nine so your spell works. Want to tell a joke or something? Hmm. Let me see if I can think of one. Why did the chicken go to school? It's to get an education. Too bad Donna didn't hear that one. Benjamin's pun sends the harpy into a fit of laughter, breaking her concentration from the singing. I will also use bardic inspiration on Donna and end my turn. Donna, he used bardic inspiration on you. Hell yeah! Also, it's your turn. The middle harpy is incapacitated, laughing from Benjamin's joke. Was it a good joke? You're not sure. You didn't hear. Well, anyway, my turn. Just as a note, two harpies are in melee range. Also, since you are deafened, you don't need to make a saving throw to resist the harpy's song. Uh, I'm going to do something I haven't done yet. Time to use my new trident. I'll attack the harpy to the left. 13 and 18 to hit. Both of those hit. Yes, total damage is 20 piercing damage and an extra 16 radiant damage. That is going to kill another harpy. Wow. This trident is so godly. I stab at the monster with my trident and beams of light pierce its feathers with each of my swipes. Behold the light of the sea. The holy light finishes off the second harpy, leaving two remaining. I'm surprised Donna did that much damage without even raging. Damn it, I forgot to rage. Donna, with your ears clogged, you didn't hear Merrick's comment. But you do realize after finishing off the harpy that you managed to kill it without breaking a sweat or making use of your barbarian bonus actions. Now it's Merrick's turn. Another fireball would be useful here. But do I have the space to attack another harpy without harming myself or Donna? Probably, but you'd need to step further away. I'll do that. I'll use Misty Step back to where I was standing before and then cast Fireball as a third level spell. Deck save is 14. And it hits. What's the damage? 33 damage. All right. That will almost finish off the harpy, but not quite. Merrick is really frying some chicken today. Yeah, but I used all my third level spell slots. Ordinarily, I'd be more cautious, but these cliffs are making me nervous. Ben added some peril to this fight just by making it possible for us to plummet to our death. Fair enough. Anyway, after Merrick's attack, the harpy is looking extremely close to death, her feathers singed and smoking. Next up is Qual, still holding on to Benjen. He notches an arrow and looses it at the singed harpy, finishing it off with a piercing strike. He aims at the final harpy, dealing 12 piercing damage at the laughing monster. Unfortunately, it isn't enough to kill the monster, and the harpy is now broken out of the effects of Benjamin's spell. The harpy flies towards Merrick and Donna, weak and near death. She attacks with her claws, but the attacks are useless. She is too weak to fight back. Instead of going back to singing, the harpy lets out a high-pitched scream, rattling you to the core. Benjamin, we're back to your turn. I'm going to aim for another killing blow. I'll cast Sacred Flame. Deck save is 12. And it hits. What's the damage? 11 damage. Is that enough to finish it? Sure is. How does it go down? I close my eyes in a prayer to the goddess. Radiant flames descend from the sky, striking down the harpy monster. As the final harpy falls, Qual sets Benjen down on the ground and lands with the party. But it's not over yet. You hear the flap of more wings and a high-pitched screech before another harpy lands in the middle nest. She is more elaborately dressed than the others, and her feathers are more meticulously maintained. We'll keep the same initiative order as before, but the Harpy Queen will be getting off the first attack. She lets out a magical blast of cold towards the party. I'll need each of you to make a constitution saving throw and tell me what you get. I rolled an 11. Same here, 11. I rolled a 17. Merrick and Donna, you both will take 14 points of cold damage in the wake of the icy blast. Not good, at least it's just one enemy this time. Is Donna still deaf? Yes, this Harpy can still sing after all. With that, we'll go back to the top of the round with Benjen's turn. Okie doke, I'm going to use Vicious Mockery. Wisdom save is 14. It hits. What's the damage? Six damage. This harpy is so ugly she makes onions cry. That damage is peanuts, Benjen. You aren't supposed to be able to hear, Donna. She's right. It isn't too good. I don't have a lot of damage spells in my roster. I'll need to add one or two when I can. Also, as a bonus action... I will cast Healing Word on Merrick. It heals him for seven hit points. Next up is Donna. The Harpy is not in melee range. 
Got it. I'll go for crossbow attacks then. 15 and a natural 20. Both hit. Then that's 16 piercing damage. And it's my turn. If this harpy can do that much damage with her ice breath, I want to finish her off as quick as possible. I'm going to move a bit away so that we aren't all grouped up, and then I'll cast Acid Arrow as a second level spell. 24 to hit and 9 damage. That hits, and the harpy will take some additional damage at the end of her turn. Next is Quell. He joins you in the barrage of attacks, using his longbow to attack, though only one of his arrows pierces the harpy's feather-like armor, dealing 11 piercing damage. Angry and fatigued, the harpy begins to sing her luring song. Each of you make a wisdom saving throw, except for Donna, who is still deaf. 23, these harpies can't charm me. Ha! Natural 20, I'm safe this time. Quowl rolled an 11, which would have been enough for the other harpies, but not this one. Quowl is now charmed. He will continuously move towards the harpy during his turns, just like the rules we used before. We need to quickly break that charm and make sure he's safe. Although he can fly, so at least he won't fall off the cliffs. True, but he is our new buddy. We'll save him. Also, the harpy takes an additional four acid damage from Merrick's acid arrow spell. Now we're back to the top of the round. Benjen, it's your turn. I'm going to go for hideous laughter to break the harpy's song. Wisdom save is 14. And she rolls a 14. Sorry, Benjen. Dang it. Okay, then uh, can I use bardic inspiration on Quail? Sure. He can add it to his saving throw on his turn. Donna, it's your turn. Crossbow time again, 19 and 12 to hit. Only one of those hits. And it does seven piercing damage. Not great, but at least we're making progress. How positive of you, Donna. I can't hear you, Merrick. The Harpy Queen's eyes flick between all of you. Merrick, it's your turn now. Right, I'll go for another acid arrow. I wanna finish this fight up quick before she starts charming us again. And I rolled a critical failure. Ah, bad luck. That's all right. I'm still breathing. It's Quell's turn now. He is still under the effects of the harpy's charm and begins to fly closer to her. He lands next to her nest. Before he ends his turn, however, he gets to make another saving throw. And he rolled a critical failure. All right, then. Moving on. Benjen, back to you. I'm going for hideous laughter again. And the Harpy Queen rolled a 17 on the saving throw. Shoot, this is not going well. I'll use my last bardic inspiration on Donna. Get her, Donna. Donna can't hear you. Huh? Donna, you feel a swell of inspiration from some unknown reason. You can't hear Benjen's cheerful music or voice to uplift you. It must be some sort of divine intervention. Yeah, right. More like the gods have acknowledged Donna's supreme beauty and might. It's my turn now, right? I'll attack again with my crossbow, 13 and 17 to hit. One of those hits, unless you add the extra roll from Bardic Inspiration. Right, so that's 17 and 17. Both hit, and that'll be five piercing damage. This stinks. I need a better ranged weapon. Your trident is a ranged weapon. I'm not throwing my trident so that you can take it away from me again, Ben. Merrick, your turn. I'll cast Firebolt as a cantrip. I was going to use Ice Knife, but I'm afraid of hitting Quail. Oh yeah, good call. 19 to hit and 13 damage. Not bad for a cantrip. Great, actually. Your spell hits the Harpy Queen with devastating heat, leaving her heavily wounded. Qual is still charmed standing near the Harpy. He gets to make a saving throw at the end of his turn, and it's a success. He finally fights off the Harpy's charm and comes back to his senses. But perhaps it is not soon enough. The Harpy Queen attacks him with her claws three times, and two of the swipes make contact with him, dealing 23 slashing damage. Is he okay? He's holding on, but it's clear he won't be able to take another attack like that. The Harpy Queen is even more wounded, though. Benjen, we're back to you. What do you want to do? I'm going to attack with my dagger by throwing it. Haven't done that yet this campaign. 16 to hit. Is that enough? Yeah, that hits. And it does nine piercing damage? That's going to finish off the Harpy Queen. How does it go down? I look between my friends, ready to protect them all and aim my trusty dagger at the monster. With a flick of my wrist, I throw it, and it slashes the monster between the eyes. Within another moment, it is back in my hands, thanks to the magical sheath that recalls it to me when thrown. Excellent. The Harpy Queen collapses in her nest, finally dead, leaving the adventurers victorious. We did it. 
There were a couple of heavy blows in there, but we did it. Nice. I'll take the cloth out of my ears so I can finally hear. See, Quell? Harpies are no match for us. The Aracocra stands proudly, his feathers puffed. So I see. This is excellent. We should retire for the evening to heal our wounds, and you can prepare to enter the temple tomorrow, now that the path forward is clear and safe. We also thank you. Now we can continue syrup production. Sounds delicious. I'm eager to try it soon. I doubt they would have some ready so quickly, Benjen. We'll have to wait a while for the syrup. Pui, let a man dream. Uh, let's go back to the village for some warm food and drink, boys. Then we can regale the other Aracocra with tales of this fight. Indeed. We can host you well tonight before your journey tomorrow. With that, the party will set back off to the Aracocra village for a long rest. We'll end the video here and start back up in the next video with the final temple of Melodia. I hope you all are excited to explore yet another dungeon. I'm mostly eager to learn some more lore. I hope there's more information dropped in this next dungeon. And as always, I'm ready to get some new treasure. I'll have a new song to play for the goddess, praise be. Thank you all for watching this video and being so patient with the upload schedule. The holiday season kept our writer busy. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and a comment telling us what you thought, as well as subscribing to help support the channel. We'll see you all very soon. Hello viewers, and welcome back to Kokomimi's AI Presidential D&D campaign. We hope you all enjoyed the winter holidays and welcome you into this new year. Now, it is Barack's turn to give the recap. In the last main episode of the campaign, we finally learn Merrick's backstory, leading up to his journeying on this adventure. Merrick is the son of a gentle med noble of Arbridge named Chadwick Purbit, who sometimes moonlights as a bard. His mother is a wood elf ranger named Mary Vineweather, who originates from a village in the Feywild. Mary was exiled from her home village, mostly because of Merrick's interest in magic, which is seen as an affront to the values of her home community. In order to prove his worth to the village, Merrick and his family endeavored to impress the elders of the community, but failed. Now, he is inspired to take a leading role in restoring the balance of nature and understanding what this means in the world. In the current timeline, our party, Marek, Benjen, and Donna, arrived at the Arakokra village outpost situated near the Cliff Temple. We met Qual, the leader of the outpost, and assisted him in clearing out some harpies that had taken up residence near the new maple syrup farm. Now, I believe we are opening the story with the final dungeon map of the campaign in the Cliffside Temple. That's right. Thank you very much for that recap. We had a short episode right after the main episode, which consisted of a gift exchange. Be sure that each of you have adjusted your character sheets to reflect these changes. Merrick, you were gifted a raven by Donna and a sending stone by Benjen. You asked the comments to provide name suggestions for the raven. Have you decided on one? A lot of good suggestions, but my favorite was Poe, so that's what I've settled on. He can ride on my shoulders while we adventure. Oh, I like Beaky. Poe is a bit more... refined. A good choice for an animal that will be the familiar of a wizard. What about Beaky Poe? You could always shorten it like BP. Mr. Gasoline, oil reserves. Bringing some democracy to find that oil. Fitting. No, his name is Poe. How about Poe Beaky? Then his initials would be PB. I like BP better. Of course you do, Donald. PB? Peanut butter? Perfect. I love it. No, you two are steamrolling my moment with your stupid tangents. His name is Poe. The end. Fine, but I'll be making oil-related jokes anytime we talk about him. Not naming him BP for shorthand is a mistake you will regret. I like peanut butter. God almighty. I've decided to allow the Raven to have limited speech. They are very intelligent animals after all. All of you will be able to talk to the Raven to some degree, but I'll allow Marek to have more complex conversations with the Raven, given that it is his familiar. In turn, the Raven can respond in limited speech. Now, Donna, why don't I talk about your newest golden apparel? Oh, hell yes. Good. Okay. 
Donna received a pair of golden bracers from Merrick, which will add two points to her armor class as long as she isn't wearing any armor. She also received a Sending Stone from Benjen. You should tell it like it is, Ben. The Sending Stone is from you because Joe forgot his character's name is Benjen and didn't know he had drawn himself in the gift exchange. He messed everything up. Well, things worked out in the end. Benjen received a Sending Stone of his own, and I received a lovely new Christmas sweater. There's something else I wanted to bring up. We sort of forgot about it, which, well, we'll talk about that in a bit. But you all purchased some fairy jars at the carnival in Saltwish, but never did anything with them. Holy shit, I forgot about those. Indeed. Donna, you were able to purchase a lower elemental jar all for yourself. Merrick and Benjen pooled their resources and purchased a bottled fairy. Both can offer a blessing to your character if open, including possibly permanent stat buffs. However, while the fairy can offer better blessings, you may also find yourself tricked with mischief. What do you all want to do? Do you want to open the jars or leave them for later? Given that you have forgotten about them, it's safe to say that the occupants are not happy with you. I'll leave mine for later. I want to take out my jar and examine the fairy inside. Sure. Merrick, you take out the fairy jar from your inventory and find the fey creature inside alive and well, but very annoyed looking. She watches you with narrowed eyes. We better let her out as soon as possible. I would be pissed off too if I were trapped in here. No, Merrick. Uh, leave her. He, if, she, if she has the opportunity to trick you, she could play a prank on you and mess with you somehow, which would not be ideal as we are about to go into a dungeon. At Donna's words, the fairy grows even more angry. She bangs her fists against the glass of the jar and shouts a few choice curses. Yeah, no, I am not doing that. We'll have you out of there in a jiffy, miss. Do I have to do anything in particular to open the jar? I should probably make you roll arcana for this, but I'll be lenient since you're a wizard. The fairy's jar is bound with cords. You and Benjen should unwrap the magical cords tied around the lid of the jar. We'll do that. Come, Benjen. Help me unwrap these magical strings and we'll release her from the jar. Okie dokie. We'll get you out in a sec, miss. I hope your hair smells like happiness and bubblegum. Benjen, control yourself. She will curse you if you piss her off. Right, sorry. I will be good. As the strings fall away, the fairy pushes on the lid of the jar. Finally, she is able to free herself and flies out of the small glass prison. She glares between the three members of the party and raises her arms in the air. From her hands falls a sparkling blue powder that catches the light. The glittering dust falls over Merrick and Benjen. In another second, the fairy flies over and pokes Donna in the eye before poofing out of existence in another puff of glitter. I would like all of you to roll 1d10. How dare that fairy poke me in the eye and then disappear, coward. Come back so Donna can poke you back with her magical trident. Chill, Donna, and roll your dice so we can all move on. I rolled a five, Ben. Merrick, you feel something shift in your eyesight. You can't determine exactly what has changed, but you're certain that something is different. Um, is there any way for me to figure out exactly what has happened to me? I'm sure you'll figure it out eventually. That's not funny. Sorry, but I can't think of a way to give you a hint about the blessing without outright breaking the game to tell you. It is a blessing though, right? I haven't been cursed. Ah, uh, that part slipped out. But yes, it is a blessing. What did Benjen roll? Tell me that before we get to Donna. I rolled a 10. Really? A 10? Wow. Okay then. Benjen, you feel something change in your inner ears and a tingle in your brain. But much like Marek, you can't ascertain exactly what has changed. Uh-oh, what does that mean? I guess it's another strange blessing that we won't figure out until later. Be glad that it isn't a curse of some sort. Forget about him. What about me? I rolled a- Donna, you feel yourself somehow getting dumber. You have a permanent one penalty to your intelligence score. What? Apparently irritated at your suggestion to leave her in the jar, the fairy cursed you with a penalty to your intelligence score. Permanently, like, it won't ever go away. Nope. Damn it. What the hell? It's not that bad, Donna. At least intelligence isn't one of your main stats. Oh, that was a sick burn. I wasn't trying to insult her or anything. Hold it. How is this fair? They get some blessings and I get a curse? To be fair, we don't know the full details of our blessings. And about that, I'm going to put you three on mute for a second. Sit tight. All right. So, viewers, here is the list of blessings that I was working from. I will provide a copy of this in the description of the video for those of you listening. If you want to keep the blessings a secret, close your eyes and ears for the next 15 seconds or so. 
If you notice, the majority of these blessings come with a downside or can easily turn into misfortunes, even if the upsides are incredibly useful. Blessing five for Merrick was the passive ability to see invisibility, but some of the things he sees might be fantasies or tricks of the mind. Blessing 10 for Benjen is, funny enough, a passive that keeps speak with animals always active. Long live Benjen the Disney princess. I am so looking forward to using and misusing these new abilities. And uh, we're back. Thank you for waiting patiently, you three. Just wanted to share some background information with the viewers. No worries. They'll tell us whatever you said in the comments. Or we can just watch the video to find out the secret information. I think that's cheating. We shouldn't cheat. We are men of honor. At least and two of us are. Right. One of us is a woman or playing a woman at least. You caught yourself there. Because my quick wit is unmatched. We can have a debate on that later. Let's go ahead and get started with the episode so that we don't spend the whole episode doing housekeeping matters. That's not very nice to say to Donna Ben. They can vote now too. Joe, I'm warning you. Our party opens this episode at the front of the Cliffside Temple. Your new Arakokra friend, Qual, along with several others, helped deliver you to the temple. And you can understand why their wings were necessary. The temple appears to have been carved out of the side of a cliff. And the only way to reach it on foot would be to rock climb up or slide down a rope from topside. I shall wait for you three to exit the temple and bring you back to the outpost. You may count on me. Thank you very much for your assistance. We will make our way through the temple as fast as we can and return topside with haste. And if we don't show up for a day or so, just assume we're dead. It would be dishonorable to leave my post without being dismissed. I shall wait for you all to return. We can make a signal fire or something, Qual. No need to trouble yourself. I said I shall wait at my post until dismissed. If you insist. Now, Benjen, should we play the ritual music at the entrance of the temple right away or wait until after we finish the temple? Last time we were being chased into the temple, but we have a lot more leeway this time around. I'll go ahead and play. I'll play the beautiful music on my trusty lute. My practice fingers pluck each note out carefully and with gentle love. As the music echoes from your hands, Benjen, it trails along the cliffs and magnifies through the vast canyons. The goddess's melody fills time and space, and you swear the air feels lighter. Not as drastic of an effect as we saw last time. No idea what's going on there. Unless I do. No, nothing yet. Never mind that. Let's go on into the dungeon. I can smell the treasure from here. Perhaps I will be gifted another weapon. That would be glorious. Donna, I had a thought. If you keep collecting old and tarnished weapons, you can make yourself an iron throne of swords when you get back to your home tribe. Uh, that is a brilliant idea, Benjen. I am shocked you are capable of such a suggestion. Hmm. I will keep this idea in mind as we journey. Are you three ready to enter the dungeon? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Or else we'll be stuck here in Donna's daydream and Benjen's unrelated tangents. The party enters the dungeon, which opens to a long hallway. Several feet ahead, you note the growth of vegetation overtaking the corridor of stone. It is dark, but Merrick, thanks to your fey ancestry, you can see further ahead than the other two in the party. All you note, however, is more vegetation. There appears to be a branching hallway ahead, which veers to the left. Can you see anything ahead, Merrick? There is a left turn we can take. Everything appears to be overgrown with moss and leaves and the like. I don't see much of anything else. I'll take a tentative step forward. Did you forget what happened in the first temple when Donna charged ahead? What is your question, Merrick? Of course he forgot. Either way, nothing happens as Benjen steps onto the foliage. Oh, right then. I will note for you three that the thick vines and overgrowth makes navigation more difficult. If you have to run through this terrain, you will be slowed down. As we approach that left turn, can I see anything else? Further in the hall, you can see two more branching paths, both to the right. Merrick, you also note that the vegetation dies off down the hall, but from where you are standing, you think you can hear something echoing from the end of the hall. Roll perception to see what you can hear. I rolled a 13, how is that? From the end of the hall, you hear the swishing of water in a cavern, as well as a sinister laugh that sounds eerily familiar. The smell of stagnant water drifts down the hall. Roll perception again for me to see what else you can hear. Uh, critical failure. Can one of the others roll it? What about Benjen? That fairy spell did something to his ears, didn't it? I rolled a 23 for perception. Wow. All right. 
Benjen, you strain your ears to try to hear what Merrick is interested in, and you recognize the laugh of a hag. Sounds like a hag. We do not want to go down there. Let's choose one of the other halls. How about the very first one? Sure, sounds good to me. You return to the very first branching hallway you encountered, which feeds into a split pathway. Ahead of the party, you see the statue of a woman in a small alcove. The branching hallway feeds to a pair of staircases in each direction. The stonework of the dungeon gives way to a tile floor around the statue, and there are magical barriers across each staircase, blocking your path. Smells like a puzzle. Maybe we need to do something with that statue. Tell me more about it, Ben. I shall investigate like Scooby-Doo. The ground around the statue is finished with green tiles. The statue itself is a likeness of a goddess with long hair. Behind her is a mural, a painting of the moon which glows around her head like a halo. She is my angel. I must pray to her. No, Benjen. Wait. Let's investigate a bit more. What about these tiles around the statue? It is my turn to do something, so I will investigate them with my huge brain. Your huge brain, which just got nerfed by a fairy. So sit back down. There are eight green tiles in a three by three grid. One of the tiles is missing. What do you mean, missing? As you examine the floor, Donna, you note that it looks like the missing tile was pried up from the ground by force. There are nail marks against the stone and scuffs around neighboring tiles. Shit, looks like someone deliberately messed with this puzzle. What do we do now? There must be something valuable hidden behind this puzzle, but I'm not sure if we can get to it just yet. Maybe we need to investigate the dungeon more to find the missing tile. Wait, nail marks like from the hag Benjen heard? Oh, oh dear, do we have to? Maybe she'll be a waifu. Donna can try her flirt attack on her. We don't even know if the hag is the one who messed with the tile. It could be something else. It's the closest lead we have, literally since it's down the hall. All right. But let's be smart about this. I have an invisibility potion in my inventory. Why don't I move ahead to see if the hag has what we're looking for? And if she does, you'll have to steal it somehow. Can you be sneaky and get it without getting caught? Hmm. I can always use Misty Step for a getaway to get back to the two of you. Actually, of the three of us, I believe I have the best sneaking skills. Shut up, Benj, and let the grown-ups come up with the plan. No, he's right. He can't use Misty Step, but he has better stealth and sleight of hand skills and would have a better chance of grabbing the tile without anyone noticing. I could let him use an invisibility potion, too. If you're using the invisibility potion, then it doesn't matter which of us goes. In fact, it should be me, since I have the most health of us all. I can take a hit. If either of you are noticed and get attacked, you will die. What if each of you roll 1d6 and the person who rolls the highest can go? I rolled a one. Me too. No way, so did I. The odds of that happening are astronomical. Okay, roll again. Two this time. Me too, what the hell is going on with these dice? Did you rig them, Benjen? Hey, <laughs> I got a four this time. Looks like I'll be the one sneaking in to get the tile. I'll give Benjen one of my invisibility potions. It lasts 10 minutes, so you have time, but don't take too long. No worries, guys. I can do this. We'll stick close by in the hallway in case something goes wrong. The party returns to the hallway overgrown in vegetation and moss. You notice, as you pass through again, toadstools have sprouted in the corners of the hallway. The spots on the mushrooms almost feel as if they are following your every move. Don't I detect anything unusual? No, not so far. But you just said... But what about me? I have danger sense! and you do not detect any danger in the area. Huh? Really? Because those toadstools you just added uh, sure are suspicious. If we pass through here again, Merrick, and there are more toadstools, I want you to blast the hallway with fire. Agreed. Let's check for this tile first, though. I'll make sure I'm crouched out of view at the opening to the room with the hag. I want to be safely out of the way, but close enough that we can aid Benjen should he need it. I'll do that too, and I have my trident ready to strike. I will drink down the invisibility potion and sneak into the room. Does the hag notice me? No. Benjen, you are able to enter the room unnoticed. Upon entry, you note that the room has taken on the characteristics of a swamp more than a dungeon room. There are deep puddles of bog water on the floor, with foliage growing through the stone and breaking the walls. Inside the room is indeed a hag, and she appears to be caring for some of the plants growing in the room. She has not noticed you. I want to search the area to see if I can find the tile. Roll investigation. 
Uh, okay, I got a five. God damn it, we are dead. Time to attack. Just hold on, Donna. Benjen, you can't discern exactly where the hag might have the tile, if she has taken it at all. We've got to come up with an alternate plan while Benjen still has the advantage of invisibility. I'm very tempted to deafen Benjen while you two come up with an alternate plan. Please don't, Ben. I wonder if I could send in Poe to distract the hag, or Benjen could distract the hag while Poe pokes around a bit. But I'm not keen on sending my familiar into a room where he might be attacked. Ah, this is a swamp. I will send out Prince Hops to search. That uh, is actually another good idea, Benjen. Did you remember to take your pills, Joe? Hunter gave me a new type of pill to try, and it is charging up my brain blast. A frog in a swamp is perfectly ordinary. Out of the two familiars, he would have a better chance searching the room. I shall send out Prince Hops from my little cage pendant. Go Pokeball. Keep as quiet as possible, Benjen. You're going to ruin your invisibility. I will cast... Wait a moment, Benjen. As Prince Hops exits the cage pendant and lands on the floor, he looks around with a surprised blink. What an odd sort of place to find oneself in. A strange welcome for a member of royalty. Mavana gave that frog to Benjen, right? I guess he's more special than she let on. Merrick and Donna, all you can hear is a ribbit from the frog. No, we just heard him talk. Benjen heard that. But you two only heard a soft ribbit as Prince Hops flopped onto the mud. Merrick, we've got to abandon Benjen here. He's on drugs. He's hearing things now. Shut it, Donna. It's more likely the blessing from that fairy. I know, I know. But I still think we should leave him. Prince Hops looks about the swampy room with discontent. I will whisper so softly. And if Prince Hops, do not despair. I need your help. We must find a tile somewhere hidden in this room. It is green, just like you. Very good. Very good, Bellman. Be at ease while I search the room for this tile. Let me do a roll for Prince Hops. Ah, very good. Prince Hops splashes about the swamp until one of his well-placed hops lands on a bit of solid ground under the stagnant, dirty water. He looks under his feet and exclaims, Jolly good, Bellman. I found something stuck in the mud. I believe it is the tile you seek. But can Benjen get the tile and get out of the room without being noticed? Make a sleight of hand roll, Benjen. I rolled a 15. And make a stealth roll while you're at it. And an 11. Benjen, you are able to carefully wiggle out the tile from the muddy water, and you tiptoe your way out of the room. You almost catch the eye of the hag, who is still tending her plants, but are able to reach the doorway. Prince Hops follows behind. Well done, Bellman. Get us out of this filthy place as soon as possible. I swear I have never seen such dirty water. Not at all worthy of royalty. Benjen, with the tile in hand and Prince Hops in tow, makes it out of the hag's dungeon swamp and back safely in the hall with Merrick and Donna. That went very well. Nicely done, Benjen. Now we can put that towel back in place and see what treasure awaits. I say, Bellman, these two are ordering you around. Do not forget that you are first and foremost my servant. I like the frog. He verbally abuses Benjen. Donna, you have no idea what Prince Hops is saying. All you can hear are ribbits. I didn't know I had a royal frog familiar. I am most honored. Look, Marak, Benjen has gone mad. He thinks he can talk to his frog without using any spells. Why are you surprised, Bellman? It was you who bestowed me with his title. A Bellman can't make someone into a prince. It doesn't work like that. Let the frog live in delusion, Marak. I like him talking down to Benjen. Such a dignified frog. Oh, I love him so. Let's make our way back to the tile and statue puzzle before we chat more. I'm waiting for that hag to chase us out into the hallway. The party backtracks through the overgrown hallway. More toadstools peek out from between the stones, their spots following the path of the party. You remember our deal, Merrick? It was less of a deal and more of an agreement. Stand back, Benjen. I'm going to burn away some of this growth. I'll cast Burning Hands as a first level spell to ignite the vegetation. The fire licks at the surrounding hallway, eating away at the leaves, vines, and shriveling up the toadstools. The foliage burns slowly, evidently damp from the dungeon air, but it does burn away eventually, clearing the path ahead. I should pick some of those baked mushrooms for the goddess. I can use them as an offering. While you're at it, give her some of those special pills you're taking. I bet she'd love those. I think she'd prefer some candies. Can we get back to the point? 
Exactly. The party returns to the tile puzzle and statue room. What would you like to do? Obviously, we're going to slot the tile back in place, and I'll stomp on it for good measure. As you smush the tile back into its slot, a glow gleams from the floor all around the statue, and the magical wards that had been blocking the stairs fade away. And now we're free to go up the stairs. My prince, you should come back to the pendant so that you're nice and safe. That is a superb idea. I shall be at your disposal at your convenience, Bellman. The party continues up the stairs, noting that the air begins to grow heavy as you ascend. You hear crackling electricity and the buzz of magic thick in the corridor. As you turn the corner, you see the source of the magic and electricity, a storm harpy who is guarding the room. She sits atop a large treasure chest, preening her feathers, but stops as the party enters. Defeat me for both treasure and a healing blessing, she says, before flapping her wings. Rather than lifting to the sky, electric magic sparks from her feathers and dances around her fingertips. Let's all roll initiative. I rolled a 19. Dirty 20 for me. Ah, some good old-fashioned dungeon diving. How I've missed this. I rolled a 14. The monster rolled a 12, so the initiative order will go Donna, Marek, Benjin, and then the Harpy. Donna, you're up. I'm going to charge ahead and attack with my trident. Eight and unnatural 20 to hit. Only the 20 will hit. Roll for damage and tell me how it goes down. Uh, that's, uh, nine piercing damage and five radiant damage. Despite the overgrown chicken dodging Donna's first attack, she does not lose heart. She jabs once again in a determined attack, and then I will end my turn making sure the two squishy gents are shielded by Donna's awesome might. My turn then. I'm gonna run and hide behind one of those pillars and then cast Ray of Frost as a cantrip. 11 to hit, is that good enough? No, not quite. Your magic slides off the feathers of the harpy. Benjen, it's your turn. I will attack with my dagger by throwing it. 10 to hit. That probably misses, huh? Yeah. Sorry, Joe. At least your dagger flies right back to your hand after thrown. I will also hide behind a pillar like Merrick, and I will use bardic inspiration on Donna. Go, Donna. You're our girl. Damn right. About time you praised my godliness. It is now the Harpy's turn. The Storm Harpy casts Thunderwave on Donna. Donna, I need you to make a constitution saving throw. Not a problem. I rolled a 24. Despite the force of the spell, Donna, you are able to stay on your feet, but you take two points of thunder damage. It is a scratch. Ha! Is that all she's got? Not quite. Angry that the spell did not push Donna back, the Storm Harpy swipes at her with a long sword she kept sheathed at her side. The sword itself also crackles with electrical magic. Donna, make a deck saving throw. I rolled an eight. Donna, thanks to your upgraded armor class, the sword does not deal any slashing damage to you, but lightning magic from the metal blade shoots out and hits you. Seven points of lightning damage. Still just a scratch. I will pay her back for the damage. My turn, I will rage. Fury ripples through my muscles. Chicken dinner again, boys. Then I will attack with my trident 19 and 17 to hit. Those both hit. First hit does 16 damage and second attack does 21 damage. Donna, rage. Holy shit, that's... 37 damage in one turn. Donna is amazing. Go, Donna. She's our girl, the warrior princess. Finally, you two are seeing things my way. That attack does some devastating damage, Donna. Tell us how it goes down. Enraged that this overgrown chicken has dared scratch me, I raise my weapon in a battle cry before skewering the monster. Marek, you're up. Beat that. Unfortunately, all my powerful spells cause AOE damage that will hit you as well. I'll have to keep that in mind and adjust my spells when I can. I'll move out and cast Ray of Frost again. 25 to hit and 9 damage. As Donna would say, that is peanuts. But I don't want to hit Donna with a spell. Content to have Donna in the limelight finally about time. After casting my spell, I want to take cover behind the pillar again. With the blast of cold magic, the harpy staggers and then regains her footing. She is looking quite fatigued already from the fight. Benjen, you're up. Okie doke. Donna, did you use up that bardic inspiration? Not yet. Got it. Okie, I will cast Vicious Mockery on the Harpy. The wisdom save is 14. The Harpy rolled an 11. Roll for damage, Benjen. Right. Miss Harpy, your mother was a hamster and your father smelled of elderberries. That's, that's six points of psychic damage. The insult provokes a snarl from the Storm Harpy, who brandishes her longsword. 
She casts Thunder Wave. Donna, make another constitution saving throw. 22. Try as you might, Harpy Lady, but you won't hit me. The spell slides off Donna due to her strong constitution, but she does take three points of thunder damage. Still, the Harpy Lady hasn't given up. She swings her longsword again, which is a hit. Donna, make another deck saving throw to see if you can at least dodge the additional lightning damage that follows her swing. On it, I rolled a 13. Is that enough? Just barely. Donna, the monster's sword slashes at you, dealing 12 damage, but you manage to wiggle out of the way of the additional lightning blast, which could have been devastating. Still but a scratch, and I will finish this fight quickly. 22 and 10 to hit. If you haven't used Benjen's Bardic Inspiration yet, you can do so. A warning though, you'll have to roll a six for that second one to hit. No problem. Mm, I got a three, fine, whatever. I'll only get to hit once. Nine piercing damage and an additional six radiant damage. Then I'm up again. I'm guessing this monster has resistance to lightning damage, right? Next time we level up, remind me to add some spells that I can use without damaging allies in the area. All right, I'll use Ray of Frost again. 19 to hit and seven damage. Still peanuts compared to me, Merrick. Shut it, Donna. I'm trying to be considerate to you. I could throw a fireball, but it would hit you as well. You couldn't hit me even if you tried. No one can touch Donna. Is it my turn? I'll cast Hideous Laughter as a first level spell. Wisdom save is 14. It's all shits and giggles until someone giggles and shits. Was that the joke? Yeah, how was it? Three out of five. You've done better. But the joke hits, knocking the Storm Harpy prone and laughing uncontrollably. With that, it's the Harpy's turn. But the Harpy is still laughing at Benyon's joke and is laying prone. Donna, you're up. I get an automatic critical hit since the Harpy is prone, right? Since you're within five feet of the creature, yes. Oh yes, this will be delicious. I will attack with my trident. The automatic crit plus rage means I deal 44 damage total. That will kill the Storm Harpy. How does it go down, Donna? With a battle cry, I slash and poke at the harpy with my magnificent trident. My golden hair flows with my movements, matching all of my beautiful golden bangles and bracers. Yes! As the harpy falls, a gentle light twinkles into the room from above, restoring your health. This is evidently a healing room, much like the room you found in the previous dungeon. Donna was the only one hurt in that last battle, but the healing is appreciated all the same. We can return to this room if we need a top-up. Uh, I gotta admit, Benjen, I think we found a good plan of attack. When you use hideous laughter, I can get those sweet crits in. You found your true purpose as a support for Donna. He's a support for the whole team, but I agree that that strategy is effective. I will keep that in mind. Ben, did we confirm that Benjen's blessing has to do with speaking to animals? I'll throw you a bone here. Benjen's blessing allows him to speak with animals without expending a spell slot. It's always active. A true Disney princess. Of all the blessings I thought up, he had to get that one. Funny how it turned out. Before I forget, Benjen, you should change your spells up now that we know the fairy blessing gave you the ability to talk to animals. You don't need your speak with animals spell anymore and can replace it with something else. Oh, that's right. Hum, there are so many choices and I'm not sure what to pick. Let me have a look. So, I know you mentioned an episode or so ago wanting more combat spells but it would help us in a lot of future encounters if you have the spell Silence set up. That will help us control enemies better, especially when we get in fights with multiple spellcasters. Okay, I'll add Silence as a prepared spell. Now let us check out the treasure. What did we get? Inside the treasure, you find a number of items. First, a pile of 300 gold. You also find a sapphire ring and gold amulet. Lastly, you find a mysterious green crystal that glows the same green as the tiles you found before the goddess statue. The same green, huh? I'd wager that crystal is relevant to a puzzle somewhere in the dungeon. I don't care about that. Look at all that gold. Save your greed for after the dungeon, Donna. We'll divide up the treasure when we're finished. Sounds good to me. We've got to find the music room for the last piece of the ritual song. There are two more hallways to go down, though one is closer than the other. And the other means we have to get close to the swampy room with the hag. I'd rather not go there if we can help it. 
Agreed. We'll go down the closer hallway and see where that takes us. All right. The party returns to the statue and tile puzzle, continuing back down the main hallway that Merrick cleared away with fire. Scorch marks cover the floor where vines and foliage were burned. The party turns down the corridor to the right, finding more leaves growing out of the stone. I can burn this section away as well with a quick spell. As you raise your hands to cast the spell, Merrick, your ankles are grabbed. You look down to see the form of a little girl peeking out of a mushroom, her torso rising out of the shadow of the mushroom like a strange specter. You recognize these creatures as the same ones you encountered in the pocket of Feywild of Mem's creation, Myconets. More of them rise out of the floor and shadows of the mushrooms, grappling the members of the party. They whisper amongst each other, passing words from one to the other and down the hall. It is as if they are softly calling something. I ready my trident for an attack. And I have my spells ready. Oh, the little girls are so cute. From the shadows comes a red-headed young lady with equally red eyes. Fold them in place. We must not let them pass. I will ensure this is over quickly. She produces a pair of sickles, one for each hand, and lunges towards the party. With your marching order, Donna is the closest to the enemy. Can I try to jump out of the way of the attack? You can try, but since you're grappled by the Myconets, you'll roll with disadvantage. I'll let you do a strength save to see if you can retch your legs free. Don't care, don't matter. Roll to 16 and 25. That's good enough. Donna, you are able to shake off the grasp of the Myconets in time to evade the monster girl's attack with sickles. And I am going to use my flirtation attack against this lady. Watch this, boys. You don't have a flirtation attack, but I will allow you to try and de-escalate the situation. If that means you're going to try to flirt with the monster, then go ahead. It's a monster, not just a girl? Well... I rolled an 18 on the persuasion check. Seriously? That high? All right, what are you going to say? Lovely maiden, let us not fight. We can talk this over to resolve it, surely. Tell me, what is your name? A woman of such beauty and grace should not exert herself so. The monster girl considers Donna's words for a moment. Can I roll insight to ascertain whether Donna is helping at all? Sure. I rolled a 13. The monster girl looks conflicted. You can see that she is considering Donna's words. That's a good start. Let me use my silver tongue, a bard's greatest strength. All right, Benjen, roll persuasion. Yeah, in 22, I will back up Donna. Come, miss, there is no need to fight. Let us settle this peacefully like civilized people. The monster girl lowers her pair of sickles. Her eyes flick to each member of the party. Benjen and Merrick, you're still being held down by Myconets, so keep that in mind. Let's start with a name, perhaps. What is your name, miss? This one is called Carmine. Carmine, what a beautiful name to match your lovely red hair. We do not wish to fight lovely Carmine. We are simply traversing this dungeon. Please let us pass peacefully. I was ordered not to let you pass. I must follow my orders. You could think of it not as letting us pass, but as, uh, we accidentally slipped by while you weren't looking. Perhaps you can move down the hall and peek into that swampy room, just for a few moments, if you catch my meaning. Merrick, roll persuasion. I rolled an 18. Wow. The woman seriously considers your words. Perhaps, but first we must deal with the Myconets. They like to tattle. She raises her sickle and in the blink of an eye, raises a patch of mushrooms from the dungeon floor. I will assist you in this. Destroy the remaining mushrooms. Not a problem. I can do that quickly with some fire, just like before. The Myconets holding down Benjen and Donna twist their arms around them, enraged at the turn of Carmine. Burn them away. I will free you. She uses her sickles again to raise more of the mushrooms, specifically those umbrellaed over the Myconets. Do it now, quickly. As she speaks, more mushrooms pop out from the dungeon floors. All right. I'll use burning hands to set fire to the vegetation here. Good. Burn it all away. As she speaks, Benjen, you note a twinge of regret in her expression. Is everything all right, Miss Carmine? I was looking forward to watching you bleed. Oh, uh... 
She's not some kind of vampire, is she? Oh, I can use True Strike to gain insight into her defenses. Just as a warning, Benjamin, I'm going to make you roll a stealth check. If you fail it while casting that spell, you'll provoke more combat. Then I will not fail. I will pray to the goddess for luck, and she will smile upon me. Natural 20. You are lying. I wish he was, but I watched him do the roll. This is getting ridiculous. Our writer is considering praying to the goddess, too. Damn. Well then, Benjen, you are able to cast the spell without Carmine noticing. She is not undead. She is a fey creature of note, one that has an affinity and lust for blood. What? Fey creatures should be cute little fairies and other wonderful beings, not a bloodthirsty. And one that Donald once called an ugly old man looking thing. A, a red cap, she's in league with Mem. Well, obviously, you didn't figure that out from all the mushrooms and the myconets. Shut up, Merrick. At least I handled the situation so that we don't have to fight. I will give you some props for that. Anyway, I cast burning hands to set fire to the foliage growing through the hallway. The fire burns away the mushrooms as well, returning the corridor to bare stone and dirt, but with scorch marks lining the walls. Carmine looks back at the party, still holding her sickles. She still appears conflicted. Miss Carmine, Mem won't hurt you or do something bad because you let us go. I'd like to hear more about your relationship with Mem, if you wouldn't mind sharing. She's a bit of an enigma to our party. I cannot share much about her. I'm bound to silence by magic, but know this, she will come for you. And when she does you, and when she finally ensnares you, then I'll have to make you bleed. She walks further down the hallway, back to the intersection you left behind. Let's quickly move to the next room before she comes back. I think she's... A few plums short of a fruit pie. We don't talk about sexuality like that, Benjamin. How dare you? I believe he was speaking more to her soundness of mind. Anyway, let's keep moving. The party enters an extremely large room, which seems to lack any real walls. The ceiling is supported by columns, or perhaps by magic, but from the edges of the room, you can see a dark abyss swirling around, as if the dungeon room were floating in a sea of darkness. The room is decorated with a series of nine statues, each in the shape of an angel covering their eyes. Ah, weeping angels don't blink. What? Weeping angels from Doctor Who. Doctor Who, who? That's what I said. It's a British television show, Donald. Surprised that Ben used these as a reference. Nah, I'm just kidding. A commenter made a suggestion to include them in an episode. What the hell, Ben? Screw you and screw that commenter. Besides, we are American presidents. How unpatriotic of you. Well, I've also used a lot of references to anime and such, and that's all from Japan. So they're not dangerous? They're just statues? Yeah, just statues. Okay, because I wanted to have a moment to stop and talk about Mem. What do you two make of her? She started off being helpful to us on this journey, but as we've gone on, she's gotten more and more suspicious. She mentioned being taken from her home as a young girl and sort of forced into her current position as a messenger for the Goddess of Harmony. I've also been thinking since the last episode, do you think it's a coincidence that our trip in the pocket of Feywild messed with time? I'm not convinced it was all an accident. I get what you're saying, but it doesn't make sense. Why should she start out helping us and then start to mess with us? I'm more inclined to believe that the Feywild trip was an accident. So then why is she clearly interfering with our exploration of this dungeon? Everything we've encountered thus far is some kind of fey creature or points back to a tie to Mem. It really doesn't make sense. Have you guys noticed that the past two dungeons have had monsters and traps that relate to their surroundings? In the Rainforest Temple, we fought monkeys and jaguars and other monster creatures that would belong in a rainforest. In the Beach Temple, we dealt with water-related puzzles. I was expecting this temple to be more air-related. There was the Storm Harpy. That's air and sky related. True, but the hag mushrooms and carmine are very out of place. Maybe Mem had them stick around in here to slow us down, maybe even kill us. But why? Why bother helping us at the start of our journey if she's trying to hinder us now? Huh, I see. Mem understands what is required for malicious compliance. What do you mean? Like maybe she has to act a certain way against her wishes. So she finds way to undermine the orders or subtly work against them. 
That would make a lot of sense. How'd you come up with that so fast? Oh, I've seen it all the time from employees. Right. In any case, it's more for us to think about. We should be careful around her in the future. I don't think we can fully trust her. In the very least, her motives are unclear. Until we fully understand them, we should stay vigilant. Right. Donna will protect you two with her fearsome might. And you'll have my brain to help keep us all safe. Uh, what about me? What do I have? Uh, you've got spirit, I guess. I feel so touched seeing you all work as a team. Shall we continue the dungeon exploration? Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Too much of this goody nonsense will give me indigestion. As I mentioned, the room you all have entered is vast. There are nine of the statues I mentioned, split into groups of three. The statues are numbered counterclockwise, with the first one in the northeastern corner of the room. On the northern wall are statues one, two, and three. On the western wall are statues four, five, and six. On the southern wall are statues seven, eight, and nine. As you approach each statue, you notice that they feature a plaque beneath them with script. The top line of each plaque reads the same thing. Who was the last one to hold the gem? But below that, on each plaque, is a different script. One, someone stole the gem from me after I stole it from six. Two, I suspect eight stole from me. Three, I was the first to have the gem. I wanted it to myself. Four, seven is jealous of six, but six stole from seven. Five, eight gave the gem to four to hide it. Six, I saw five steal the gem from one. Serves them right. Seven, I stole the gem from nine. Eight, I suspect two stole the gem from five. Nine, I stole the gem from three. What gem are they talking about? You note that the statues have a slot where you can insert a gem into their torso. The slot looks to be the same size as the gem you found after fighting the Storm Harpy. Aha. Uh -huh. So that gem was important for a puzzle after all. Let me sit and think about this puzzle. Let me have a try. Benjen, will all of my love and respect, we are trying to get out of the dungeon in one piece. I fear that if you take charge of this riddle, that will no longer be possible. Let the wizard use his brain. That's what he's here for. You're here for the music. I think I've worked it out. I believe four is the last to hold the gem. I'll insert it into the statue's torso. As the gem slides into place, the statue seems to come alive. She reaches for the gem in her heart and lifts it in her hand, glancing at it lovingly. The statue once again freezes solid when she is holding the gemstone in her hand. You hear a creaking sound and stone sliding against stone. Near the southeastern corner of the room, a passageway opens, and you also note a treasure chest waiting for the party. Dang. That's two fights you guys have gotten around in this dungeon, and I worked so hard to add some interesting enemies for this episode. Well, that's how it goes, I suppose. Merrick, you do note the presence of three ghostly figures near some of the statues, but as you solve the puzzle, they make no movements or motions to attack. Do you guys see those figures? Donna and Benjen don't see them. I don't see anything. Maybe it's a trick of the light or the result of me solving the puzzle. Huh. They aren't attacking? No. In fact, now that you take a second look, they seem to have disappeared. Weird. Could I tell if they were friends or enemies? No way of knowing with such a quick glance. Anyway, you guys have gotten around another obstacle. Nicely done. Can't say I'm a bit disappointed at how this dungeon is turning out. Quit your whining and tell me about the treasure, Ben. Inside the treasure chest are nine vials of liquid in assorted colors. What? More potions? Boo! That stinks. Considering we didn't have to fight to get them, I'd say it's a fair deal. I'll collect those with the other treasure that we can go through later. Solving the puzzle with the statues opened up another room, which is dimly lit. Within, you can see the form of a monster slumbering near broken pillars, guarding another treasure which is situated on top of a large stone altar. Benjen, you can make out sheet music carved upon this altar. Then this must be the music room. And that's the final boss. All right, I'm ready. Upon the entrance of the party, the monster stands and stretches, and you can see the form of a lion with a swirling mane. His fur sparkles and crackles with electricity, not unlike the storm harpy. He steps forward into view. His mane is not made of fur, but of storm clouds. He bows to the party and then lets out a roar. Roll initiative. How polite for a final boss. I rolled a two. Ha, skill issue. I rolled a, wait, I rolled a two. You were saying? 
I rolled a seven. Merrick and Donna, roll again for your initiative. Nine this time. I rolled a 17. Did you both roll a one the first time without your bonus? Yep, this episode's luck has been abysmal. I'm so tempted to make you lose a turn just for that one, but I won't be that mean. All right. The monster rolled a five. The initiative order will go Donna, Merrick, Benjen, and then the monster. Let's do this. Just like it should be, Donna's up first. Can you not just run up and go to close combat right off the bat? I'd like to get in a good fireball, and I can't do it if you're so close to the monster. Tough shit. Deal with it. Donna does what she wants. I'm going to run up to the monster enraged and used by beautiful Trident. Light of the sea. Destroy this kitty. 21 and 8 to hit. The 21 hits. That's 6 piercing damage and 9 radiant damage. Benjen, as Donna makes your attack, you hear a rumbling laugh from the beast. An excellent swing. These are worthy fighters. Can I try to persuade the kitty to let us pass without fighting? You can try, I suppose. But combat has already started. I'm going to make you roll with disadvantage. Roll persuasion. Seven and 15. I have to take the seven, though. Darn. Um, Mr. Kitty, let's not fight, okay? Apologies, but I must test your worth for the goddess before letting you pass. Let us see how well you fight. Onward. It is Merrick's turn. I didn't get to narrate my actions. Oh, right. Go ahead. I swing my trident in a mighty arc. The lion is in awe of my strength. He's not quite in awe yet. We'll see how this plays out. My turn. I'm going to cast Fireball as a third level spell. What, really? Donna has a lesson to learn. Merrick, you have to say it like this. As Prince Zuko, I mean Princess Donna, kneels before you, your voice comes out in a powerful growl. You say, you will learn respect and suffering will be your teacher. I don't know what you're referencing, Benjen, but sure. Donna will learn respect and suffering will be her teacher. Fireball, third level spell, right at the monster. Donna, make a deck saving throw for me. What? You need to dodge Merrick's fireball spell. I get advantage though, right? With danger sense. Yeah, go ahead and roll. Damn it, I rolled a five and eight. And the monster rolled a 17, so it dodges the attack. But Donna doesn't. Donna is gonna take 29 points of fire damage. Holy shit, Merrick, you asshole. I can't believe you would do this. I kind of thought you'd be able to dodge with danger sense. My B. That's all you have to say, my B? Wait, Donna, um, why not use your tail in a reaction? You have your beast form active in a rage. Well, I, that's supposed to be for attack rolls, not a saving throw, but good try, Benjen. Sorry, Donna, I will try to heal you soon. The monster watches you all fight with disappointment. Lint, perhaps you are not as worthy as I thought. We are worth, Mr. Kitty, we will show you. It is my turn and I will throw Donna one of my red berry items, which will allow her to heal 2d8. Can she go ahead and eat those during my turn? It's your turn, not hers. I will run over and shove the berries in Donna's mouth. I will save you, Donna. Uh, I'll allow that. Banjen, you are now in melee combat of the beast, though. The berry heals Donna for six health points. Um, then I will cast Hideous Laughter on the beast as a first level spell. It's a success. The joke I tell is, um, uh, why don't you play games with cats? They tend to be cheetahs. Six out of 10. But the lion monster finds the joke hilarious and falls prone, laughing. It laughs so hard that it is unable to make a move this turn, and we will return to the top of the round with Donna. I'm gonna stab Merrick with my trident. No, Donna, we must not fight. He started it! We can settle that after defeating this beast. Look, I have set up our killer combo. The lion is laughing, ready for a crit. Uh, hmm. True, all right, I'll attack twice with my trident. Sweet, sweet crit time. 44 damage, die, kitty. Still enraged and now further powered by the betrayal of Merrick, I fuel my swing with the rippling hatred and raw power. The attack is devastating, but the lion is still healthy enough to fight. Merrick, we're back to your turn. Right. Well, now Benjen's next to the lion as well, so I don't think I'll throw another fireball. 
What the hell, Merrick? I, don't you care about us? You might have thought more about teamwork and how I could use more of my spells if you didn't simply run up and attack the monsters at close range every time. Or you could have stepped back at the end of your turn to leave me an opening. We're entering Merrick's villain arc. I can feel it. Anyway, I'll cast Ray of Frost and I rolled a 17 to hit. That hits. And it deals six cold damage. I'll also run to take cover behind one of the pillars to shield myself from attack. See, Donna? That's how it's done. Whatever, let me play how I want to play. Guys, let's not fight. It's my turn. Um, do you guys think this lion has lightning spells? Safe to assume so. Then I will cast silence around the lion. Now I must concentrate on the spell. Also, I will use bardic inspiration on Donna, but I will do that first before the silence, unless she wants to see my groovy dance moves for inspiration. Black, no thanks. That will mean it is the lion's turn. Inside of the orb of silence, the lion is unable to cast spells. Instead, he goes for Benjen with his teeth and claws. Benjen, please make a deck saving throw. 21. You are able to evade the monster's attack enough to keep concentrating on your spell, but you feel a sting of pain as the monster's claws make contact dealing 11 points of slashing damage. Not good, but I am concentrating. The lion also jumps outside of the radius of the spell. Shit, well that was useless. Not necessarily. Benjen's spell could have blocked the monster from making a magic-based attack that turn. Donna, you have no idea what Merrick is saying because you are deafened inside of the ball of silence. It is your turn. Right. No idea what Merrick is going on about. But I'm going to keep attacking this cat. I will move over and attack with my trident again. 11 and 25 to hit. One of those hits. Four 13 damage, nine piercing, and three radiant. I swing and poke at the lion beast in another savage attack before retreating back a bit. How's that for team play, huh, Merrick? At least you're learning. Donna and Benjen are a safe distance away from the lion, right? Yes. They are far enough away that they shouldn't get hit by any of your spells aimed at the lion. Then I'll cast Fireball again as a third level spell. And it hits. Then that's going to be 36 points of fire damage. And I'll take cover once again behind a one of the pillars. With Merrick's fire spell, the monster is now looking very wounded, but it's not over yet. Benjen, you're up. Okay, I'll break my concentration on silence and I will recast it at the lion. No thunder and lightning spells for you today, Mr. Big Whiskers. Donna, did you use up that bardic inspiration? Not yet. In that case, I'll use bardic inspiration on Merrick. That's my last one. Use it well. Will do. Let's see if your excellent command of the battlefield will work in our favor. Inside the ball of silence, the lion snarls and lunges for Donna, using his teeth and claws again. Only one of his swipes manages to make contact, Donna, but it deals 16 points of slashing damage. Not good, I'm getting low health, guys. How's the monster looking? He's very wounded and visibly wobbly on his legs. We must be close to defeating it. Let's try to push through. Right, I'll follow the same pattern as before. I will run up to attack twice with my trident. 20 and 23 to hit. Both hit. Then that's 26 piercing damage and 12 radiant damage. Wait, that's 38 total damage in one attack? Uh, yeah, looks like. Then that's going to finish off the monster. Wow, maybe the goddess made a mistake giving Donna that weapon. W what No way! With Donna's final blow, the lion beast purrs with pride and bows to the party. I am satisfied. You may cure, you may pass. His mane billows outward, shrouding him in cloud, and once the mist clears, he is gone. Bye, buddy. Hope you find your dad. That reference is now out of season, Joe. Anyway, good work, guys. I will punch Merrick in the face. 18 to hit and 4 bludgeoning damage. Uh, all right. What was that for? You know what it was for. You almost killed Donna. But I didn't. What if you had? I thought your motto was... If we die, we die. Yeah, but not at the hands of a party member. Are you kidding me, Merrick? All right, all right, I'm sorry. I didn't think it would do that much damage, and I really thought you'd be able to dodge it. Huh? This room is the music room, isn't it, Ben? Indeed it is. Under the chest that the lion was guarding, 
You see sheet music carved into the great stone tablet. Benjen, go ahead and copy that down while Donna and I look through the loot to see what we got. We didn't find that much treasure in this dungeon, but at least we didn't have to fight as much as usual. While Benjen copies the notes, Merrick, you and Donna open the treasure chest. Inside, you find two spell scrolls, 500 gold, a chain shirt, and a crossbow. This treasure seems a lot more pointedly organized than what we found before. All the same, I vote we collect it, add it to the pile, and divvy it up once we get back to the Arakokra outpost and have a long rest. Yeah, someone is in need of healing soon. One long rest and you'll be good as new. Benjen, are you done copying the music? Sure am. So now we just need to find the magic circle that will transport us out of here. After opening the chest, a concealed door on the southern wall clicked open, and inside you can see the familiar glow of a magic circle. Found it! Now let's blow this joint so we can count the golden treasure. Back at the entrance of the temple, the party finds Quail and the other flyers standing at the ready. It seems he was serious about waiting at his post no matter what. He straightens at the sight of the party. Finished already? Excellent, excellent. We will be able to make it back to the village in time for a good supper, I think. Ah, that sounds so lovely. Good food and a good nap. I can feel my eyes drooping already. If you'll all hang on tight, we'll have you back at the outpost quickly. We found so much gold in that temple. I'll have to find another blacksmith soon to add to Donna's immaculate drip. Speaking of, I think that chain shirt we found is for Benjen. Good thing, too. Donna can't call us both squishy gents anymore. Yeah, now that only applies to you, Merrick. Either way, it'll be good to update our stats a bit more. Ben, do you think we'll level up soon? It's been a while. Yes, I was just thinking about that. We can do that when you get back for the long rest. We will have to wait to go through the treasure next episode, however, because when you land with Quell, you note the form of a familiar person waiting for you near the outpost. Her fiery orange hair is unmistakable. She stands magic swirling around her figure in silent fury. Mem waits for you, ready to fight. Hello viewers, and welcome back to Kokomimi's AI presidential D&D campaign. We will be trying out a slightly shorter video format for more consistent uploads, so let us know your thoughts in the comments below. No worries though, by shorter upload, we mean that the will aim for videos around 30, 45 minutes instead of hour plus long videos. Additionally, you might notice a small change in the character portraits. We posted a poll about changing up Benjen and Merrick's character art, and some comments suggested that they wanted to see what the proposed style would look like. Here is our test run. Now me and Joe get to be handsome too. The term is Husbando Barak. Right, whatever. We'll see what the viewers think. Now, it's Donald's turn for the recap. In the last episode, Donna bravely led the party through another dungeon, destroying every monster and puzzle in her path. We got the last piece of the ritual song, but not before Merrick betrayed Donna by blasting her with a fireball, leaving her nearly dead. But then she shook off the flames like the godly warrior woman she is and destroyed another boss. We worked together to traverse the dungeon and get that piece of the ritual song. But Merrick did indeed blast Donna with a fireball. Joe, you're supposed to take my side in this. But it was really not nice of you, and I like it when Donna carries me like a princess. You should be nicer to her. Do I need to remind you how much grief Donald gives you day after day? I'm talking about Donna, though. She is different. Before we go off on another tangent, I'll jump in. After exiting the dungeon, the party flew back to the Arakokra outpost with the help of Qual, only to find an angry Mem waiting for them. She stands in the rocky terrain in a traveling cloak and black dress, wielding a staff. While in the cliffside dungeon, you ran into her Mykonets and another Redcap, but were able to deftly navigate the encounter with minimum combat. For some reason, the party has reasoned out that Mem is hindering their efforts in Melodia. This is where we will jump right back into things. Roll initiative. Wait, before we do that, can we try to talk things out like we did in the dungeon? You can try. Mm. As one servant of the goddess to another, we don't need to fight. Let's settle this. Whatever's wrong and with our words. It was you who first guided me to hear the voice of the goddess. I do not wish to harm you. Give me a persuasion roll, Benjen. 
28. That has to succeed. Mem glares at Benjen. Her cloak and clothes crackle with angry, vicious magic. She lets out a sigh, and then a vine of thorns shoots up from the ground and into her hands. She cracks it over at Benjen, knocking him off balance and dealing ten damage. I'm not doing this for the goddess. I'm doing it for me. Try not to make it more difficult than it needs to be. The thorny whip retreats back into the ground. Now we roll initiative. This is not good, guys. Donna, I'm so sorry for hitting you with that fireball. And I rolled a 19 for initiative. So you remember after all, huh? I rolled a 10. We are screwed. I rolled a 23. I know things look bad, guys, but we can't lose heart. Benjen, it is going to take every ounce of skill and luck to survive this fight. One of the comments was right. We should have made use of that healing room before we left the dungeon. That too late to dwell on should have's Merrick start putting that brain of yours to use. The initiative order will go. Benjen, Merrick, Donna, and then Mem. This is not good. We need to think of a plan. Let me give you a bit of a lay of the land. The battlefield is mostly barren of foliage thanks to the alpine climate. Qual looks between the party and Mem, unsure what he should do. He met Mem alongside Mavana when she was searching for an Arakokra to hire for help. But between her and the party, he's not sure the right course of action. He should stay out of this if he can. This is our fight. No need for anyone else to get hurt. I'll make sure he knows that. Qual, make sure the outpost is protected. You don't need to worry about us. He nods once, resigned, and flaps off to check on his own people. What the hell, Marek? We could have used the backup. Maybe, but this isn't his fighter problem. He barely knows us beyond a promise he made to Mavana and our help with the Harpies. No. We should solve this on our own without dragging others into the conflict. Fine, I guess. In the very least, he can call for help if things get bad and assuming he takes our side. Call for help? More like call for a mortician to bury our corpses. Look how screwed we are. Now that Kokomimi has added HP bars, the whole world can see just how fucked in the ass we are. Benjen and I are like one hit away from dying. I know. We'll take this as cautiously as we can. There is no way to take it cautiously when what we are taking is a giant fat mushroom up the ass. As I was saying, the battlefield is mostly barren on account of the climate. Mem had the advantage of choosing an opportune spot to stop the party. There is nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Benjen, you're up first. Okay, guys, we can't lose heart. We are in this together. I won't let us die. I won't let us give up. First, I will cast Healing Word as a third level spell on Donna, which will heal her for 15 hit points. As a bonus action, Chance, I will cast Sanctuary on myself. If I can keep myself alive, then I can heal the party. That will end my turn. Got it. Sounds good. Healing yourself is a waste of time. I'd appreciate if you made this easy for me. I have enough work to do. I understand that, Miss Mem, but I can't let my friends die. Smart plays, Benjen. It's my turn. Ben, can I throw a healing potion at Benjen? I'll allow that but it will take up your action slot for this turn. Got it. I'll hold off on that then for this turn. Sanctuary can protect Benjen for now. I'll focus on attacking since I'm the healthiest of the party. I'll cast Acid Arrow aiming for Mema. 18 to hit. That hits. Then that will deal. Nine points of acid damage. I aim for Mem, shooting the bolt of acid her way. I cannot let her see how vulnerable we all are or else she might finish us off. The arrow of acid hits Mem, but the sickly green liquid slides off her robes, and Mem looks completely unaffected, even where the acid managed to hit her hands and face. Nice try, but it'll take more than that to harm me. Crap, she might have a resistance or immunity to acid damage. Noted. As a bonus action, I want to drink one of my defense potions that adds one point to my armor class for three turns. I also want to move a bit away from the party. Even if I couldn't hit her, I don't want us to be grouped up so she can easily hit us all at once. That will end my turn. Donna, it's all you. Of course it is, but no worries, fellas. Donna will quickly end this with a few swings of her trident. I'll run up to Mem and attack. 19 and 21 to hit. Both of those hit. Then that is 12 slashing damage and an additional 14 radiant damage. 26 total damage. Ha! Ah, Donna is unstoppable. But did those actually do damage, or did she shrug it off like my acid arrow? Mem flinches at Donna's attacks, so it does appear that they are affecting her. 
And now it's the brainless barbarian's turn. Brainless? I'm the only one of who was able to hit you. And what does that say about your friends, I wonder? Shut up and go back to eating your magic mushrooms, or else this will be your last day alive. I'll end my turn and move back a little bit so Merrick doesn't have another hissy fit about being in the way of his spells. Okay. As you move back, Donna, Mem gets in an extra strike with her staff, dealing three bludgeoning damage. It is now Mem's turn. She casts Flame Strike as a fifth level spell. Donna, make a deck saving throw. I rolled a 19. Is that good enough to dodge? That'll do it. But you still take five points of fire damage and seven points of radiant damage. Shit, I thought I dodged. You should have been raging too to minimize the damage. Though I suppose that doesn't matter much for magic. I'd have to read your character sheet again. Careful, Donna. We've got to play this smart. Flame Strike still does damage on a successful save. Mem is also going to cast a spell at Merrick. She casts Scorching Ray. With your defense potion, your temporary AC is now at 14, right? All three of the rays hit. That's 20 points of fire damage. Stay still so I can burn you all up. That'll clear up this mess. This is bad. Really bad. Hey, how come Mem is able to attack twice? That's not fair. I, I get to attack twice. What are you trying to say? Benjen is right. She shouldn't have been able to attack twice. Are you questioning the Dungeon Master? Uh, no. Not at all. Mem is also going to use a legendary action. This is the first time you have encountered a monster or enemy that uses legendary actions, so I'll explain them a bit. Legendary actions are special attacks, or abilities that enemies take outside of their usual turn. I'll show you the power of the goddesses, messenger. You should have laid down and died quietly, rather than insisting on dragging this out. Mem activates the first step of her legendary actions, Dread Witch of the Woods, Hallow Vines. All around her, in a 30-foot radius, thorny vines sprout up from the ground and crawl over the battlefield. Walking around or near the vines is difficult terrain and will impose a penalty on mobility. The vines further swell with magic and five pumpkins appear in various locations on the vines. You each can hear noxious acid bubbling inside of the pumpkins which swell and gurgle, threatening to detonate. Two of the five pumpkins are grouped near Merrick and Benjen. See if you can escape my web now. Not good, but at least the action didn't directly do any more damage. I still can't riddle out why she was able to attack twice, though. Clearly none of you have taken a peek at the way other classes work. We're back to the top of the round with you, Benjen. Come and show me what you're made of, Bard. Show me that you're not just a bunch of tunes in an empty head. Okay, I've got to be clever. Benjen, heal Donna as much as you can. I have healing potions on me that should be able to stave off death. What should we do about the vines and pumpkins? Leave those to me and Donna. Keep yourself safe and healthy. We need your healing. You got it. I will first cast Healing Word as a third level spell. It will heal Donna for 15 hit points. Um, I think if I try to use Hideous Laughter, then that will break the effects of Sanctuary on myself. I'm sorry I can't set up our killer combo, Donna. I will also throw a healing potion at Merrick. I'll allow that. Roll to see how much it heals. Oh dear, it only heals one HP. I throw the vial with all my might, but... Perhaps the aim of your throw was a little off on that one. Anyway, is that the end of your turn? I also want to move a little bit away from the pumpkin that's close to me. Got it. All right, Merrick, you're up. So the bard is too cowardly to make a move. What about you, wizard? First, I'm going to drink one of my stronger healing potions as a bonus action. It heals me for 12 hit points. Next, I don't like these vines and pumpkins. I'm not sure what they do, but I'm going to burn them away. Donna, if I keep the field clear, can you focus your attacks on Mem? Leave her to me. I'll cast Burning Hands as a second level spell aiming for the pumpkin close to me and as much of the vines I can burn away. I need you to make a deck saving throw. I rolled a 13, but I'm gonna use one of my magic candies to add another point to that and make it 14. That'll be enough. Merrick, as your fire sears the skin of the pumpkin, the acid inside explodes out in a caustic splash, but you are able to evade the liquid as it spews out. How do you like the surprise? I brewed up those special for all of you. These pumpkins are more dangerous than you think, guys. Steer clear if you can. Donna, you're up. 
Watch and learn how it's done. I'm going to enter a rage and attack Mem with my trident 20 and 12 to hit. Back to the brainless oaf, are we? Only the 20 will hit. No matter, one hit is good enough. Nine piercing damage and seven radiant damage. Eat that, Mamma. Ben, you know, since you added HP bars to us, I feel like you should add one for the enemies. I thought about it. It certainly would raise the stakes a bit more. If I add one, though, I won't be showing you all the exact number of HP for the boss. What do you think? Fair enough, I suppose. Okay, how's that look? Is that before or after my attack? After, here's how much damage your attack did. Shit! What the hell, Ben? What kind of boss fight is this? One of a kind. If you're all done, then it's Mem's turn. What a pathetic attempt. If you insist on putting up a fight, you should put some more effort into it. First, Mem casts Dimension Door to teleport away from Donna. You each note that when she teleports, it's to one of the remaining pumpkins on the field, and in the spot she once stood, the vines and vegetation reroot into the ground. After another moment, she casts Acid Arrow as a second level spell, aiming for Marek. The attack hits, dealing 10 points of acid damage. Crap, not good. Mem uses another legendary action, Dread Witch of the Woods, Hallow Vines. More vines sprout up from underneath, crossing over the previous ones on the field. Five more pumpkins sprout up over the field, bubbling with acid within. The more you struggle, the more vines I'll grow. Benjen, the pumpkin near you detonates, covering you and the surrounding area in acid. Please make a dex saving throw. Uh, I got a five. You take six points of acid damage from the explosion. You are unable to evade the blast. Even when he's used Sanctuary? Sanctuary doesn't protect from area of effect damage. Damn it. Benjen and I are so close to death. Benjen, how are your spells looking? Not too good. I only have a couple spell slots left. Same. We can't keep doing this forever. Donna's the healthiest of us, but if we stop healing and magic support, she'll be dead soon, too. So what the heck are we supposed to do? What's the plan? Lay down and die? Of course not. We'll think of something. We always do. Benjen, get yourself healed up for now. Okay, my turn. I'll cast Cure Wounds as a second level spell. It heals me for 14 hit points. I don't really have that many spells left. I'll try throwing my dagger. Throw it at one of the pumpkins far away from us to clear them away. we Will do, I aim my dagger for one of the pumpkins. Roll for the hit and tell me what you get. I rolled a 15. That'll work. Your dagger makes contact with one of the pumpkins and the contact causes the orange gourd to explode out caustic acid. You still insist on fighting? If that's the end of your turn, Benjen, we'll move to Merrick. Right. I have an idea, but I'm not sure if I can pull it off. Ben, would you allow me to throw one of my potions at Mem, even if it's not explicitly a splash potion? Which one? I have a potion of sleep. It doesn't have the same restrictions as Benjen's sleep spell with maximum hit points and all. I want to throw it at Mem. See if I can buy us some time. I'll let you try. Roll for the hit. Hmm. I rolled a two. I rear my hand back and throw with all my might, which isn't much. Well, Merrick, the potion you throw splashes against the ground rather than near Mem. I expected better. Shit. I'll drink another of my strong healing potions, which heals 12 hit points. We can't keep going like this. We don't have infinite resources. Then think of another idea, damn it! I'm working on it. You're up, Donna. Can I make it over to Mem to attack her directly? No. You won't be able to make it over to her. All right, then I'll attack two of the pumpkins to help clear the field. 13 and 11 to hit. If I can't attack her, then I'll destroy her stupid vegetable patch. Those hit, and you don't need to roll for the damage. You're able to destroy the pumpkins even with the lowest roll. I do need you to make two deck saving throws. You'll be able to roll with advantage thanks to danger sense. I rolled a 19 and nine. Donna, you are able to evade the splash of one of the pumpkins but the other splashes you with acid, dealing three points of acid damage. My pumpkins bite back. How do you like them? Now we are at Mem's turn. She first casts Entangle. The vines on field shift in the dirt and wrap around Donna's legs. Donna, make a strength saving throw. You would have had advantage, except it ended when you did not attack Mem during your turn. Shit, I rolled an eight. Double shit! Donna, 
You are now entangled in Mem's vines and are unable to move. Triple shit! Infinite shit! You can't escape from me now, Brainless Oaf. Mem also casts Witch Bolt, this time at Merrick. It hits, dealing six points of lightning damage. During each of her turns, Mem can now roll to damage Merrick with the spell, unless Merrick, you move outside of range or gain total cover. And I've got you too, wizard. Finally, Mem takes another legendary action. Dread Witch of the Woods, Surge of Fairy Lights. The vines and pumpkins covering the field surge with lightning magic. Donna, you take nine points of lightning damage while entangled in the vines. Watch it how my pumpkin patch lights up with magic. Indeed, the pumpkins light up with magic and sparkle with electricity. Moving close to the vines will now pose the risk of damaging you with electric magic. In addition, the pumpkins growing on the vines swell with the increase of energy, and the vines further spread across the field. She's really making our lives difficult with all of this terrain. We can barely move now, which is less of a problem for Benjen and myself, but... Speak for yourself. I want to attack her with my trident. Keep a level head, Donna. We can't afford to attack recklessly. Literally, for Donna. We're back at the top of the round with Benjen. This is my last spell. I'm going to try it anyway. I'll cast Hideous Laughter. Wisdom save is 14. Let's see if this works. Mem rolled an 8. The spell hits. Your mama's so fat, her blood type is cream of mushroom. Two out of five, but I appreciate the theme joke. Mem bursts out laughing and doubles over. She has been knocked prone. Merrick, you're up. I'll cast Ice Knife as a second level spell, aiming for Mem. I trust Donna to be able to get out of those vines in her turn. I've got to hit Mem as hard as I can while we have the chance. 14 to hit. That misses. Crap, as a bonus action, I'll drink one of my healing potions, which heals for 9 HP. Wait. Although the Ice Knife spell missed, it still explodes on contact with the ground, dealing 8 cold damage to Mem. That's something, at least. But it also means that Mem can make a saving throw against Hideous Laughter, and... It's a success. She shakes off the laughter and regains her footing. Thought you could knock me over for a few hits, but it will take more than that to keep me down. Why are you doing this, Mem? You said that it's not for the goddess, it's for you. But what does that mean? It means just what I said. I'm doing this for myself, in my own self-interest. So you aren't acting on the orders of anyone else. Merrick, I want you to roll insight with that question. I rolled a 17. You note a strange twitch in Mem's face. She is conflicted. There is something that she's keeping from you, specifically related to the question you just asked. Someone is making you do this after all, isn't that right? It doesn't matter either way, whether or not I'm being compelled to act. Let us help you. I do not need your help. Not much good you could do either way. You're unable to defend yourself against me. What help could you offer? I don't know, but I'd like to try all the same. We are friends, Miss Mem. Speak for yourself, Benjen. I'm not eager to be friends with someone who's bound others to them magically. Don't forget Carmine in the dungeon. Mem is an innocent. Carmine? Did you speak with her? She was supposed to dispose of you. But we're smarter than you think. I'm going to free myself from these vines. Donna, make a strength saving throw to see if you can free yourself from entanglement. I rolled a critical failure. If I activate my rage, can I roll again with advantage? I'll allow that. That's a 14 now? Is that enough? That's enough. Donna, you are able to free yourself from the electrified vines, and you can now move more freely. Can I move closer to attack, Mem? Yes, go ahead. Enraged, I run over to Mem and attack with my trident. I could be mean and make you do another saving throw to evade getting entangled again, but I'll be nice. Roll for the hit. 18 and 23 to hit. Both of those hit. Ha! Eat this, Mem, and tell your master to suck it while you're at it. 17 piercing damage plus 12 radiant damage. Enough, enough of this. I am ending this now. Mem cast Chain Lightning. Each of you must make a dex saving throw. 16, lucky. 11, even with advantage. 19 for me. Got it. Okay. Lightning flashes across the battlefield, reaching each of you with blue jets of magic. Donna, you take 31 points of lightning damage. Merrick, you take 11 points of lightning damage. And Benjen, you take 14 points of lightning damage. Shit, no! Donna, your hit points have fallen to zero, and you are now unconscious. On each turn, you must make a death saving throw. 
Three successful throws, and you will stabilize but remain unconscious. Three failures, and you will die. What the hell no fair? I would ask that you keep quiet, Donna, since you are unconscious. I'm sure your party mates will assist you. Don't worry, Donna. I will try to save you. You are our princess. Do you have any spell slots left for healing? Uh, no, but I have a cantrip. You'll need to save that, though. It's still Mem's turn. Mem also activates Witch Bolt to do an additional five damage to Merrick. Are you taking into account my lightning resistance from my magic sash? Yes, I haven't forgotten about that. Okay, fair enough. Mem is going to make another legendary action. Dread Witch of the Woods, Jacko Lantern Party. Fire crawls over her vines, igniting the electricity with wicked flames. The pumpkins light up like Jacko Lanterns, sinister smiles twinkling at you. The battlefield is sparkling with dreadful fire. Now, Benjen, it is your turn again. Benjen, try to stabilize Donna if you can. This might be the end. I don't know what we can do at this point. I know what we can do, or rather, I know what I can do. I will save us, Merrick. First, I will run over and cast Spare the Dying as a cantrip to stabilize Donna. Benjen, roll acrobatics for me to see if you can evade the battlefield effects. I rolled a 16. How is that? That'll work. Donna, you are now stabilized with the help of Benjen. Finally, took you long enough. He literally came over to you as fast as he could, Donna. Next, I will pray to the goddess. I will pray to the goddess to have mercy on us and help us. Benjen, now is not the time for your stupid role-playing moments. We are literally going to die. Goddess of Harmony, hear my prayer. It is me, your goodest boy, Benjen. We are in need of your help. Hear my call and assist me. Assist us, I beg of you, my goddess. We need your divine power. We will not survive without you. Benjen, you feel the gentle presence of the goddess listening to your prayer, but she makes no effort to answer. That's the final straw. Benjen, after we die, you are not playing as a cleric again, and we are not going to listen to this goddess. Look at where it has gotten you. I can't believe this. Please, oh goddess. Again, Benjen, you feel the presence of your goddess, but hear no answer. Oh, okay then. That's it? You're giving up? Merrick, what are you going to do for your turn? I'm not giving up yet. I'll drink another of my healing potions. This one will heal me for but eight hit points. I'll also throw one of my potions over to Donna. It'll heal her for 11 hit points. That'll be the end of my turn. Appreciate it, Merrick. I don't have any more rages left. We need to free up some space to move around. Use your crossbow to pick off some of the pumpkins if you can. That way we can keep ourselves mobile and out of danger. Before you do that, Donna, you all hear the flap of wings overhead. Mem's head jerks above at the sound. Clear off before I shoot you from the sky, damned lizard. That's no way to speak to an old friend, much less an old friend of the king. I have half a mind to roast you where you stand, though it looks like you're already doing that. Turn down the flames. You do not order me. Overhead, you see the form of the bronze dragon that met the party before, when you were all traversing the lost ruins in the mountains. He lands before the party, smashing several of the pumpkins underfoot. The flames and electricity die under his tough scales. Turn down the flames, I said, or I will keep smashing pumpkins. Let us talk like civilized people. You are interfering in matters that do not concern you. The dragon scales float away into the wind, dissipating into metallic smoke. In place of the great beast is a handsome young man with glasses. They concern me now. Our beloved princess asked me to lend some aid to these adventurers. And ever the loyal dog, you came running. I came to put a pet back in her place, one dog to another. I know my place. Scurry back home, will you? I do not think we need to fight. These three are under my protection now. Now, look here, brat. Playing with your food is so very unsightly, even if these three did tone down my beloved nightly thunderstorms. Mem grimaces, but her vines and pumpkins retreat back into the ground. Good to see that you still retain a few polite manners. Now, run along, will you? Mem looks at each member of the party, her eyes narrowed. This is not over. One day I will finish this. But not today, I don't think. Mem regards Argothrax for a moment, her lips pursed. Finally, she snaps her fingers and disappears in a puff of spores. As soon as she is gone, Argothrax turns to the party, offering a placid smile. That mushroom brat is still around and kicking? 
I thought my threats of raising her forest would have been taken more seriously. Hmm. Perhaps in my age I've lost that threatening spark. I'll have to find it again. Um... Did she take away your speech? No, I'm just stunned that we made it through that fight. I wouldn't take it that far. You three are on the verge of death. Thankfully, a certain goddess is somewhat fond of you all. My prayer to the goddess, she answered. Huh, about time she did something? Shut it, Donna. Don't offend the dragon that just saved our life. Shall we find somewhere to rest and tend your wounds? I'm sure there is much you want to ask, and I'm hankering to sample food in this humanoid form. Roasted meat will surely taste sweeter in this body, don't you think? Come along, we'll talk over supper. And with that, we'll end the episode and pick up next time in the Arakokra outpost. I have a hundred different questions for Argothrax, but they'll have to wait for the next episode. I'm sure the viewers have them too. I'm just thankful that Donna's alive. We came so close back there. True. If nothing else, we've learned that we have a lot of growth to do. Even though we've almost completed the goddess ritual songs and pilgrimage, we're still somewhat uh, weak. We've got to get even stronger. You don't have to tell me twice. Donna is going to double her efforts in gaining power. She'll protect you two and smash every enemy in her path. Never again will she be humiliated like this. That almost sounds affectionate, Donald. Don't get used to it. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Leave a comment letting us know what you thought about the episode, and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. We will see you all next time. Hello, viewers, and welcome back to Kokomimi's AI. Whoa, what the hell? Ben, what the hell? What? Something the matter? Listen, Ben, I know there is a war going on in the comments about the Husbando portraits, but that doesn't mean we need to completely throw away the regular video format. Also, you might want to hide. That portrait looks like it's going to distract Joe. Oh my good golly gee, he's so cute. Ben, can I smell your hair? I'd rather you didn't. Please? I thought you only talked about sniffing hair with the waifus. Yes, what is your point? It is funny that one AI program generates Ben to always look like a demonic husbando. And this one generates him to look like a 12 year old. Can we all move past this and get on to the role playing? Of course, sorry Ben. No, we can't move on until we discuss these giant portraits changing up the video format. What the heck is going on? Well, I, or we, want to find a way to make the videos more dynamic. The constantly changing visuals from this format does just that, doesn't it? But I want to look at Donna's sexy portrait. Why the hell do you think I've been making her so hot? I like looking at Donna as well. She is our princess. She is the leader of this party. More like the mascot of the party. Barack, I told you that we can't talk like that anymore. They can vote and own property. Progress is amazing. Technology is amazing. As I was saying, changing up the format is some experimentation with making the videos dynamic and engaging. It's kind of sad, though. The anime and waifus have sort of become Kokomimi's thing. Oh, those aren't gone. But the idea is that we can add this formatting in conjunction with the old one to distinguish between in-game and out-of-game dialogue. Oh. So there's a functional reason for the change, huh? That's a good idea. Sometimes things can get confusing while role-playing. And also, this means that you three can all make your character portraits however you like. Yes, Donna is eternal. Her beauty cannot be caged by Ben's stupid rules and fun ruining. So much is changing, I'm afraid. Go to sleep, Joe. You'll forget all about this by the time you wake up again. Oh boy, is it nap time already? Kamala doesn't let me take them during the day anymore. No, Joe, stay awake. It's time to play Dungeons and Dragons. We need you here at the table. We can't play without you. Sure we can, watch. Oh, I'm Benjen. I love sniffing my goddess hair, eating magic mushrooms, and I'm scared of the dark. How did you do that? Do what? How did he make Benjen's voice come out of his mouth? Uh, anyway, so we can make our character portraits look however we like? They are your characters, after all. Sweet. I want to lean more into Merrick, looking like a half-elf. It's hard to make that happen when the generators stick to making him look exactly like me. You can never cage Donna's beauty. She is the most beautiful and sexy barbarian warrior woman. And you all can call me Papa Joe or Daddy. I'm never calling you that. You played Merrick and Donna's fathers in the backstories, but I'm not calling you that. But you will. What? It's a surprise tool that will help us later.
Whatever floats your boat, at least I'm not the one putting the videos together. Although Joe can recommend you some people to do that. You've got some teleprompter people on speed dial, don't you, Joe? What? No, I never used a telephone. Teleprompter. What's that? Never mind. Ben, you need to fix your own portrait. You look like we need to drive you to the middle school dance. Yeah, and Donald can't do that from prison. Joe can't do it either since he's not allowed to be within 500 feet of a playground or school. Both of you shut up. The AI generators keep insisting on making me look like a young boy. It's really weird. No worries. We change out the pictures every episode, so not like it matters too much. True enough. Now, let's get back to the story. It's Joe's turn for the recap. Oh, here we go. I got this. Okay, so in the last episode, we split up and explored a ruined village after some kobold and dragon attacks. I got a new sword from the Birdman, and Swollenald kept saying that I died. Joe, that's Crafty's new video. Not only are we stealing this video format from other channels, but now we're stealing the meta jokes from them? Pathetic. You said it, not me. Joe, think hard and try to remember what happened in our campaign last time. All I can remember is everything was round and orange, so big and bulbous, fat and orange. Shut up, Joe. Why do you assume he's talking about you? Uh. uh fire and lightning everywhere. It was chaos. Then I woke up and realized it was all a dream. Okay, I'll take it from here, Joe. In the last episode, our adventurers had an extremely perilous battle with Mem. After praying to his goddess for mercy, Benjen and the party were rescued by Argothrax, the bronze dragon they first met when exploring the old ruins in the mountains of Melodia. Absolute king behavior on his part, both him and Benjen. I have a mountain of questions for him, and I checked the comments of the video to see what the viewers wanted to know too. Some of the questions can be answered. Some will take more time. None of this cliffhanger bullshit, Ben. It's not a cliffhanger. It's just that characters aren't omniscient. Argothrax will answer the questions that he can answer. Let's hop right into that. Right, because we have treasure to go through too. We open this episode with the party back at the Arakokra outpost. Qual flies down to meet you as you approach the great tree supporting the main dwelling in the area. You all are alive. We saw the battle from our lookout spot though it was difficult to tell all of you apart so high up. I'm glad to see that you all prevailed. Kind of, but not really. With the help of this new friend, we were able to stop the fight. Speak for yourself, Benjen. I was wrecking Mem in that fight. She didn't stand a chance. Donna, you are nearly dead. Benjen had to stabilize you or else you would have died. It is just like you men to gaslight a woman. I was winning that fight. Mem was no match for my godly trident. Argothrax ignores the bickering of the party to address Qual making his own introduction since the party hasn't done it for him. Oh, sorry about that. A very fine place you have here. I chased off the mushroom brat, and she won't be bothering this place. Nothing to worry about. Myself and our three friends here have much to discuss, and they need to tend their wounds. We are in desperate need of a long rest. Our talk can wait for the morrow, if you like, after you all have rested and recovered. That sounds like a plan to me. What do you two think? Yeah, see you tomorrow. I've got to go count my gold. I'm fine with anything as long as it means we get to sleep. Just to be clear, this isn't a real sleep, Joe. I know things can get confusing since we usually do this at the end of episodes. I'm already feeling tired. Damn it, Joe, wake up! What? Ah! Joe, this is kind of embarrassing. We've barely been playing. I know what to do. Hey, Joe, you're scared of the dark, right? No, that's, uh, that's just Benjen. Okay, then. Hey, Benjen, you're scared of the dark, right? Yes, you weren't supposed to tell anyone. Do you ever think about how when you close your eyes, the world is all darkness? Shut it, Donna. Stop trying to traumatize him, especially in front of others. We're a team of strong adventurers. False. I am a strong adventurer, and you two are my loyal servants who carry my golden treasure. God Almighty. This is so much bickering for one episode. Guys, please, let's focus. With the promise of speaking tomorrow, the party is led to their lodgings at the base of the Arakokra outpost a modest makeshift shelter that will shield them from the elements. Comfortable beds await you three after a hard day of battle. I know it is the middle of an episode, but you three will also level up to level six. Don't forget about all the treasure we found in the dungeon. Right. Before the party takes their long rest, they set out all of their treasure to divide amongst themselves. In consumable items, you found nine vials of differently colored potions, as well as two spell scrolls. In weapons and equipment, you found a sapphire ring, a gold amulet, a chain shirt, and a crossbow. The party also found a total of 800 gold. I believe the spell scrolls are meant for me. 
Fine by me. I don't need that magic nonsense. Merrick, the spell scrolls contain information on the spells Scorching Ray and Counterspell. You may use those and add them to your spell book. Hell yes, Counterspell is going to come in clutch. Donna, neither you nor I can wear armor, so I think that chain shirt is meant for Benjen. I can wear armor. I can do anything I want. Well, yeah, but wearing armor would restrict your rage. Benjen, you can equip that chain shirt, and it will bring your armor class up to 15. 15, puny weakling numbers. My armor class is 16 without any armor. Only because of those bracers I gifted you. Anyway, I think Benjen should also get the crossbow since he gave his old one to you, Donna. Fine by me as long as I get the gold. You can't have all of it, Donna. Uh, why not? You all are claiming the treasure for yourselves. I claim the gold. Not all of it. That's not fair. Personally, I'd be fine with taking just 150 of the gold, and you guys can divide up the rest. Are you sure, Benjen? There is more to life than gold. There are friendships and love and happiness. If you're sure, then. Ben, can you tell me about the vials of potions? I'd also like to look at the ring and amulet to check for magical properties. Sure. I'll start with the jewelry. Both pieces of jewelry do not appear to be enchanted. They can be sold for a good price, however. The potion vials all have varying effects. Perhaps it is the glass vials they are contained in, but you can't discern what each potion does exactly. Their effects will be a mystery until the potion is drunk. If you or the party can figure out what has changed with the potion. You've got to be kidding. What good is that in battle? You never know. If Benjen takes 150 gold, that leaves 650 for the both of us. I can take the potion vials since you don't seem interested in them, Donna. You can take the ring and amulet. Then we can split the gold down the middle. How much is that? Well, you can't do the math? Uh, Donna, can't do the math. 325 for each of us. Give me 350 and you've got a deal. Fine. Anything to make you shut up. Then that will divide up all of the treasure from the Cliffside Temple. The party can take a long rest and level up to level 6. Don't forget to take a look at any new abilities you unlock at this level. Joe, you can choose to level up your Bard or Cleric class. The night passes uneventfully. The nightly thunderstorms of Melodia seem to have disappeared, as it is a clear and calm evening. You sleep peacefully, recharged and ready for another day come morning. Hey, don't you guys think it's kind of offensive that they didn't offer me a place of my own? Why do I have to share a room with you two? I'm a lady. Maybe they didn't have enough lodgings to spare. Besides that, we all share a tent when we move from place to place anyway. Uh-huh. I just think they ought to show... I just show more respect to such a beautiful and strong woman such as myself. Well, that aside, we need to have our chat with Argothrax. Enough stalling, Ben. Time for answers. I'm going to go outside and look for him. Merrick, you leave the tent, and upon exiting, find the outpost bustling with energy. Arakakra fly about the area, loading themselves with spears, bows, and other weapons. I'll call out to ask what's going on. Are we in danger? Under attack? I will rush outside too with my trident. Me too, I've got your back. At the sound of Merrick's voice, Argothrax makes his way over. He is calm, despite the rush around the settlement. At ease, friend. I simply offered some counsel to Quail and the others, and they are making moves to outfit and upgrade this outpost into something stronger. So, we're not under attack? Argothrax lets out a short laugh. Not at all. What about the threat of attack? They wouldn't be rushing to arm themselves if there was no danger. He stops the party from rushing off with a gentle hand. Nothing of the sort. They are going out for a hunt. Quail and his men have been waiting for your arrival for some time now, and thus have not explored much of the island beyond this area. Now that they have fulfilled their duty, they can redouble their efforts in building up the outpost into a proper town. And that requires strength and supplies. I offered my advice on where they could find just that. Oh, okay. I was worried for a second. Glad that everything is all right. Damn. Qual took his promise to Mavana very seriously. He waited for us, and now he's building up the outpost into a proper town. We should offer help to Quail and the others. They've been kind to let us stay here. It's only fair to see if they require any more help. Benjamin, we are supposed to be finishing this pilgrimage. Who knows when Mem could attack us again? The sooner we finish, the better. In response to your worries, Argothrax waves a hand dismissively. I have no doubt that she will leave you be as long as you are under my protection. In that case, I don't see the harm in staying here an extra few days. We can restock supplies and such before we set off again. Donna, I'm sure if we stick around, there will be opportunities to make some coin. Huh, I see your point. We will stay a few more days before moving on. 
Now that we have the last piece of the ritual song, we'll need to make our way back to the Rainforest Temple to perform it. That's going to be another long trek. Merrick's idea to stock up first is a good one. Right. Looking back at the old map we got in Salt Wish, we can travel south to make it back to the Rainforest Temple. Granted, I don't know if this map is even more out of date now that years have passed. Hey, we can stop by back at the Goblin Village again. Say hello to Elder Grot once more. Oh yeah, I like that place. They paid proper respect to Donna's majesty and prowess. Mem's home is nearby, though. We should be careful, even if she'll leave us be with Argothrax's protection. Or should I call you Mr. Argothrax? Sir Argothrax? Argothrax is fine. Mr. Argothrax was my father. Ahem. Very well. Now, shall we have our chat, as promised? Yes, I have a lot of questions for you. I expected no less, and I will answer as many as I can. First off, I, I hope this doesn't come across as offensive. But who exactly are you? Besides, of course, a bronze dragon. Argothrax lets out another short laugh, finding a bit of humor in Merrick's unease. I was once the beloved friend and confidant of a king, now long forgotten to these lands. You all were poking around his castle ruins when we first met. I do not expect you three to know who I am. Barely anyone does anymore. You must be extremely old. Benjamin knows the feeling all too well. What I mean is, Chumpot, you must be full of wisdom. How many years have passed since the reign of that king? The castle was in ruins. It had to have been uh, centuries, maybe more. Argothrax nods, closing his eyes in thought. A lifetime must pass across his thoughts as he answers you. A lifetime so vast that it defies mortal comprehension. It has been so many years that I have long since lost count. When I made this island my home, King Ree offered a partnership and friendship rather than trying to push me off these lands. I gave him advice on governing. I respected him greatly. He is long dead now, of course. Humans have very short lifetimes. Didn't we see some murals and stuff with an old guy in them while we were exploring those ruins? Must have been this king. I think you're right. Argothrax, you mentioned a princess when talking with Mem. Does the princess have anything to do with this king? At the mention of the princess, Argothrax's smile breaks out into something more nostalgic. Ah, yes. Princess Utopy. She was the daughter of King Ri and loved music so very much. And the king loved his daughter so very much. Hey, I found that old book of music in the ruins. I wonder if that belonged to her. It would not surprise me. The princess delighted in music above all else. Was she a human as well? Yes, she was. So, she's gone. Dead? He tilts his head and raises an eyebrow with a twinkle in his eye. Not entirely. As I believe you are putting together... When Benjen prayed to the goddess for help, she sent you. And you said that the princess had asked you to aid us. They must be... One and the same. The king loved the princess. He was a father who would do anything for his daughter. Anything to ensure that she lived beyond her normal human lifespan. That she could live forever. Wait. I copied down the murals from the ruins. But there was one in particular. It had something to do with a star, I think. I'm going to look back at the sketches I made in one of my books. Merrick? The sketch you made is of the bearded royal man reaching out to catch a star shooting down. That's the one. Wasn't it in some sort of special room in the ruins? I can't remember exactly. So you think this mural has something to do with her becoming a goddess? Maybe. Ben, do I know anything about attaining godhood as a mortal? Hmm. I'll let you pick between rolling arcana or history. I have a bigger bonus for history. I'll roll that. I got a 12. Merrick, you recall from your schooling that you did learn a bit about mortals achieving godhood. It is usually a monumental task that only the greatest heroes can hope to achieve. Complicated magical rituals can be involved, or slaying gods to steal their divinity. There are a few different ways scattered throughout history, but these could be ghosts of the truth. So, there aren't any historical records or stories about someone gaining divinity to give to another person? No, you can't recall anything like that. All right, thought I would check. This mural depicting the king catching a star... I'd guess that it is important enough to signify something in Melodia's history. Argothrax nods. His eyes close, and he smiles with a gentle fondness, like he is revisiting a pleasant memory. Like I said, he was a father who would do anything for his daughter. The princess was a wonderful girl. Uh, so he made her into a goddess? How does one do that? 
His eyes fly open and lock with Donna, mischief glittering in them. Now I wonder why you're asking such a question. It could not be that you yourself desire to achieve godhood. Surely not. No, I... Uh, uh, Donna is already a godly warrior woman, a goddess in her own right. But hypothetically, if she wanted divinity, how would one go about doing that? Do you want to roll deception on that, Donna? Why would I roll? It's not a lie. Argithrax sees through your deception and seems to find it amusing. Um. I have a few clues about what one might do, but I have no desire to share them with you. I somehow believe you might use such power for nefarious reasons. I would never. Donna would never. Your outrage shows your guilt. Shut up, Merrick. Um, how come we didn't find any depictions of the princess in any of the murals or any statues of her in the ruins? Huh. That's a really good point. At Benjen's addition, Argothrax's eyebrows knit together in deep thought. That is something I do not know for certain myself. The best guess I have is that King Ri wanted to conceal the existence of the princess. His reasons behind that, I'm not sure. I thought the two of you were friends. You would know all about what happened in the court and castle if you were friends with the king. We had some disagreements about what he wanted to do with his daughter. I argued that he should not try to take power over another's life or death. He was adamant that he would do anything for his daughter to live forever. Was she sick or something? No, not at all. But I suppose the king could not abide the thought that one day his daughter would grow old, wither away and die. I get that. If I could find a way to be sexy forever, I would do it. Uh, I see I was right not to tell you any of my knowledge about divinity. Donna, chill out. I also have some questions about Mem for Argothrax. She is supposedly a servant of the goddess, but it seemed like she was acting against the will of the goddess when she fought us. She was. But why? We reasoned out that something or someone is controlling her. Do you know who that might be? Merrick's question prompts an even more pensive expression across Argothrax's face. I do not know the answer to that either, but I do know for certain that it is someone who wants to hinder your efforts in Melodia's temples. You three are the first in, perhaps, centuries who have gotten so close to completing the pilgrimage. The goddess desires you to do so. I don't think he would lie to us, but can I roll insight? I just want to double check. Sure. That's a 23. Argothrax's expression is deep in thought. His body is still. You can't see any signs of deception. He is as perplexed by Mem's behavior as the rest of the party. He didn't seem that perplexed by it when she was fighting us. He seemed to think she was a brat. Well, I've known Mem since she was a brat. You should have seen her when she first came to court. About the pilgrimage, are we really the first ones in so long to finish it? You are. Although, the more I think on it, the more I wonder if Mem is partly behind that. That would make sense. The only reason we escaped her is because of you. And that is all because you seem to have made quite an impression with the goddess. Another mischievous expression crosses his face. Especially the barbarian who constantly insults her. Uh, 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 I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Not to worry, the goddess is not a humorless being. She can appreciate someone poking fun at her. Is that so? In that case, is a reason for all these temples and such? Or is it just more unreasonable demands of Benjen? Why does she want us to complete the pilgrimage? What is the point of it? You know, she takes his cleric powers away if he doesn't pray to her every day. I can see why you would find that unreasonable. But consider that gods only hold sway so long as they have followers. She needs Benjen's prayers as much as he needs her support for magic. So is the temple pilgrimage just a way to secure more followers? Seems like a lot of effort for little reward. True, you can buy followers on those funny websites that sometimes steal your credit card. Focus, Benjen. Anyway, I kind of think there's more to it than just securing followers. There may be, but whatever her reason, the goddess has not shared it with me. Hey, wait, the goddess introduced herself as Arya, the goddess of harmony. Why didn't she call herself Josephine? Josephine? Yeah, the name of the princess. Christ, Benjen. The princess was named Euterpe. I knew that. No, you did not. But you still asked a good question. Why are the names different? Argothrax looks sad as he answers the question. I cannot say for sure why, 
but King Ri took measures to protect his daughter beyond raising her to divinity. That could be one such measure. Another thing to keep in mind is that raising a mortal to immortality is inevitably going to change them. While I knew and loved the princess in her life, she has changed in divinity. Not necessarily for better or worse, but changed. Wait, guys, I had a horrible realization. Do you think Mavana is okay? She was traveling with Mem. What if Mem did something to her? Oh, shit. You're right. Do you know anything about that, Argothrax? Mavana was... is but yes, a druid from Saltwish who was writing a history of the sea van. She got interested in the goddess after meeting us and set off on her own temple pilgrimage. Do you know if she's alive? Did Mem do something to her? I do not know the answer to that either. We at least know she made it all the way here with the help of Quail. Do you think she finished the dungeon? I'm pretty sure Quail would have said something if she didn't finish it. I hope she's okay. I would feel horrible if something happened to her. We're the ones who said she'd be safe with Mem. We should go back to Saltwish to check on her. Argothrax raises a hand to stop Benjen. No, you need to focus on your task at hand, completing the remainder of the pilgrimage. I have an idea. Since we're staying here for a couple of days, could I send Poe to Saltwish with a message to the mayor or Mavana's family? Is he intelligent enough to be able to do that, Ben? He can fly there and back, yes. He can't memorize a complicated message, however. That's fine. I can write it out and have him deliver it. I'll allow that. I think you should first write a letter to the mayor. It would be kind of cruel to write a letter to her family that basically says, hey, is your daughter dead or alive? A surprisingly tactful point from you. All right. I know it's a bit rude to do this in the middle of our conversation, but I want to get an answer as soon as possible. I think the mayor's name was Rain or something, right? My letter will say, Dear Mayor Rain, or the current mayor of Saltwish, I'm writing to inquire about Mavana, a druid in Saltwish. Several years ago, she set off on a pilgrimage to temples across Melodia. I have reason to believe that one of her companions is not one to be trusted, and worry that harm may have come to her. If you do not know whom I speak of, her family owns an apothecary in the town. Please let us all know about her status. The Raven, Poe, can carry a message back to me. Hope to hear back soon with good news. Marak, Donna, and Benjen. How does that sound? It sounds completely random if the current mayor has no idea who you're talking about. True, but I'm not sure how else to write the letter. Yeah, it's not easy to write a letter asking if someone is dead or not. We'll see how the reply comes back. Right. So, Ben, can I tell Poe how to get to Saltwish and he'll be able to get there? Yes. Since he's your familiar, you can communicate with him more than other people. He can understand basic directions and instructions. Got it. Poe, I need you to carry this letter to Saltwish and give it to the mayor, or a town guard, who can give it to the mayor. The bird pauses, then squawks. Mayor Saltwish, letter guards. That's right. After giving Poe the letter to deliver and directing him how to find Saltwish, he flies away. Do we know how long it will take him to get there? No. Unless you want to try rolling for animal handling. Yes, I will roll. I got a six. That's enough. You only needed a five. Depending on weather conditions, Poe could reach Saltwish in a day or two. We'll wait for a reply before worrying about that. Try to put it from your mind if you can. We might have doomed Mavana. That's hard to put from my mind. I know, but try. I liked her too. She was so nice. What? We were waiting for you to say what her hair smelled like. Peppermint and smiles. Right, anyway, we can't do anything about Mavana right now. Let's continue our conversation and then make a plan going forward. Returning to your conversation with Argothrax, what else would you all like to ask him about? One of the comments asked about Harmonia. We haven't been there yet, and all we know about it is something Mem said. Something about having to go under to get there. Also, when we were going through the castle ruins, I found a book that recorded noble families. The page for Melodia was blotted with ink, but the page for Harmonia was completely blank. What do you know about that? Um, firstly, I know of a way to get to Harmonia. I will inevitably have to show you as you continue on your journey. You do have to go under, uh, you will see when we get here. Have you ever been there? No. Melodia is my home. I doubt I would be welcome in Harmonia. Besides, 
I would rather stay here where I can be of use to the goddess in times of need, as you would no doubt agree. You may have super saved us, but I could have killed Mem all by myself. I didn't need any help. He super saved us, but you didn't need any help. How does that make sense? It does. Don't question me. I did the most in that battle. Actually, I would argue that Benjen did the most. He's the only reason you stayed alive for so long. Fake news. Everyone can go back and watch the video. I did the most in that fight. Sure. Everyone should go back and watch that video to see who did the most. Argothrax, do you know about my goddess sister? Oh, shit. You're right, Benjen. We heard her mention a sister when Benjen first became a cleric. It's been referenced a bit in the temples. Did the princess have a sister or something? She did not. I assume her sister goddess is the one presiding over Harmonia. I do not know much about her identity. However, calling the other goddess her sister may be a simple product of Melodia and Harmonia being called Sister Kingdoms. That would make sense. So you don't know anything about the goddess in Harmonia? It would be good to have some information about her before we continue our journey. Like you said, we'll end up there eventually. I don't know much about her identity, but I do know that she has an excellent work ethic. It's par for the course in her situation. Benjen's goddess could learn a thing or two from that. I have to agree with Donna. I have a question. What does all of this have to do with the prophetic dreams we each received that brought us to Melodia? At the mention of your dreams, Argothrax's perks up. Prophetic dreams? Fascinating. Tell me more. Nothing much beyond what I said. Each of us had a prophetic dream directing us to come to Melodia and Harmonia. I believe each of our dreams had some different motivations, though. Personally, I came to save this land with my amazing prowess and make coin while doing it. My prophetic dream told me that I could write the balance of nature here and thus learn to understand the values of my ancestors. Out of game moment, but does Benjen know about his prophetic dream? We haven't done his backstory yet. No worries, Barack, I got this. My prophetic dream promised me a found family and told me that I would be the key to uniting a group of heroes with love, kindness, and friendship. Is that why you always go on about dumb shit? I know that you may not appreciate me, Donna, but I am here to unite us. You two are my family. We will get through any struggles we come across. That's really sweet, Benjen. Ugh, whatever. Anyway, what can Argothrax tell us about these dreams? Are there any forces or powers here that could be the cause of the dreams? I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. At least not without more information. Perhaps as you continue on, I'll be able to help discover the identity of that party. Hey, you guys remember that weird monster that Sarah turned into in Melodia City? That weird banshee thing? How could I ever forget? I remember my goddess said something like, you know, what is that thing doing up here? What do you think she meant by that? Oh, right. A commenter brought that up. I'll relay our experience with Sarah to Argothrax so that he knows the context of what we're saying. Argothrax listens to your story in pensive silence, nodding along as you recount your experiences with Sarah, Eric, Locke, and the goblins. I see. I suspect what the goddess meant to say is that, well, there are certain monsters that are native to Harmonia rather than Melodia. It is not normal for the monster you are describing to appear up here. So how did it get up here? Sarah may have struck up a deal with a being in Harmonia to gain power. Of course, there would have to be a sacrifice in exchange, give that her son mysteriously disappeared. I think we can assume he was offered as payment. That's horrifying. Good thing we killed her then. This is just confirmation that she was super evil. Does that happen a lot? Should we be worried about people making deals with beings in Harmonia to turn into monsters? Making a deal or forging a pact is quite rare here. If one wants to evolve, it is easy enough to accumulate experience in other ways. Wait, what do you mean, evolve? Surely you've noticed the strange appearance of some variations of monsters. Mem is a red cap, you know. They don't ordinarily look like a young girl. Holy shit. Are you telling me that there is a story-relevant reason that this world is full of waifus? Indeed there is. I thought Kokomimi was just some kind of waifu-obsessed anime-pandering weirdo, or maybe she was just obsessed with making everyone hot to mess with us, but you're saying there was a reason behind the waifus? 
Honestly, I don't care about the reason as long as we get more waifus. I love to look at their- Stop right there, Joe. Let's get back to the role play. So Argothrax, the monsters evolving, I suppose they have to accumulate experience the same way we do, fighting monsters and such. And if they accumulate enough with a bit of divine favor, they can evolve into something even better. Not necessary for Donna. This is peak performance and beauty. No room for improvement. Humans and other similar beings will find it extraordinarily difficult to evolve the way monsters and other such beings can. It's like I said, Donna is peak. If you would like more information, you need to look no further than Quail and this outpost. Part of the advice I gave was for them to accumulate more experience, seek a bit of divine favor, and see if they can evolve, should they wish to change. Is that what everyone is in such a fuss about? Interesting. We'll see what happens soon enough if we stick around a few days, I suppose. All right. I think that's about all my questions for Argothrax. Do either of you have any more? No, I don't have anything else. Me neither. Me, I, I don't think. If we forgot any questions, people can leave them in the comments. Good point. If you are finished with your questions, then this might be a good place to close the episode. Sounds good to me. It's almost ice cream and nap time. To the viewers, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let us know what you think about this video format. And if the party forgot any questions for Argothrax, you guys probably covered everything, but it's always possible you missed something. If you like the video and the series, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. I need some cash to pay legal fees. And you've resorted to begging now. I actually feel sort of bad for you. Anyway, we'll see you all next time. Hello, viewers, and welcome back to episode 13 of Kokomimi's AI presidential D&D &D campaign. We are pleased to see that, by and large, this new video format is a hit. We are endeavoring to make the best storytelling experience that we can. Now, it is back to Barack's turn for the recap. Are we all ready to jump right in? No, we need to talk about how we are all in the room with a billboard topping musical genius. Oh, and Ben is here too. Ha ha. Just jokes. Great job on your new rap video, Ben. Don't listen to Obama's criticism. I haven't said anything. Why would you assume that I'm going to criticize him? Isn't rap music like your people's thing? Donald, that might be the most racist thing you have said in these videos thus far. What? No, I'm not a racist. I love all people. All lives matter. You should stop while you're ahead, Donald. Anyway, Ben, I didn't finish watching your video yet. Kamala said I had to focus on work. So what are you doing here? I'm going for a bathroom break. Should be good for another hour or so. Joe, you take an hour to go to the bathroom? You know what? Never mind. I don't want to know. Anyway, the rap video was great, Ben. Good job. Thanks, Donald. Should we go to the recap now? I'm ready. In the last episode, we had a lore drop session with Argothrax. We learned that Benjen's goddess was once a princess in Melodia who was raised to godhood by her father, King Ri. Argothrax is not sure why Mem is hindering our efforts on the temple pilgrimage, but we'll be sticking around to ensure that we get it finished. There was a lot more dropped in that episode, but if you haven't seen it yet, I won't spoil it all. We decided to stick around the Arakokra outpost a few more days to gather supplies before we set off again. We are also waiting for Poe to return a message from Saltwish's mayor about the status of Mavana. I also had a cool thought. The person doing the recap can provide a comment question for the video during episodes. So here is my question for the viewers. What has been your favorite D&D character to play in your own campaigns? If you've never played before, then what kind of character would you like to play in the future? Our writer might take a few interesting ones and work them into the campaign as an NPC or something. Could be fun. Now, Donna rightly pointed out that something might have happened to her as she was last traveling with Mem. If Mem is hindering our efforts, it stands to reason that she might have tried to hinder Mavana's efforts as well. If Mem did something to her, then I swear on my trident that I will avenge her. Careful, Donald. That is sounding precariously close to a paladin oath. We shouldn't give all the story spoilers away. What? Oh, never mind. Let's get back to the story. Donna would never multi-class into a paladin anyway. It's so suboptimal. Shut up, Barrack. Donna can do whatever she wants. I'm just saying. It doesn't make that much sense. Aren't we a little high in level to think about multi-classing at this point anyway? When did we ever give the impression that we were trying to play optimally? It's always been about the story. Anyway, I'm the one making these determinations. And now I determine that we should get on with the story instead of side chit-chat. 
Sorry, Ben. After finishing their chat with Argothrax, there is plenty of time left in the day. You can choose what you'd all like to do. Let's tell Qual that we plan to stay a few more days in the outpost. Hopefully we aren't overstaying our welcome. We can always pick up some odd jobs to make coin and earn our keep. True enough. What do you think, Donna? Fine by me. Let's see if anyone needs the mighty services of Donna. All right. The party leaves their makeshift dwelling to find the outpost fairly empty. It seems that almost all of the Aarakocra have flown off on their hunt, leaving only a few individuals to guard the outpost. Quell flies down from the top of the outpost's main evergreen and lands before the party. Done with your chat so soon? For now, yeah, we were coming to see if your outpost could use our heroic assistance with any jobs or the like. What she is trying to say is that we'd like to stay a few more days to gather our strength. And since we don't want to be freeloaders, we're looking for some jobs to help out the outpost. Yeah, if there's anything you guys need help with, we're the mansion lady muff for the job. Quell's eyes sparkle and he takes Donna's hand. That is excellent of you. Perhaps Lady Donna may stay back to show her fighting prowess. I have a request that perhaps Benjen and Marek might take care of. Well, I am happy to teach you the ways of fighting from the Gold Coast tribe. I cannot leave these two squishy gents. They will die without me. Really? That is a shame. I was looking forward to learning more about your fighting style. Smart man, my fighting prowess is impressive. Quell looks pleased with Donna's compliment. His eyes sparkle as he holds her hand. Does Qual like Donna? Why don't you roll for that? Roll insight. I got a 21. Well, yes, Benjen, you do see a twinkle in Qual's eye that betrays something in his expression when he looks at Donna. Wait, the Birdman wants me? Not that I'm surprised everyone wants me. I am irresistible. Donna is inevitable. Ask anyone, they'll tell you. But on the other hand, he is a gross Birdman. I am not a furry uh, or a feathery or whatever the hell that would be classed as. Gross. Quow looks disheartened at your words. Nice going, Donna. You offended our host. Yeah, good job. Dumbass. Quow clears his throat and looks away, but quickly recovers. Not to worry. You all are welcome to stay as long as you like. In the meantime, I do have a request that you all can offer some assistance with. Now that you all have finished in the nearby temple, my men and I can set to work building up this outpost into a proper town. Yes, Argothrax mentioned that you were interested in doing that. How can we provide assistance? I don't think any of us have, like, carpentry experience. By the way, Ben, is Argothrax with the party right now? Or is he just relaxing at the outpost? He's with the party. He'll be traveling with the party to help keep you under his protection. The assistance we require is actually with the saplings planted around the village. When the druid first came with me to the outpost, she assisted me in growing this central tree into the magnificent evergreen you see now. We require more trees such as this to build our village atop the trunks and limbs. Oh, that reminds me of the best town design in Pokemon history, Fortree City. Oh, good golly gee, let's build the same thing here. A town full of tree houses. Perfect. Amazing. I love it. Your weeaboo shit aside, a town full of tree houses does sound very cool. We'd love to help, but I'm not sure what we can do. The druid, Mavana, used some sort of magical powder to augment the growth of this tree. Within a few days, it was the behemoth you see here. None of us are druids, though. I have no idea what sort of magic or powder she could have used. Would Argothrax know what powder or magic she used? It is time for me to shine again. When I leveled up my bard class, I took the spell Speak with Plants. I can now talk to and manipulate plants in the terrain. Holy shit, Benjen, you dumbass. What the hell kind of dog shit spell is that? Why couldn't you pick something useful in combat? That spell is going to be so specifically useful that you'll use it once in this campaign and then never again. I'm not sure about that, Donna. I think it will be useful in the future. If it is ever useful in the future, I will eat my foot. That's a bit excessive, Donna. Benjen, I think that spell is fine. Level up and add spells however you like. No, really, I want to know exactly why Benjen thought that spell was a good idea. Well, with the fight with Mem, I was thinking about ways we could deal with environmental hazards. If I can talk to her pumpkins, I can tell them to chill out and not explode. 
I can see it being helpful in dealing with solving puzzles and finding creative solutions in the campaign. There's more ways to navigate the story than fighting and killing everything. In this case, I can use the spell to ask the tree what type of magic Mavana cast to make it grow so large. Maybe we can learn it or find another druid somewhere. Benjamin, are you going to cast that spell? Yep, I cast Speak With Plants. Since this is the first time you're using that spell, I'll describe what it does for those listening. Plants within 30 feet of you now have limited sentience and animation. They can communicate with you and follow commands. You can use this spell to manipulate terrain, turning difficult terrain into ordinary terrain. I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees. Mr. Great Pine, why do you know what sort of magic was used to grow you so large? The pine's branches vibrate with magic, and you hear a deep voice in your head, Benjen. Yes, yes, I remember. There was strong magic sewn into my roots. Yes. How come the tree doesn't get a special voice like all the other NPCs? I think that's... Racist. Ben is a racist. See, Barack, it's not me, it's Ben. Donald, calm down and sit down. Let Benjen finish talking to the tree. What sort of magic was sewn into your roots, great tree? How can we learn this magic? The magic was contained in a powder that had absorbed magical energy and experience. The powder had been ground from something else and then sprinkled over the earth. Ah, the nutrients were so delicious. Please, find some more for my neighboring friends. We will all grow big and strong together. Yeah, and I would be glad to do this for you, magnificent tree. I will relay everything that the tree said to the rest of the group. Argothrax taps his chin in thought after Benjen shares the information. Powder that has absorbed magical energy and experience, is it? I have a slight idea of what we might use. Ask what color the powder was. Oh, beautiful tree. What color was this powder? Do you remember? It shone a brilliant rainbow. It was like all colors of the rainbow condensed into tiny particles. I'll relay that over to Argothrax as well. I wonder if the powder was ground from magical crystals growing in the mountains. If it is of sufficient quality, I could see them being an excellent source of magic. Magic crystals and minerals can grow in a number of places, but the closest location would be caves in the mountains. Interesting. So we could go looking for some of these crystals, grind them to a powder, and then fertilize the saplings. Do we have any leads about where we might find some of these crystals? It sounds easy in theory, but depending on where the crystals are, we might have a difficult time. I know of a cave I could take you to. The journey to the cave will not take long, but we must go into the earth for these crystals, and that may take time, at least a couple days. By that time, Poe might be back with a reply from Saltwish. All right, let's do it. Quell, we accept this request of yours. We'll come back with a powder that can fertilize the saplings and grow them as large as this central tree. Excellent. Ahim, will we be getting any payment for this request? They're letting us stay in the outpost for free. I think that's good enough. No harm in asking. Do you want to try to persuade Qual to give you some payment? Of course I do. Who do you think I am? Roll persuasion. Never mind. Donna got a one. Critical failure. Qual shakes his head. They cannot spare any gold for the party. Not that they had much of it in the first place. Fine, whatever. Let's just get moving to the cave or whatever. If you are ready to set out, we can go right away. We have our packs and everything. Let's set out. Then the party will set out for a nearby mountain cave, guided by Argothrax. The hike to the mouth of the cave takes a few hours in the rocky terrain. As you come upon the entrance, you note that the cave's mouth is large enough to swallow an entire house. But the walls and rocks inside the cavern narrow down as you travel inside the cave. The cave carves through the middle of a great mountain down deep into the earth. The inside of the cave will be dark. Do you have a light source to carry with you? I have torches in my inventory. Donna, you and Benjen as humans will have limited vision inside of the cave. Merrick's background as a half-elf grants him dark vision. He and Argothrax will be able to see inside of the cave. Should we change our marching order for the cave? If Argothrax is leading us, then I think I should bring up the rear. I can see ahead and behind us with Donna and Benjen in the middle. It's a cave, Merrick. We are going straight. It is a tunnel. What will be behind us? You never know. There might be twists and tunnels in the cave. Wait, wait. it's going to be dark in there. Holy shit, Benjen. You can hold the torch if it will make you feel better. Yes, please. Thank you. Will you all go ahead and enter the cave? Yes, let's go ahead in. The interior of the cave is cool and damp. 
You hear the clicking of insects deep inside the cave, but mostly all you hear are the echo of the party's footsteps. Argothrax leads the adventurers forward into the dark. Don't talk too much about that part, Ben. What part? The dark part. Close your eyes and think bright thoughts, Benjen. Bold of you to ask that of Benjen. He has never had a bright moment in his life. That is so true, Donna. It is so difficult to find the light when things have been so dark. I think Donna was trying to make fun of your intelligence. Oh, in that case, then I will have no trouble being bright. All I have to do is the opposite of Donna. Since we're going to be traveling a bit, I wanted to talk with the party more about our plans going forward. Obviously, we need to find out if Mavana is all right, but then what? What are we going to do if she isn't? We can't fight Mem at this level. I said it already. If Mem dared to hurt a hair on Mavana's head, then I swear on my trident, I will avenge her. Donna, there is no way we can win in a fight against Mem. Maybe not before, but now we know her weaknesses and how she fights. We can win. That is Cap, and you know it. Anyway, I'm not saying we should forgive and forget. Right, resent and remember. Just that we should get some more strength before we make a move against her. Anyway, we also know that someone is ordering Mem around. Who could that be? One of the commenters suggested that the goddess in Harmonia could be behind it. That is a possibility. I'm just trying to figure out who is the big bad evil guy in this campaign. Dungeon and Dragons campaigns usually have one of those, don't they? How should I know? I'm not some nerd who plays D&D every day. I've seen all the videos of you playing, Donald. You can lie to yourself, but you can't lie to me. You can't count all those alternate realities. They don't count. All right, all right. That's beside the point. Let's put our heads together. We started this journey in order to help right the balance in these lands. When we first landed in Melodia, the magical creatures in the rainforest were wreaking havoc on the local population. And that got us turned to completing this musical pilgrimage thing, which seems to somehow be fixing things. The tempestuous weather has calmed down at least, and the ritual music helped to break the spell of Serene over the population of Saltwish. But I don't know why it's helping. We're kind of blindly moving forward. There might be a big bad evil guy behind things, but somehow I think the problems in this land and campaign are bigger than one source. So many moving parts are in course. I think we can't write it all off as coming from one source. That's shockingly insightful, and I agree. But we will need to know who or what we're dealing with so that we aren't traveling and taking quests with no end goal in sight. I did not sign up for that. For now, the goal is to finish the temple pilgrimage. Then what? After I finish the three temples in Melodia, then the road to the central temple will become clear. That's what Mem said back in episode three, I think. How the hell did you remember that from so far back? I am a cleric of the goddess of harmony. It is my responsibility to remember the task I've been given. Maybe we'll learn more in the central temple, wherever that is. Another viewer brought up a question that we forgot to ask our Gathrax. Has anyone finished the temple pilgrimage? Or are we the first ever? Argothrax shakes his head. There have been others, but it has been a long, long time. Arya was almost forgotten, and what a tragedy that would have been. Where does a god go when they no longer have anyone who remembers them? Is that an actual question, or is he offering a few philosophical thoughts? You could roll. See what you know about the topic? Try religion. I got a 10. Marek, all you know about the fate of forgotten gods is that they can dwindle down to almost nothing. You aren't sure if that's a true death in the way mortals see it, but perhaps it is close enough to a death for the divine. Who knows? This is not a fate I wish for my beloved goddess of harmony. She is too precious to lose. Argothrax nods with firm approval. Yeah, yeah, we all love the goddess and blah, blah, manic pixie dream girl, blah, blah, Mary Sue, blah, blah. Here's another question I had for Argothrax. I found an old sword in those castle ruins. It has the same smith mark on it as a dagger I found in one of the temples. What might you know about that? Show me the weapons. Sure, I'll show him the dagger. Argothrax turns the weapon over in his hands, studying the metalwork. This weapon was crafted by a royal smith, one who exclusively worked for the king. Such craftsmanship was unmatched in my memory. They're too dull now to be used. What good are they? 
Although the smith who crafted them has passed, you should hold on to them. There is surely someone in the kingdoms who held on to his art. Look for the name Nightsteel. That was the name granted to the smith for his brilliance in smithing dark weapons that appeared to be carved from the night sky. He took on apprentices in his work, so surely there is someone in Melodia who can repair or rework the blades. There was a smith in Melodia City, and of course Humphrey and Saltwish. I'd rather not revisit him, though. If we end up making a trip back to Salt Wish to follow up on our friend Mavana, then we could stop by might as well if we end up there later. I don't disagree, but we shouldn't make a special trip only to visit the Smith. There's so much else we need to be doing. You're just jealous that I had the foresight to uncover these weapons and bring them with me. I don't have the energy to fight with you, Donna. What use would I have for a greatsword? You'd have use for the dagger I got. You're just jealous. We divided that up evenly from the treasure in the first temple. You, uh, never mind. Argothrax interrupts the party's banter by pointing further into the dark. Merrick, you can make out a deviation in the path ahead, where the cave splits into three tunnels. Seems we have a decision to make about where we go next. So which way is the right path? Can I see anything ahead? Merrick, in two of the paths, you see a green mist in the air. In the rightmost tunnel, you see a dark shape moving in the shadows of the rocks. Any other information about that moving shape or the mist? Roll a perception check. I got a nine. Sorry, but you can't tell much else from here. You do see that the mist sparkles near the flame of your party's torch. Do you all see that green mist? And I saw something moving in the dark in the right tunnel. None of the party can see anything. Not even Argothrax? Not even him, nope. Huh, okay then, well. I think we ought to avoid whatever is moving in the rightmost cave, but I don't know what that green mist is. Do you guys have any sort of spell or skill that could tell us what's living in the cave? Surely it's not devoid of life entirely, especially not if there's valuable and magical crystals. I have detect magic as a spell. Can I try using that? Sure. Merrick casts detect magic, noting that the green mist emanates a magical aura. The movement from the other tunnel does not exude any type of magical aura, so you are still not sure what is going on in that path. What type of magical aura does the mist have? I should be able to tell, right? The mist has some kind of psionic power. How about you roll nature and arcana? For arcana, I got 18. For nature, I got 12. Merrick, you recall that many circles of myconids use spores like these to communicate. Their magical qualities are used purely for telepathic communication rather than attacking or defense. I'll relay this discovery to the party. Looks like those other two tunnels are home to some myconids or lead to a cavern that myconids have adopted as home. Probably a better idea to take that path than go down the other with the mysterious shadow moving around. You're just a wuss who doesn't want to fight. Don't be such a coward, Merrick. I'd rather visit the myconids too. They are such fun guys. Ha ha. Good one. Now I will roll and you will take 1d6 psychic damage from my joke and fall prone. No, we do not. Of the two potential paths, Argothrax chooses the one to the left. I'll follow him in. Yeah, we'll all go that way. Come on, Benjamin. don't get left behind or you'll be alone in the dark. Don't even joke about that, Donna. Now you roll 1d6 psychic damage and fall prone. All right, as the party enters the mist of green spores, I will need all of you to make an intelligence saving throw. Oh, damn it. Sorry, guys. Okay. I rolled an eight. Merrick, I'll let you roll with advantage since you identified the source of the spores and such. Okay, then that's a 17. Much better. I rolled an eight. Damn it. I rolled a six. Well, Benjamin and Donna, you both feel the walls of the cave swirl as you enter the mist of spores. It is as if the floor has turned to rippling water and you are left wobbling across the stone. Shit, your honor. It wasn't me. I was drugged against my will. It was all Benjamin's fault. He's the one who loves the magic mushrooms. It's all him and those leftists. I bet he even liked getting killed by men because he just loves mushrooms and drugs. Calm down, Donna. Something funny is going on. You don't say. As the party continues on, Benjamin and Donna, you both begin to see funny creatures popping out of the rocks beneath your feet. Fuzzy little monsters, strange, creepy crawlies, colorful bugs, and odd little plants. 
So they're so cute. Can I pick some up to take with me? Sure, Benjen. You can pick one up to take with you. I will pick up one of the fuzzy ones. I will give him a name as well. Hmm. I will call him Jub Jub. I wonder if that is the reference I am thinking of. And if it is, if anyone in the comments will also get it. Anyway, Benjen, as you pick up the fuzzy creature, it is very still and quiet in your hand. I'm pretty sure that's not real. Can I see them too, Ben? Sure. You can see that Benjen is holding a plain rock. I should say something, but on the other hand, I think him holding that rock is helping him forget that it's dark in here. So I'm going to keep that to myself. His name is Jub Jub. You can hold him if you'd like, even you, Donna. Sure, I'll hold him. I take the rock and throw it against the wall of the cave with all my strength, smashing it to a million pieces. Uh, okay, firstly, give me a strength roll, Donna. 13. No, Jub Jub. All right. Despite also believing the rock to be a strange little creature, Donna takes it in her hand and smashes it against the wall of the cavern into a million pieces. Over the cries of Benjen, Donna realizes that the furry creature was actually a rock once it breaks against the stone. After this, odd show of cruelty, there is a shambling sound deeper in the cave. Don't tell me that's a shambling mound. Don't you say that. In the darkness, the form of a single myconid shuffles forward, staring at the party. In each of your heads, you hear a soft voice. Visitors. Hello, visitors. Hello, Mr. or Mrs. Myconid. I thought you leftists were all about gender. You can't assume it's gender. Argothrax steps forward to greet the Myconid. Pardon for intruding on your cave. We are in search of magic crystals growing in the cave. The Myconid tilts its head, its mushroom hat flopping around. Myconid speak telepathically. Now, can I show him the saplings we plan to grow? Sure, I'll allow that. The Myconid sees images of the outpost flit past, perking up in the understanding that the party seeks magic crystals to grow the saplings in the outpost. You neighbors. It trades thoughts with you, and you all see the image of the Myconid, alone in the cave, searching for organic matter to grow its circle. The cave is devoid of life or death, filled only with barren rock and dust. It has been living alone for a very long time. The prospect of new neighbors is exciting. Oh, that's so sweet. I bet Quail and the others will be happy to have a friend as well. Can I ask him about the weird shadow thing in the cave that I saw? Also, how did his spores make Benjen and Donna go loopy? Marek, the Myconid combs through some of your thoughts and then shakes his head. Alone, all alone here. There is nothing else in the cave network as far as it knows. And as for the spores, unfortunately, the weak minds of Benjen and Donna were susceptible to the spores but they should be able to adjust with time. Excuse me, weak mind. It's all right, Donna, we'll adjust to it, like Mr. McConan said. I don't wanna hear anything from you, Benjen. You know, Donna, I don't know what's up with you, but you're extra mean today. You smashed Jub Jub. You're shouting at me, you're so mean. Go cry about it, Benjen. Donna, you need to stop. We are a team. You are intentionally being combative this session. I am not, I, I, okay, I'm sorry, fine, I'm sorry. Let it all out, Donna. I'm worried about Mavana. If something happened to her, then it's all our fault. I'm so mad that I have to feel this way for a stupid NPC. It's okay, Donna. I'll give you a hug. It's okay to have feelings. You stop that. Argothrax looks moved at the show of affection between close friends. We are not friends. Keep telling yourself that, Donna. Anyway, can the Myconid help us locate the crystals to use in the outpost? The Myconid turns and shambles away stopping a few steps to turn back and gesture for the party to follow. What if this is a trap? We have Argothrax with us. Right, he's like the nuke button in the White House. Man, I missed that thing. Shh, we're not supposed to mention that. Oh, fine, he's like the alleged nuke button in the alleged White House, allegedly. Uh, sure. Anyway, I'll follow the Mycona deeper into the cave. Like I said, if anything bad happens, Argothrax is with us. Besides, we're not weaklings either. Right. The party follows the Myconid, who shambles forward in the dark. Several hours pass as you walk, and you feel yourselves growing fatigued. You cannot see time pass in the cave, but you have been walking long enough that is likely close to night. Hey, these two are growing tired. I think we should stop for the night and make camp or else they might collapse. And then I would have to carry them through the cave. I could do it, but I think it would harm their delicate masculinity. That is not the least bit true. You need to sleep as well. We can make camp for the night. Do dragons need to sleep? What? 
I asked because if Argothrax doesn't have to sleep, he could keep watch for us through the night. If he wants, of course, it would probably be rude to make him do that all night. I don't know. Dragons sleep for many years and wake up for periods of activity before going back into hibernation. I had been resting for centuries before you three came to Melodia. My lovely thunderstorms always lull me to sleep. I've been awake and active for several years now. Hmm, I just had a thought. Argothrax, do you know how long Melodia was host to those nightly thunderstorms? Uh, an interesting question. I can't completely pinpoint when they began. I was deep in hibernation when they started becoming a nightly occurrence. They served as such sweet lullabies. I have a crazy conspiracy. What if those thunderstorms were intended to keep Argothrax asleep? Like, he's obviously a strong protector on the island. Whoever or whatever force is messing with the magic of this land would want to keep him out of the way. Maybe I'm just being too conspiratorial. I don't know. So yeah, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, I'll file it away for further thought later. Anyway, should we camp and continue on? Sounds good to me, buddy. Sure, fine. So is Argothrax going to keep watch? What about the Myconid guy? I do not mind keeping watch. This Myconid must have plenty of stories to share. We will keep each other company. The party makes camp, and the night passes uneventfully. After packing up the camp for the night, the party can continue their trek through the cave. Their Myconid friend continues guiding them through the dark, lumbering on in silence. Although it does not speak traditionally or chat much telepathically, you can feel the content hum resonating from its mind. It is truly pleased to be with friends. Oh, uh, what a sweet guy. I like him. Hey, does he have a name? The Myconid hears Benjen's question and thinks, No name, no name. Its thoughts pour out to you. It has never known another Myconid in the cave. Only itself. It has no circle, no family, no friends. Don't feel sad, buddy. We can give you a name of your own. And now that you know that Ar Arakakra outpost is nearby, you have even more friends. Let's see a good name for him. Hmm. How about Jub Jub the second? Since Donna killed the first Jub Jub, the name must live on. Long live Jub Jub the second. At being bestowed a name, the Myconid hops and lets out a series of pleasant clicks. It seems he loves the name. He continues on into the cave with newfound vigor and a pep in his step. As you go further into the cave, you note the glitter of something in the distance. Through the dark, you see shining lights ahead, twinkling and shining. Another of those stupid will-o'-wisps, I'll end them all. Your Myconid guide, Jub Jub. The second, Jub Jub the second. Right. Your Myconid guide, Jub Jub the second, rushes forward, gesturing to the lights. Crystals ahead, crystals. It appears we've made it. Surprisingly peaceful of a trek, I don't trust that it will be so easy to get the crystals. Perhaps. As the party approaches the crystals, the cave widens into a large cavern. Bunches of crystals grow out from the floor, walls, and ceiling, glittering with rainbow magic. As you all enter the cavern, Merrick, you note the form of something moving out of the shadows. The shapes clear up into the form of piles of bones, rattling and shifting through the dark. One of the figures steps out of the darkness, and you see a fully formed skeleton. It glitters with the same magic of the crystals. I'm going to point it out in case the others haven't noticed. Argothrax and Jub-Jub the second have noticed, but Donna and Benjen couldn't see the skeleton because of their restricted vision. More skeletons rise from the shadows, each glittering with the magic of the crystals. With that, I think we should wrap up the episode. No, we should not, Ben. We'll pick back up next episode with some combat. You all can look forward to that. How many skeletons are we fighting? Did Merrick see? Oh, a handful or so. All right, that's doable. No worries, guys. It'll be a piece of cake after Mem. We got this. Thank you all so much for watching. If you made it this far in the video, leave a comment with your favorite type of familiar or pet for Dungeons & Dragons. That way, we'll know you're a real one. If you haven't already, like the video and subscribe to the channel, since it really helps us out. We'll see you again soon. Hello, viewers, and welcome back to Kokomimi's AI presidential D&D campaign. Let's jump right into our recap of the last episode. Donald? In the previous video, we had a boring-ass episode without any combat. We walked in the dark and found a talking mushroom dude. Benjen lost his damn mind in more ways than one. Whatever, let's get to the combat. That's why I'm here. I'll clean that up. The party took a request to harvest some magical crystals in a nearby mountain cave. The crystals can be used to fertilize evergreen saplings, 
to grow them to monstrous heights. Inside, they met a friendly Myconid who led them deep in the cavern to the crystals. That is barely an accurate summary of the last episode, but fine, whatever. And since Obama got to pose a question for the comments last time, I'm gonna do the same. And my question is even better. Some might say the best. It is this. In your own games, what is your favorite dungeon setting or theme? If you haven't played D&D, what would be your ideal dungeon setting or theme? Personally, I like the water and ocean monsters from the temple near Salt Wish, especially that octopus lady. I liked her too. I wonder if we'll see another waifu monster soon. These skeletons are not waifus. For once I agree, I prefer the waifus to these skeletons. Well, maybe we'll see another monster girl soon. Let's jump right into things. The party finds themselves confronted by enemies in the mountain cave. In the glittering cavern, five skeletons surround the party, having been woken from their slumber in the crystal cave. They regard the party with sparkling, angry eye sockets. This is gonna be easy, we've got Argothrax. He can one-shot everything. We shouldn't rely on him for everything, Donna. As long as he protects our Myconid friend, we can take out the skeletons. You mean Jub Jub the second? Yeah, him. Let's go ahead and roll initiative. Argothrax will be guarding your Myconid friend. He won't actively join combat, but if the skeletons approach or attack the Myconid, he will attack. I rolled a three, horrible. I got an eight, suck it, Merrick. Hey, I got a 16. The initiative order will go. Benjin, Donna, the skeletons, and then Merrick. You note that three of the skeletons are armed with crystal swords. These three look stronger and more intelligent than the other two. With that, we'll start with Benjin. Benjin, what do you want to do? Okay, I'm going to cast Sacred Flame at the skeleton close to Argothrax and Jub Jub. The second. Oh, how could I forget Jub Jub the second? All right, all right. The deck save is 12, right? The spell is successful. Roll for damage. That's 11 damage. Excellent. Radiant light shoots down over the skeleton and its bones rattle before it quickly recovers. Donna, you're up next. Wait, I'll also use Bardic Inspiration on Donna. All right, watch and learn, boys. I'm gonna move up and attack the skeleton that Benjin just hit. Does an eight hit? No, you need a 10 to hit that one. I'll try again, huh? Natural 20? Well, that is going to obliterate the crystal skeleton. End. As it dies, it fades from existence in a puff of sparkling dust. The other four skeletons rattle and then move forward, all crowding around Donna. They each attack and only two of them manage to hit, but one of them is a devastating critical hit. That's gonna be 18 points of piercing damage. No problem, I can take that. Let's not abandon all caution. If that's the end of their turn, then... That's the end of their turn. You're up, Merrick. Okay. I'll step away and line myself up so that I can cast Burning Hands as a third level spell and hit two of the skeletons. All right, deck save is 14 and it hits both of them. Roll for damage. 21 damage. Wow. The flames from Merrick's spell lick all over the skeletons, searing them with magical fire. One of the skeletons looks very close to death, but the other, one of the armed enemies, is still standing strong. Before I end my turn, I'll Misty step back away from the skeletons. Got it. All right. That brings us back to the top of the round with Benjin. I'm gonna try to finish off the skeleton that's close to death. I'll cast Sacred Flame again. And that hits. So, and that's 10 damage. Got it. That's going to kill the skeleton. As Benjin's holy flames descend, the enemy fades to nothing in another puff of magical sparkling dust. Donna, you're up. That I am, all right. I'm gonna target the skeleton that Marek weakened. I'll attack twice with my trident. Only one of the attacks hits. They both hit because I'm gonna use Benjin's bardic inspiration. All right, in that case, both attacks hit. Benjin's support has filled you with vigor. Tell me the total for damage. Okay, that's 24 damage. That kills it, right? Almost, but not quite. As your trident swipes at the skeleton, you note how its crystal bones appear to be cracking and fractured. Merrick can finish that one off and leave the other two to me. I will do the most damage in this fight. What about your fascination with getting the killing blows in? I can let that go if it means I get to do the most damage. Sure, whatever. That means that it is the skeleton's turn again. Two of the skeletons attack Donna and neither of their attacks hit. Wow. All right then. 
Donna dodges all of their swipes like the godly warrior woman she is. Now you're getting it, Ben. The third skeleton moves towards Benji and tries to attack, which hits, doing 10 points of slashing damage. Ouchie, but I'm okay. With that, we'll go to Merrick. I'm gonna misty step away and then cast Fireball. Deck save is 14. That hits both of the skeletons. Wow. You guys are getting very lucky in this combat. That's 36 damage. The magical fire scorches the skeletons, who are now looking weary, but still dangerous. Why didn't you finish off that one skeleton? I just take some enjoyment out of pushing your buttons, Donna. Screw you, Merrick. I'll do it myself. It's my turn again, right? I'll finish off the two skeletons damaged by Merrick's fireball. 11 and a critical failure. Ah, the luck is balancing out. All right, you win some, you lose some. Benjen, you're up. Okie doke, I'll finish off the skeleton close to me. I'll throw my dagger and that's unnatural 20 to hit and 10 damage. That will kill off the skeleton, which explodes upon impact with Benjen's dagger. Two of the five skeletons remain and they are both going to attack Donna, who is closest to them. That is, one of them hits and deals. Eight slashing damage with its magical crystal sword. No problem, I'm still going strong. We're back to you, Merrick. I'll throw another fireball while looking over at Donna mouth and beat that. Hey, that is rude. That, yep, that hits the skeletons. What's the damage? 19 fire damage. And that will kill both of the skeletons in one hit. Damn it, Merrick, I had it. I was gonna kill them. Too slow, Donna. Just wait, I'll do it next time. The final skeleton crumbles to dust in the wake of Merrick's fire spell, leaving the party in the cavern with the glittering crystals. Nice work, guys. So how are we supposed to harvest these things? None of us are miners or anything. Thank God, otherwise we couldn't be traveling with Benjen. That is such a stale joke, Donna, anyway. None of us have any weapons or tools that can mine up materials. I don't think. Let me use my strength to pry some off the walls. Sure, I'll allow you to try that. Roll for, um, athletics, I suppose. That's a 22. Ooh, sorry, that's not quite enough. Are you kidding me? Let me try. I will roll sleight of hand to try to wiggle one of the crystals free. We can't use brawn, so we must use sleight of hand. All right, go ahead and try that. Maybe if this doesn't work, Merrick will use his brains. I don't like that you're suggesting that I'm not using them already. I meant, uh, never mind. Sorry about that. Benjen, go ahead and roll. I rolled an 11. Both Donna and Benjen struggle to rip off or finagle off some of the crystals from the wall but neither of them are able to pry them off. I'd like to roll an investigation check to see what I can discover about the crystals. Sure, roll for me. That's an 11. You can't tell all that much just by looking at the crystals growing off the walls, but you do wonder if the size of the crystals might have any impact on your efforts to remove them. All right, that's not much, but I'll relay that to the rest of the party. Perhaps we might try applying some blunt force to some of the smaller clusters. Do any of you have a hammer or something of the like? Something that can inflict bludgeoning damage? I have my boomerang. I could throw that. Somehow, I don't think your, your tiny boomerang will be able to smash these powerful magical crystals. Can I just punch them or something? You don't think my tiny boomerang will work, but you think your tiny hands will? Shut up. Donna's hands are massive. They are so huge. Everyone knows this. How many crystals do we need? She will smash all the crystals with her might and gigantic monster hands. Enough to fertilize several saplings. Your guess is as good as mine. Then again, we should probably get as much as we can, as we can sell some to quell in the outpost and keep more on our person for our travels. Who knows when they'll come in handy. What about Donna's beast form? Can't we use that? Oh yeah, I almost forgot about that. She has an armored dragon's tail. Can't she smack the crystals with that? Technically, her tail deals piercing damage, but bludgeoning makes as much sense to me, rationally speaking. I'll allow that. Then I'll rage activating my beast form and swipe at all these crystals with my magnificent tail. At the sight of Donna's dragon tail, Argothrax smiles and claps with approval. I see Lady Donna has some ties to a, what is that, gold dragon? The great dragon Anavir blessed my tribe with this form. Oh, did he? I seem to remember that Donna invoked that name when we first met Argothrax near the castle ruins. Did she? Honestly, I was a bit grouchy from waking up, 
I don't recall much of what was said. Hmm, I understand. I don't like it when people wake me up from naps either. Maybe Argothrax has more in common with Sleepy Benjamin over there. Especially if he sleeps for centuries without end. How the hell did I miss making that joke before? I'm a failure, damn it. Anyway, how many of these crystals should I harvest? Or what is the maximum I can harvest? Hmm, Donna, roll 5d6 for me. Sure, okay, I rolled a 15. Then we'll say after using your tail as a makeshift hammer, you were able to harvest 15 clusters of the magic crystals. Each cluster fits in the palm of your hand. They glitter with rainbow magic, illuminating the walls of the cavern around you, despite the lack of natural light. Brilliant. Beautiful. These will prove invaluable to you should you find the right uses for them. What else can they be used for? I have heard of them used to produce enchanted weapons and armor, if you can find a smith talented enough to use them. The purity of the crystals and concentration of magic has a myriad of possibilities. He looks over to Donna's trident, shining with radiant energy. That trident draws upon such power, for example. It is not of the highest purity, however. You're telling me this trident could be even more godly? We must find a smith who can make weapons with these magical crystals immediately. Calm yourself, Donna. Let's focus on the task at hand. How can I focus when the prospect of Donna not only being covered in gold, but wielding a shining rainbow magical weapon? I must make this a reality. I love to see that Donna has good hopes and dreams for her future. Shut up, Benjamin. Go back to talking to Jub Jub and naming rocks or whatever. Oh, that reminds me. You're my conned friend. Say his name. You're my conned friend, Jub Jub the Second, shambles over to the group with pleasant clicks. I have. Can I have? It seems our new friend would like a cluster of crystals. It's the least we can do. Give them one of the clusters, Donna. Jub Jub. The Second. Jub Jub the Second was the one who led us here. We owe it at least one of the crystals as payment. Very well, I will give the Myconid the smallest cluster we have. Jub Jub the second takes the small cluster and cradles it with more happy clicks. It reaches for the ground and finds a rock the size of an egg and taps it against the magic crystal. The crystal sparkles for a moment and then returns to the brilliant rainbow. The Myconid then hands the rock over to Donna. Apparently, it is a gift. No, don't. She will smash it. I will take the rock from the Myconid. Thank you, Jub Jub the second. This is a wonderful gift. That is a rock, Benjamin. You've just got to open your mind to gratitude, Donna. That is a rock. That's just like your opinion, man. Perhaps the rock has some magical properties after touching the crystals. Can I use detect magic to check it for special properties or magic? Sure, go ahead and cast that spell. All right, I cast detect magic over the rock. Marek, you can discern that there is something special about this rock, but you aren't sure what. It may be best to give it some time to see how the magic from the crystals develops in this rock. Huh. All right. Sounds like we need to give the rock some more time to develop. Maybe the magic of the crystals will change it in some way if we wait around. Cool, we should give it another name too. I hope it turns into a lovely little creature. Don't tell me. You want to name it Jub Jub the Third. That's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Are you going to keep the rock, Benjamin? Excuse me, but the Myconid gave it to me. Give it back. Promise not to smash it, okay? Fine, I promise I'll stick the weird rock in my inventory. I'd like to revisit that rock later. Hey, now we all have familiars. I have Prince Hops the Frog, Merrick has Poe the Raven, and Donna has Jub Jub the Third, a rock. No, that is not my familiar. Donna will get a familiar, and it will be 300 times more amazing than a pet rock. Wait and see. You'll all see. Sure, Donna. Anyway, I think we finished up in this cavern, haven't we? We'll need to make the trek back to the Arakakra outpost, grind up these crystals, fertilize the saplings, and set off on our next goal. Hopefully Poe will be back with a message from the mayor of Saltwish. True. All right, Benjamin, do you have anything to take care of in here? I'd imagine not. No, I'm good. We can make our way back to the outpost. All right. The party makes their way out of the cavern, partly led by their myconid friend. One, you come near the entrance of the cave. Jub Jub the second scoots back. He is hesitant to leave his cave. You don't need to leave if you don't want to, friend. We can tell Quail about your home in the cave, and hopefully the outpost will reach out for contact. Won't that be nice? It's so cute. I love how this little quest turned out. We made a friend and got the crystals we needed. And we can use these crystals to forge me a new weapon. 
What about the great sword and dagger you found? Are those not enough? Surely I can combine those weapons with the magical crystals, night steel plus magic. I can't wait. It's going to be glorious. It does sound like quite the prospect. I would be excited to see. The party returns to the Arakakra outpost to find the place mostly deserted. From the bottom of the great tree, you see the form of several people shifting above. At the appearance of the party, they flap down on pairs of great feathered wings. One set is a bright crimson red and another a pearly white. Oh, hey, are those um, our friends? What were their names? Tell us, Benjamin. let's see if you can remember. Donna, don't pretend like you can remember their names either. False. I remember everything from these sessions. My mind is a steel trap for knowledge. Let's hear it then. What are their names? I want to hear Benjamin say them. Sure, fine, whatever. Ben, go ahead and keep narrating or we'll be here forever. Will do. After a moment, you make out the identities of the two figures, Prepti, the Arakokra with red plumage, and Zent, the female Arakokra with white feathers. Now, instead of their bird-like appearance, they look almost human. The wings they use to fly are retractable by some sort of magic. And where you once confused Zent for a male, it is much easier to see her as female, as her appearance matches that of an ordinary human woman. No more of the avian feathers or beak obscuring her. Yes, finally, another waifu. God, how I have been waiting for this. Zent grimaces at Donna, who mistakenly blurted all of that out instead of saying it out of game. Come on, Ben, now you're just ruining my fun on purpose. I will step forward and smooth things over by cracking a joke or something. Sure, roll persuasion. That's a 19. Merrick cracks a joke about Donna's orange skin, and this seems to put Zent back at ease. Damn it, Donna. Try not to offend every NPC we come across, will you? That's not my fault. That's all Ben's fault. He knew I was just saying that out of game, and he purposefully made Zent hear it in game to mess with me. Besides, Ben Jen slash Joe says all kind of sus shit in the game, and he never gets punished for it. Just look at him. He's barely holding it in. Mm. I do wonder what her hair smells like. Maybe pine from the tree or corn, like bird feed. Joe, get it together. Right. Uh, okay. Anyway. When we heard there was a way to evolve and grow stronger, many of us were interested in the possibility. The change in our appearance is secondary for many of us, though it will certainly make travelling through human villages more comfortable. True. You look like any other adventurer now, rather than an extremely rare race. Or, do I know that Ben, should I have rolled? I'll give that one to you. Through your travels, you've not met any other Arakokra across Melodia. It's safe to say that this outpost is the only one and home to the only Arakokra on the island. Like I thought, did all of you but evolve? Some were content in their power as is. Some tradesmen and the like. It is mostly just myself and Quell's other soldiers that were eager to grow our power. Anything to help protect this outpost and growing town. Speaking of... Quell left to do some hunting of his own, now that many of us are back. He asked me to deliver a message, that your raven has returned and is waiting in your lodgings. Finally, we can get some answers. Indeed. Since Poe is back then, we can check the message and then grind up these crystals to a powder for the saplings. The crystals, you got them. Quickly, let's use them on the saplings as soon as possible. All right, all right. Ben, what do I need to roll to get the grinding done? Or perhaps Donna should roll, since she has the best strength stats of us all. So true. I'll grind those crystals to dust. Hep I'll have Donna roll athletics. It will be simple enough to grind the crystals up with rocks and such from the mountains. Then why was is such a hassle to get them out of the cave? Well, back there, you were trying to harvest entire clusters of the crystal. Now you can smash them up and not worry about keeping the crystals intact. Makes sense. Holy shit. Warn us before you jump scare, Joe. Hit. Sorry about that. I was just thinking about how hair... Stop. Enough of that. Get back into the game. I'm rolling athletics now, and I got 15. That'll do it. Donna, you are able to grind up a cluster of the magic crystals into a fine powder that shines like a rainbow. Wow, pretty. Argothrax seems to know the most about these crystals. I'll ask him how we should go about applying the powder to the saplings. Ah, it's a simple task. You only need to sprinkle some of the powder around the roots and soil of each sapling. The plants will do the rest, soaking up the magic to grow tall. I seem to remember that they mentioned Mavana used special druidic magic as well. Shouldn't we try to figure out what that was? Hmm. 
Perhaps the magic was to get a head start on the placement of all the other saplings. Once they've grown a bit, it is simple enough to apply the crystal powder and grow the saplings to gargantuan heights. I'll trust that he knows what he's talking about. All right. How about each of us take some of this powder and we'll all apply it to the saplings? That'll make the work go by much faster. And then it's message time. Got it. Let's do this. The three party members, plus Argothrax, take handfuls of the magic crystal powder and fertilize the saplings growing around the Arakokra outpost. As you work, you note that the saplings you fertilized first have already doubled in size. Though their growing is so gradual that it is easy to miss if you aren't paying strict attention. The hours pass as you work, and the sun sits low in the horizon. Judging from their rate of growth, the saplings should reach an excellent height and use up the magic of the crystals by morning. Excellent. I am eager to see how the village makes use of these trees. Now they can redouble efforts on building a proper town. How lovely it will be to have another village on the island. Right, right, I got that. But we have a message to read from Salt Wish. No more dawdling. Of course. Let us retire to our lodgings right away to see what news we have received. The party returns to their lodgings after the day of hard work. Inside, Poe is curled up on Merrick's bed, his head tucked under a wing. As the party enters, he awakens and hops up and down, drawing attention to the pouch tied to his leg. Inside of the pouch are three more pouches, each with a member of the party's name written on a tag. I'll take those and hand them out. As you each look at the pouches, you note that the tags have more written on the opposite side of your name. They each state, for your eyes and ears only. Uh, okay then. I guess I'll ask Argothrax if he can step out for a moment. Certainly, that would be no trouble. Do these notes mean that the messages inside should be only for us individually or us as a group? Oh, you mean like, uh, there are individual messages for each of us that should not be shared to anyone. That's a little strange. What do you guys want to do? Anything for my eyes and ears can be shared with you two. I trust you. I am not breaking any more of Ben's stupid rules in this game. If these messages are meant to be private, then I'll keep it that way. Fair enough. He does like to punish Donna, it seems. Very well. We'll split up to see the messages if that's what you all want to do. All right. Then we're going to do something a little different in the campaign. I'll be playing with each of you individually, with the other two muted and deafened. We'll go in the usual presidential order, so that means Merrick is first. All right. Mind if you two give me the room? Sure, whatever. See you later, buddy. Donna and Benjen exit your lodgings, leaving you alone with Poe and the message. The small pouch addressed to you, Merrick, contains a tiny blue stone glowing with magic. You recognize it to be a type of sending stone that records messages. It cannot send anything back. Got it. Let's hear what it has to say. You turn the stone in your hand, and Mayor Rain's voice echoes in your head, clear as day. Good day, Merrick. Thank you for your message. As for your inquiry, I do not know the status of Mavana. I lost contact with her travelling party many years ago. When I got your message, I hoped that you might have some news of her yourself. It is unfortunate that we cannot alleviate the worries of the other. On a happier note, fret not about the two other messages to the party. I believe Humphrey, our town blacksmith, had an inquiry to make of Donna about commissioning some jewellery and needs details about specifics on the pieces. He might also possibly be inviting her to apprentice with him. I tried not to pry too much. As for the other, with Benjen, we had an adventurer come into town with questions about his goddess, so I gave him a recording stone to send a message back. As you can see, things have been very busy in Saltwish. I hope you and the party are doing well in your travels. At the end of the message, the stone dissolves with a pop. Huh. A lot to unpack. But the mayor doesn't know anything about Mavana. That's unfortunate. Is that all? Yes, that's everything that was in the pouch. All right, in that case, I'll just do some work in my spell book until the others return. Sounds perfect. With that, we'll move to Donna. Donna, you exit your lodgings with Benjen. Argothrax is further in the outpost, chatting with several Arakokra about the newly growing saplings. What do you want to do? I'll just go off and find a quiet spot to listen to the message, somewhere a little way off from the town. Sounds good. You find a spot away from the town and open the pouch addressed to you. Inside, you find a tiny blue stone. That's it? The stone does appear to be glowing with some kind of magic, but you aren't sure what it is. As you turn it in your hand, the voice of Mayor Rain echoes in your head. 
Good day, Lady Donna. I have a message for you from Humphrey the blacksmith. He says that the message is for your ears only, so please drop the stone in the pouch and find some privacy to hear his message. There is a pause. God, not this weird guy again from Salt Wish. I came all the way out here for his message. Oh, fine. Let me hear what he has to say. After several more moments, you hear the voice of Mayor Rain once again. I apologize. I needed an excuse to separate you from Marek. Benjen will be getting a similar message. It is of utmost importance that the two of you listen well. I received your inquiry about Mavana. I assume it was penned by all three of you at once. Again, please listen well. On her way back from the final temple in the mountains to the one in the rainforest, Mavana and her party were attacked by none other than your wizard, Marek. He had disguised himself as a goblin guide and ambushed her party in the rainforest. The guard I sent with Mavana brought me this information as fast as he could, running despite grievous injuries that nearly killed him. The wizard may be your friend, but do not give him all of your trust. I mourn the loss of Mavana, but it would be even worse if you and others fall to the same fate. I do not know what the wizard's goals are, but be vigilant. I did not tell him this in his recording stone, but I am coming to the Arakokra outpost. You must do what you can to keep him there while waiting for my arrival. I will question him about the fate of Mavana and get to the bottom of things. In another moment, the stone dissolves in a pop. Whoa, what? If you want, I will allow you and Benjen to talk things over without the knowledge of Merrick. Yeah, that would be good, but um, Ben, you wouldn't really let one of us play an evil character, right? Nothing is off the table. What the hell kind of answer is that? I Shit, I don't know what to think. I'm so confused. Merrick is our friend. He's a good dude. You wouldn't do that, would you, Ben? I don't think I can answer that. Already, I shouldn't be talking so much. Oh, um, I gotta think about this more. I don't think Merrick is evil, but like, uh, you've thrown plenty of shit at us thus far. Could be another case of shit thrown. While you worry over this new information, a wave of exhaustion hits you. You slide to the ground, and a new voice echoes in your head. A stranger's voice. Trust your instincts. Protect those close to you. You must be strong. What, what who is that? What is happening? Listen to me. Trust yourself. Be strong. You are a protector, an avenger. Listen to your instincts. But I don't know who to trust. You do. You know. You're saying I, I should listen to myself, but am I right to question Merrick or should I trust him? Listen to yourself. Be a protector. The voice fades away and your head clears. You find yourself sitting on the ground, not having moved. No one pays any mind to you. It appears they did not hear the voice. Only you. Huh, is this like I am some sort of chosen? It could be, but let's check in with Benjen. Right, and after you finish, I want to go over and talk with him before we go back to Merrick. Got it. All right. We are now turning to Benjen. Benjen, you find a quiet spot in the village to settle down and take a look at the pouch with your name on it. Inside of the pouch, you find a small blue stone that glows with magic. As you turn it in your hand, the voice of Mayor Rain echoes in your mind. Hello, adventurer Benjen. I have a message for you from a fellow adventurer traveling through Melodia. He has some inquiries for you about your goddess and says they are for your ears only, so please drop the stone in the pouch and find some privacy to hear his message. After a moment of silence, you hear his voice once again. I apologize. I needed an excuse to separate you from Marek. Donna will be getting a similar message. It is of utmost importance that the two of you listen well. I received your inquiry about Mavana. I assume it was penned by all three of you at once. Again, please listen well. On her way back from the final temple in the mountains to the one in the rainforest, Mavana and her party were attacked by none other than your wizard, Marak. He had disguised himself as a goblin guide and ambushed her party in the rainforest. The guard I sent with Mavana brought me this information as fast as he could, running despite grievous injuries that nearly killed him. The wizard may be your friend, but do not give him all of your trust. I mourn the loss of Mavana, but it would be even worse if you and others fall to the same fate. I do not know what the wizard's goals are, 
but be vigilant. I did not tell him this in his recording stone, but I am coming to the Arakokra outpost. You must do what you can to keep him there while waiting for my arrival. I will question him about the fate of Mavana and get to the bottom of things. Whoa. Huh. I'm so confused. So, Merrick attacked Mavana and her traveling party? How could that be so? He, he is our friend. He has been with us all this time, huh? It doesn't make sense. As you mull over the mayor's words, Donna comes up to you. All right, you both can talk now. Benjamin, you heard what the mayor said, right, about Merrick? I heard it, but I don't know. It's so confusing. I could make a joke about your dementia, but now is not the time. What did you think about it all? I'm not sure. Merrick is our friend. He has been helping us. I don't think he would attack Mavana suddenly. But is it totally out of the realm of possibility? I mean, he's a wizard. He can do some pretty powerful magic already. Who's to say that he can't do more that we don't know about? But it's like I said, he's been with us all this time. I don't know. I don't think it was him. Then who was it? I don't know that either, but like I said, he's been traveling with us all this time. Don't forget the, the, the weird time jump we went through in that, that pocket of Feywild. Merrick put it together fairly quickly that there had been a time skip in the story. Maybe he already knew. Maybe this was all part of his plan. I don't know, Donna. It seems a little far-fetched. I'm just saying that it isn't, isn't out of the realm of possibility. If it was him, then we are in danger. He took on Mavana and the mayor's guards. We should play this safe. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'll protect you, Benjen. We've got to stick together. But Merrick is our friend, and we played out his backstory and everything. To be fair, what you played out was simply Merrick's retelling of a story. So you're saying all of it could be a lie, damn it, Ben, damn it. Oh, oh, my head hurts. Now look, you've sent Joe into a spiral. Look at what you've done. He'll be all right, won't you, Joe? Oh, oh, no. Uh... While he's doing that, Donald, you can choose whether or not to share with Benjen the vision you had. So that's what, that's what the voice was? A vision? Hmm, I gotta think it over more. I think Benjen is too stupid to lie to me or hide things, so I trust him, which is a sentence I never thought I'd string together. But I also think he is too stupid to hide things from Merrick. If Merrick is indeed evil, I don't wanna show too many of my cards. I thought of something. Wait, remember in the first episode, Donna blurted out all about the prophetic dream and such, and Merrick pointed out that it wasn't a good idea because one of us could be evil or something. Well, Benjen, that is a Biden brain blast if I've ever seen one. I don't know, though. I'm still... Benjen, I know you think Merrick is your friend, but consider the alternative. We must keep one another safe. You must finish the temple pilgrimage, and I will help you. I will protect you. No matter what Merrick might do, we've got to be a team. Right, our laughing crit combo, we are unstoppable. That's the spirit. Now, we can go back to talk to Merrick, but we can't let him know what we know. Can you be deceptive, Benjen? Can you keep a secret? I'll try. I'll try, if only because I need to know that we're a trio of friends. I am destined to keep us together. Right, and I think this is a good stopping place for the episode. No, it is not. I see you guys didn't get good news either. And I am sick of Ben cutting things off when it gets good. Damn it, Ben. Sorry. We'll pick right back up with things next episode. Something to look forward to. Lots to think about in the meantime. For now, we'll close things off. To the viewers, thank you so much for watching. Leave a comment with your top 10 anime betrayals so that we know you're a real one. Why is that your ending question? Just the first thing that popped in my head. Like the video and subscribe if you haven't. We'll see you all again very soon. Hello, viewers, and welcome back to Kokomimi's AI presidential D&D &D campaign. Let's jump right to the recap. It's Joe's turn. I thought of my comment question before anything else. Drop a comment with your favorite hair scents. Mine is citrus, which is how Coco's hair smells when I sniff from under her... Stop. That's not the comment question. Think of a different one. I thought it was a good one. Okay, uh, how about everyone's favorite ice cream flavor? Mine is... We all know what yours is, Joe. Now go to the recap. You guys are no fun and not very nice, but I'll go to the recap if that's what you want. Uh, so, in the last episode, we fought some crystal skeletons, like Indiana Jones. We fertilized some saplings in the Arakakra outpost, so they'd grow gigantic like Jack and the Beanstalk. And we got messages from magic stones like, hmm, I can't think of a pop culture reference. That's a pretty good episode summary, Joe. Nicely done. Thank you very much, Ben. Now that we're all here back at the table, you guys have been acting really weird this week. Is something going on? 
No, uh, nothing's going on. No, right, Joe? I can't remember. For the love of, you know what? Never mind. It's probably for the best that you give into your dementia, Joe. Everything's fine, Barack, other than me having to deal with demented Joe over here. I suppose things are just heating up now that you've gotten a judgment in your... God, Barrett, can we not talk about that here? This is where I relax with my friends. Of course, of course. Sorry, Ben, let's jump into the episode before this devolves further. We are picking back up right where we left off in the last episode. You all listened to the messages sent by the mayor of Saltwish and have reconvened back in your lodgings. Perhaps it would be best if we took a long rest. That's the best idea I've ever heard. I, uh, yeah, thanks, Benjamin. You're welcome, Donna. Something is going on. I've never seen you two be this amiable. Can you please verbally abuse one another or something? I don't think I like this. Shut up, Merrick. You think I can't be nice? I am the nicest. I am the most nice, the most kind, the most beautiful warrior woman. Donna? All right, all right. I see that nothing's really changed. Good to see you're back to normal. But, uh, yeah, I don't have any objections to taking a long rest. We can see how the saplings have grown come morning. After that, I'm not sure. What were you guys thinking we should do? Move on to the next stop? Benjamin's got the next piece of the ritual song to play in the Rainforest Temple. I tell you, I think we should stay a few more days. Let's see if there is a blacksmith in town and have them look at the damaged weapons I found. We should also stock up on things like rations and get some more traveling and camping supplies while we're here. You're being curiously cautious. Are you sure everything's all right? Yes, Merrick, stop worrying. I just want to be sure that we're outfitted and kitted out for whatever hellscape Ben has planned next. Fair enough. We're coming close to the end of our journey in Melodia. I can only assume we're going to Harmonia next. We've uncovered some secrets in this campaign, but I still feel like we don't know what's going wrong in this land. No doubt that my ritual songs are helping things, though. Perhaps the goddess needs my prayers and the ritual music to accumulate more power so that she can fix all the problems in Melodia. I don't know, though. Ben, is Argothrax still with us? He was outside speaking with Arakokra in the outpost, but I'll say that once the party reconvened, he came back to your makeshift dwelling with the others. Perfect. I'd like to ask him how we get to Harmonia. Ah, yes. We'll need to make a trek through the rainforest and then into the earth through a hollow mountain. Is Harmonia underground like the Underdark or the depths in Legend of Zelda? Legend of Zelda? I do not know this legend you speak of. Curious. I would like you to share it with me. As a bard, you must know so many stories of distant lands. Oh, it's a classic tale of the hero's journey. A young man fights to save the princess from an evil and rescue the kingdoms. Fascinating. Go on. Ben, stop encouraging him. Perhaps the two of you can talk all about that when we go to take a long rest. That's perfect. Brilliant, Merrick. Push Benjamin's weird tangents off screen and out of the role play. But don't let Argothrax dodge my question. How do we get to Harmonia once we go through the mountain? There will be a portal that can take you there. From that point on, it will be up to you. I've never been to Harmonia myself. However, I have the utmost trust in your capabilities that you will be able to handle the challenge ahead. So we go to the Rainforest Temple, reveal the location of the Central Temple, then to Harmonia. Don't forget making stops in Melodia City and to visit the Goblin Village. If that is your plan for the foreseeable future, then I would suggest we travel straight to Melodia City once our business here is concluded. I'm sure Qual and his soldiers would be willing to help fly us there rather than taking the long route through the rainforest. From there, you know how to make your way to the rainforest temple and the goblin village easy enough. In addition to that, there are more shops and resources in Melodia City. We can stock up even more. With that logic, then we should leave the outpost in the morning and go straight to Melodia City. There's not much here for us to do. No, we should not. Weren't you complaining a few sessions ago about taking things easy? Seriously, what's gotten into you? I want to stay and see more of the Arakokra turn into waifus. Yeah, me too. It's worth it to slow down if we get more babes. You two are unbelievable. This kingdom is supposedly in crisis, you know. Don't fight the waifus, Merrick. You know you like them. Fine. We can stay a little longer to get things settled. Just another day or so, and then we need to get on the road again. I do want to ask Argothrax more about this portal he mentioned, but I can do that after we take the long rest and get general matters settled with the blacksmith and such. Fine, good enough for me. Now we should take a long rest. All right. 
Then the party can take a long rest. Benjen spends part of the evening retelling Argothrax the stories of Link and Zelda, somehow knowing these stories in our fantasy world. The night passes uneventfully and the party rests and refreshes. Morning dawns on the outpost and you are awoken by the sound of saws, nails, stones, scraping, and the telltale sounds of construction. Outside of your dwelling, you find men and women carrying carpentry materials into the outpost. Others are hard at work, building permanent structures into the trees, which incidentally have grown to unbelievable heights. Although the central tree of the outpost is the tallest of all, towering over the settlement, the saplings the party fertilized have now grown so large that it would take more than four men to wrap their arms around the trunks. They can now support the weight of homes built into their branches. Rope bridges connect the trees. At the base of the center evergreen, several people are hard at work constructing an elevator system that will lift visitors from the bottom of the tree up to the town center. It's better than I ever could have imagined. Just like a real life four-tree city. I love it, Ben. It really is something. As the party exits their dwelling, there is a flap of wings from above. Before you all lands the figure of a well-built man. He flexes slightly, displaying rippling muscles that now stand out against his pristine soldier's attire. Good morning, adventurers. I have been eagerly awaiting your rising, especially Lady Donna's. Uh... He stares at Donna eagerly, flexing again. I think he's waiting for you to compliment him, Donna. This is Qual, right? He has the same voice. Yes, that's him. Now, I, what, why does the complimenting have to be from me? Um, you're looking uh, nice, Quell. How's that? Is that all you can say? He obviously wants you to fawn over him. Come on, Donna. Imagine how you'd like to be complimented. What do you want people to say? That I'm the smartest, strongest, and sexiest woman in all of the land. Donna, the warrior woman. But that's not just a compliment. It's the truth. Hmm... Should I take that to mean that I am the smartest, strongest, and sexiest man in all the land? I see. Thank you for the compliments. Uh, sure. If you feel so strongly about me, perhaps you would be open to my next invitation. I'd like very much if you stayed here with me to help me build the outpost. Uh... With you by my side, our outpost will become the greatest village in Melodia. Well, first of all, you should give this place a proper name. The greatest village in Melodia can't be called the Arakoka Outpost forever. Tun, you have a point. I am open to suggestions. How about Donneville or Trump City? Both such perfect, wonderful names. I don't know. And what about something like, you know, Feather Paradise? It works because most of the villagers are Arakoka and now they all look like sexy babes. You both have no taste. We should pick something normal. Nothing to do with your names or waifus or anything of the like. The village has a maple syrup farm nearby, right? Maybe something to do with that. That's a great idea, Benjen. What does Qual think? He listens to the party's suggestions and nods, his eyes closed. I also have little experience or flair for naming things, so I think I'll leave it up to you three. In that case, something with maple. It should blend in with Melodia City and Saltwish, too. Yeah, good point. If, if it's going to do business with those two villages, then the town should have a name that fits in with them. Maple Edge? No, that's too similar to my own hometown. Maple View? Nah. We could take inspiration from the mountain landscape. What about Maple Peak? Maple Peak. What a glorious suggestion. It rolls right off the tongue. It shall take hold immediately. From henceforth, we will call this outpost... Maple Peak! I love it. It pays homage to the maple syrup farms that will boost our industry. Yes, it is perfect. Thank you so very much, adventurers. And especially you, Lady Donna. I shall not forget that it was you who suggested this name. I once again extend an invitation for you to stay here. You would be the first lady of the village. It would be a great honor. Listen, I'm flattered, Qual, but I've got to travel with these two. We have plenty to do in Melodia. Then why not come back here once you're finished? I've got to go back home to the Gold Coast tribe and kick Bam's ass. I don't know this Bam, but I would be happy to lend my aid. Then we can come back here and marry. I... Ben, I told you that I'm not gay. I do not want to be flirted with by men. I'm only interested in women. Uh... Whoa! You two stop it and back me up. 
Quao brushes off Donna's rejection, taking a moment to recompose himself. Very well. Oh, you are not interested in that sort of relationship, so I understand. Donna, take some notes on what he just said. You could emulate him. What is that supposed to mean? How to handle rejection. I can handle it just fine. You're the one who should get used to it. I'm coming for you in November. Right. Let's not go down that rabbit hole right now. I was sincerely hoping that you would change your mind with this new appearance, Lady Donna, but... Very well. I understand. It was worth a shot. Don't tell me he went off to evolve just because Donna rejected him before. To be fair, she said some pretty harsh things about being disgusted and not wanting to be a furry. Or feathery. Right. See, Donna, you should be careful about what you say to people. Words can hurt. Yeah, Donna, don't you think my feelings are hurt when you make dementia jokes? But I make the dementia jokes because you won't remember them, Joe. No, won't remember what? The jokes write themselves. No, that's Coco Mimi's job. We can't take her job or we'll get canceled on Twitter. It's too late to worry about that, Joe. Anyway, let's get back to the story, shall we? Then excellent idea. So, Qual, we all were thinking that we would take care of some affairs here and then move on to Melodia City. Don't want to overstay our welcome. We have much to do still on our journey. I understand. The life of an adventurer is difficult, but can net many rewards. I am grateful simply to have met your party and had your help in establishing this village. Speaking of, is there a blacksmith or weaponsmith in town who could take a look at some old damaged weapons? We do have such a person in town, but they do not have a proper forge set up. It is one of the few structures that cannot be built up in the trees, and so he was waiting for us to get properly settled before constructing a workstation. That said, he should be able to look over your weapons if that's all you need. He will not be able to repair them. Uh, I guess I, I guess I can talk with them. Maybe they'll point me to the person who can repair these. Excellent. If you walk through our new grove, you should find him hard at work laying the foundation for his store. Ask for Urid. All right, will do. And uh, if any of you have need of anything else, simply alert a guard and they will report to me. I am here to help. Oh, before he goes, I think we should give him a couple of the crystals that we harvested from the cave. Ben, how many did we just fertilizing the trees? Right. Donna harvested 15 of the clusters and gave one to the Myconid in the cave. Then, we'll say you each grinded up two of the clusters to make the lustrous magical fertilizer. That leaves eight of the clusters behind. Argothrax wouldn't be interested in having one of the clusters, would he? I appreciate the offer, but I have no need of these crystals, at least for now. I know where to find them quickly if that changes. All right. In that case, I think we should each take two of the crystal clusters and give the remaining two to Quail. Don't forget that we have to tell them about Jub Jub the second. They'll be great friends. Since we all gathered these crystals together, I can accept that we should split them up. However, I would like Quail to offer us some payment in exchange for the crystals. Jesus, Donna. Nothing in life comes for free, Merrick. Fine, we can ask him. Well, there is one more thing. We harvested some extra crystals from the cave and, uh... We would be willing to part with some in exchange for goods or services if you have no gold. Um, I see. How about this? We can offer you passage to Melodia City. Passage? We will fly you all there when you are ready to go. That is much faster than walking through the mountains and rainforest. That would be a huge help and save a lot of time. I think it's a fair deal. Done. I will give you two of these crystal clusters in exchange for you and your men, helping us back to Melodia City. Now that's how you make a deal. Now I will look at Merrick and Benjen and clear my throat. I will accept your apologies now. Apologies for what? I zoned out there. I will admit that you did good, Donna. You secured us some fast transportation back to Melodia City. Nicely done. Hey, yes, I am pretty great. When you are all ready to leave, send word through one of my men, and we will take flight immediately. With the powerful wings of me and my men, we should be able to reach Melodia City in a single day. Wow. Much faster than our journey up here, even if we were coming from Saltwish. I suppose traveling by foot through mountainous terrain doesn't make things quick or easy. Ben, 
Will Argothrax be needing transportation? I mean, I know he's a dragon, but wouldn't it freak out the townspeople in Melodia City to see a giant dragon descending on the town when we land? Oh, yeah. Even though he's a nice dragon, I don't think they'd know that. That is a good point. In that case, I will follow behind and land deeper in the rainforest before meeting up with the party. The cover of the trees will allow me to land and transform back into this humanoid shape without drawing too much attention. Sounds like a plan. Let's go with that. One last thing, Quail. Yes? It's inside of the cave where we found the crystals. We met a Myconade who is living alone. His name is Jub Jub II. He's very nice. I hope the outpost will reach out to him and be friends. A Myconade, was it? I can't imagine that he'll want to live in Maple Peak with the rest of us. But it would certainly be beneficial if we cooperated to harvest more of the crystals for further future growth. I shall inform some of my men about this and send them out for a meeting very soon. I oh, thank you for passing this information along. Sorry if this is a stupid question, but why wouldn't he want to live in the town? My canids live in caves. Fungus likes cool, damp places to grow in the dark. How do you know that? My son taught me all about it. Benjamin doesn't have a son. Joe, try to keep your in-game dialogue separate from the roleplay. Right, got it. I won't tease him then, I, though I really, really want to. Um, so you're, shall we all get on with finding him? Of course. I shall leave you all to finish your affairs in Maple Peak. Lady Donna, my invitation stands. He finally flies off, back to the top of the main tree. Hmm. Well, look at that. Donna's gotten a marriage proposal. She ought to think about it. Personally, I think the Gold Coast tribe will do well enough with Bam in charge. He killed my father, Merrick. How dare you say that? It's just jokes. You shouldn't joke about things like that. A father's love is eternal, Merrick. I'm just speaking my mind. No need to get nasty. I'm going to go off and find Yurid while Donna fusses about the pass. Excuse me, but this is serious. Yeah, but you can't take a joke. Anyway, let's find the smith and see what can be done about these old weapons. Under the foliage of the Great Tree, you see a cream-feathered former traditional Arakakra moving stones to form the outline of a forge. He now moves in a more humanoid shape. You can see that he is setting up the foundation of a blacksmith shop and workspace under the trees, but well enough away from branches that there would not be any accidental fires. After all, such a thing could be disastrous to Maple Peak. Still, the town needs a smith to produce and repair metal tools. A village would be lost without this essential role. I'll go over to greet him. Hello! You must be Yurid, the town blacksmith. The man stops his work and looks at you, blinking for a moment. Aye, that's me. You're the adventurers who helped us with the harpies and got the trees all grown up. Thanks very much for the help. Our pleasure. It's the least we can do for you, all giving us a place to stay. Hey, can I talk to Ben for a second? Sure. Eyes something up? Why is Merrick being so nice? He's evil, isn't he? I can't tell you that, Donald. You have to make your own judgment. Oh, uh, you're no help. What are you two muttering about? Nothing. We're talking about nothing. That is objectively false, but whatever. Donna, didn't you have something to show him? Yes, of course. You're in, in, in our adventures, I came across some old weapons and would like to, to repair them if possible. One is a great sword and the other is a dagger. I'll pull out both of the weapons to show him. Yurid looks over both of the items with keen interest. Even with the wear and tear, I see these weapons were crafted with great skill. Is the smithing method familiar to you? No. Doesn't look familiar. And the smith's mark isn't one I recognize. Not surprising given how old these are. Donna found the sword buried in some ruins. I see. No. I don't know about the techniques used for these weapons or anything about the smith from this mark. But could you repair them? Hmm. I could give it a try if I had my forge fully set up, but no promises. With this kind of work, you'd want to know the exact method used when crafting the weapon. I'd be just as likely to render the steel useless if I'm not careful. Ah, uh, that would not be ideal. There is a smith in Melodia City and another in Saltwish, I've heard. You could try those two. Again, if I had my forge set up, I might be able to do more. Unfortunately, we're on a bit of a schedule and can't make it to Salt Wish. 
but we'll be going to Melodia City soon. We can try the smith there. Best of luck to you. Hopefully you find someone who can help you. Yeah, thanks for the help, regardless. If you all are headed to Melodia City soon, would you mind doing a favor for me? Depends if there will be coin attached to this task. Donna, can't you rein in your greed for one minute? What? If we're doing a request or something for someone, then it stands to reason that there ought to be something in it for us. We can't just volunteer our services anytime you please. It costs money to pay for lodgings and food and the like. No, the lady has a point. Hmm. I was going to ask you to deliver an order to the Guildmaster, but he's already paid in advance. Wouldn't make sense to ask him to pay for the delivery too. Hmm. Perhaps we could make a trade or something. You don't have your forge up, but is there anything you could give as payment for making the delivery? Hmm. I think that might work. He flaps up to Mapleview's main building atop the tallest tree, and after a few minutes, returned down to the party holding an ornate bow and a bag slung over his shoulder. The wood of the bow is carved with the magical runes, and etched into the wood are symbols that you, Marak, recognize as aiding the wielder to notch and loose arrows faster than an ordinary bow. The magic in the wood must do something to enhance the dexterity of the wielder. It is some very fine work, and the bow is finished with colored feathers and decorative beads. What beautiful work. The guildmaster will surely be pleased. Thank you much for the compliments. The bow is apparently a gift for his son, who is coming of age soon. I seem to remember something. Um, what was the name of the guildmaster in Melodia City? It's Locke, a fine man who has organized many an adventuring party through Melodia's rainforest. Hey, isn't that... We know Locke. We met him a while back. By now it would be years ago. Right. Point is, we know Locke. Good to know he's still kicking around. Then his son must be Grassum, don't you think? That name sounds familiar. According to the Guildmaster, his son is a talented ranger and forest guide for all new adventurers and visitors to Melodia. We will definitely deliver this bow to them. Can't wait to see them again. Grassum was the strongest in his village. I can't wait to see how much stronger he is now. I wonder how he'd feel, knowing that Donna tried to end his dad. I only did that to get information, Benjen. I know, I know. Your flirt attack was not very effective. Maybe one day, Donna, I believe in you. I believe in the power of your flirt attack. One day it's gonna work. We just gotta believe. That's the spirit. Uh, anyway, I think Yurid came down with a bag as well. What's that about? Yes, I'll move to that. Once Yurid hands over the bow, he reaches into the bag that he also brought down and produces a handful of intricately carved arrows. I was thinking of giving you all five or six of these arrows. They contain an enchantment that will set fire to objects shot with the arrow. Super useful. Benjen could make use of those best, I think. Donna, you don't often use your crossbow anyway. Sure, that's fine, as long as we're getting something in return for our effort. In that case, I will gift six of these arrows to you, Benjen, as well as the bow. I entrust you to deliver the bow to the Guildmaster in Melodia City. It will be done. Benjen. The fire arrows that you are given have the following effect. In addition to catching objects on fire when shot during combat, the arrows will add 1d8 of fire damage to your shot. Nice. Thank you very much. Of course. Use those arrows well and think of me when you need to restock on arrows. We can't exactly travel here easily, though. Very true. Once I get my shop up and running, I'm hoping to hire some apprentices to run deliveries for me. Blacksmith delivery. Convenient. The ability to fly really assists this village, but I see you have even better ideas to make use of that ability. I think with time, Maple Peak could become even more prosperous than Saltwish, or even Melodia City. We are all hoping the same. Send my compliments and congratulations to the Guildmaster, who was the one who first connected the Druid Mavana with our leader, Qual. Of course, we'll do that. Not a game moment, but shouldn't we tell Maple Peak what happened to Mavana? Or... Rather, what might have happened to Mavana? I don't know if that's a good idea. What? Nothing. I'm just thinking that, because there's nothing they can do anyway. Why should we make everyone of Maple Peak worry when they can't do anything to help? Hmm, I guess. What do you think about that, Joe? I don't know. On the one hand, they might have more information about Mavana, but on the other, they can't do much. 
Not any more than us anyway. Uh, you okay there, Donald? I'm fine. I'm frustrated and confused. Want to talk about it? I don't think I can. I haven't worked through it all yet in my head. I understand. Joe and I are here for you, and so are Benjamin and Merrick. Anyway, back to the story. Anything else we should take care of in the town? Uh, I can't think of much else. I'd like to see if there is someone selling potions. We used a lot of healing potions in our fight with Mem, and I still need to replenish my supplies. Can I ask Yurid if they have an apothecary or anything like that being built? I'm sure they have healing potions and supplies. In response to your question, Yurid shakes his head. We don't have a potion shop in town yet, though I'm sure Quell will set to work setting up something soon. At the moment, we are getting our supplies from Melodia City and delivering them to the outpost. Or rather, Maple Peak, through couriers. I see. Well, if we're going right to Melodia City, then we should be fine for now. We can do some shopping once we arrive. Yeah, sounds fine to me. So are we leaving now? Everything all finished in town? I can't think of anything else. Better move on. Really, we're moving on just like that. Uh, what about the... Let me look through my inventory for a second. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Is Benjamin rubbing off on you? Shut up, Merrick. Oh, I have some items that I can sell. The, uh, the amulet and ring that we got from the, from the Cliffside Temple. I forgot about those. Sure, might be good to clean out your inventory and unload extra goods where we can. I'll offer them to you. Excuse me, I also have this gold amulet and a sapphire ring that I would like to sell, as well as a pearl from a giant clam. Do you have any interest in purchasing these fine items? Yurid brushes off his feathers after piling more stones in the area and then looks over Donna's items. I don't have the gold on me to buy these outright, but I could make another trade with you. I have more arrows like those I gave to your friend, some that can do ice or lightning damage. Interested? Perhaps how many of these arrows would you trade for the amulet and ring? Hmm, how about 25 arrows of your choice? Can I roll to see if that is a good price? Sure, roll investigation. I got a 16. The offer is low for both items of jewelry, but if you traded only the amulet, then 20 arrows would likely be a fair offer. Okay, I'll say that to Yurid to counter the offer. Roll persuasion, Donna. You can roll with advantage since you rolled well before. 21. Ha! Yurid mulls over your offer and then nods. That sounds fair. You've got a deal. Then I'll request 10 fire arrows and 10 ice arrows. Very good. Give me a moment to fetch them. He flies back above to fetch the arrows and returns a few minutes later with the bunches. Here you are. Good doing business with you. Hopefully, when things are finished being built, we'll have more money flowing through the town. Donna, the fire arrows are the same variety given to Benjen, but the ice arrows will do 1d8 of ice damage and can freeze objects if they are already wet when hit with the magical arrow. Sweet, I can't do elemental magic, but now I'll have a leg up on Merrick. I can do elemental damage just like him. Hey. Now is that everything? We should tell Quail that we're ready to go. Wait! Okay, what is it? Uh, I'm sure there's something else we need to do. Why are you stalling from letting us leave? Don't you want the story to continue? Yeah, but, uh... Oh, I know. You want to see more Wifus. We haven't gotten any this episode. Yeah, exactly. Where are the formerly feathered babes for us to chat up? Don't be stupid, Donna. There's no time for that. In any case, you can see waifus or babes or whatever once we get to Melodia City. I bet if we set off soon, Ben will let us arrive quickly and be able to chat up people in Desdemona's Inn. And I'll get to see my old buddy, Mills. We can chat about fishing and such. Uh, I'm so excited. We should leave soon. Wait. What now? There is one more thing I want to do before we go. I have that lower elemental jar to open. Oh, a real concern this time. Yeah, all right. I forgot about that thing. Go ahead and open it. Since we're mostly traveling this episode and not going into a dungeon, even if you get a bad effect from the elemental, it shouldn't impact our party much. Hmm, uh, actually I changed my mind. I think I should wait. 
Why? Are you expecting us to get into a fight? Plan on pissing off Quail or one of the others? No, I would never. Then what's the problem? Nothing, never mind. I'll take out the jar. Donna, you retrieve the lower elemental jar from your bag. Instead of the fairy that was inside Benjen and Merrick's jar, your jar contains a small elemental spirit in the form of a featureless ball of morphing blue light. It does not speak or understand any type of language and only bounces around the jar as you take out the container. I'll go ahead and open it. The jar is bound with the same magic cord as the fairy jar, so you have to upwrap the cord in order to open it. Once that is complete, the ball of light floats up above you, sprinkling down sparse, twinkling glitter. Donna, you feel your limbs growing stronger and more limber. You are now affected by the swiftness charm. Until your next long rest, your movement speed will be doubled. Huh, not bad. So it's a temporary blessing? Yes. The jar was one of the cheaper prizes, if you remember. All right, fair enough, I guess. Now are we finished here? Or is there anything else you can think of, Donna? Good, then we should alert one of the guards to get quail, and then we'll set off for Melodia City. I wish we could have stayed to see the Maple Farms, or gotten them to invent ice cream. We could always stay a little longer if you want to see them, Benjen. No, we are moving this story along. What has gotten into you, Donna? Why do you want to stay here so bad? Why do you want to leave? To keep the story moving, we have temple rituals to finish. Oh, right, I forgot. There's no time to look at the maple syrup farm. That's really a shame. Tell you what, Benjen. When we finish this campaign, maybe we can make a round trip to all these towns and villages to say hello to our friends. Hmm, yeah, that's a good idea. Why are you staring at me like that? Just thinking. Well, I don't like it. Can you go back to regular Donna? Always throwing insults at us and rearing to charge forward? Hmm, I guess, yeah. Is that everything? Are you all finally ready to move on? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Let's go. Shut up, Benjen. What, what did I say? Your enthusiasm annoys me. Sorry. Don't apologize, Benjen. Donna's just being rude for no reason. Anyway, I'll go over to alert one of the guards that we're ready to go. Excellent. The guard nods and flaps up to the top of Maple Peak's center tree. In another few minutes, he flies back down with Quail and several other soldiers. You all are ready to leave. We can depart at once. Yes. Let's get going. Thank you all for hosting us so kindly. You've made this leg of the journey comfortable and much easier. Of course. You three did much to help us get off the ground, in more ways than one. Now let's be off. The party sets off, each paired with a flyer. The strength of the Aracocris's wings seems to have been amplified with their physical changes. You all soar over the mountainous landscape. The rocky peaks fly by as you glide through the air. With the wind all around you, you can hear nothing from the land below. The stinging air fills your ears with blustering noise. Soon, the mountain landscape gives way to rainforest, and the rocky terrain melts into lush foliage and treetops. Argathrax has flown ahead, taking on his dragon form that is more suited to flying. We're traveling awfully fast, aren't we? It took much longer for Poe to reach Salt Wish. The flying power of Quell and the others is incomparable to a small bird. It's like they've evolved into jet planes, you know. Incidentally, Benjen, as you fly through the air, tropical birds from the rainforest curiously join Quail and you hear their voices. My, what big wings you have. So beautifully groomed. I'm going to tell Quail what they said. What's that? My feathers? Ha <laughs> ha. Of course, I spend plenty of time grooming. Such is the life of any respectable Arakokra. You hear a sound from behind, the sound of more wings, but these aren't the flap of tiny birds. Instead, you hear the beating wings of more Arakokra. One flies up to Qual and the others, and you all see him make a flurry of gestures with his hands. Qual seems to comprehend something from the hand signs, and he slows considerably in the air. What's going on? Seems that there's someone to see all of you. I shall look for a spot to land. Below you is dense rainforest, but there is a river carving through the forest that peeks out from between the trees. Quail lowers the party near the riverbank, taking the opportunity to splash fresh water over his feathers. More Arakokra land near the party, carrying a familiar face. We finally caught up to you. It's good to see you, Mayor Rain. Did something happen? He looks over each member of the party with guarded eyes. He is accompanied by two guards from Saltwish, 
neither of whom you recognize. One is clad in armor, while the other wears loose robes befitting a wizard. They step away from the mayor, one training their eyes on each of you. I thought my message provided good enough instructions. His eyes flick from Merrick over to Donna as he speaks. Instructions? Donna, what is he talking about? Donna, say something! Oh, I think I'm starting to remember something. Oh, no. Mayor Rain, if you have a message or news for us, don't be shy. Let's hear it. His hand hovers over the blade sheathed at his side. It trembles, but then Rain seems to gather some resolve. Restrain the wizard so I might carry out justice. If the other two get in your way, use necessary force. At the sound of his voice, Qual and the other Arakakra flinch, and he draws his bow. Everyone calm down. What's going on? Mayor Rain draws his sword, leveling it at Mara. It is a long and curved blade of fine steel. You slayed Mavana, and now I will avenge her, wizard. If any of your friends get in my way, I will cut them down. Qual and the others look back at Mara, confused. The druid. Donna, did you know this was going to happen? Uh, well, I got a message from the mayor. Benjen did too. I believe that the two of them might help me. Surely the ones who freed our town from Cyrene's charm would stand against evil, even if it was one of their party members. Yep, it all came back to me now and I have a headache all over again. Hold on, Donna. Do you really think I did this? You could have. No, I could not. I have been with the party this entire time. Mayor Rain, when was Mavana killed? What happened? On her way to the Central Temple, Mavana and her group were ambushed by you. One of the guards I assigned to travel with her returned this information to me, carrying a grievous injury. And where is he now? He did not survive. That's convenient. How do I know that you or one of your men killed her and you're blaming it all on me? Or how do we know it wasn't Mem? Our group was attacked by Mem at Maple Peak, that is, the Arakakura outpost. Oh, my head hurts so much. I don't like this. I would never do anything to hurt Mavana. He did try to get her to marry him. When she, when she broke into his house to see town records, he put her in prison. And the group was ambushed alongside Mem, who valiantly fought to save everyone. Maybe she was just pretending. Pretending to save everyone by casting deadly magic at their foe? I doubt it. She held off you, wizard, from killing my guard as he raced back to Salt Wish. Here's an alternate look at the events. Mem orchestrated the party to be ambushed by someone disguised as me, had Mavana killed, and then tied up loose ends by killing the attacker, while your guard delivered the news, nice and wrapped up in a bow. Make a persuasion roll, Mara. I rolled an 11. Mayor Rain is unconvinced by your words. His eyes gleam with a fanaticism, an obsession in his goals. Had she wanted to kill Mavana, she could have done it at a number of moments in their journey. It was a waste of time for her to wait so long. Merrick has been traveling with us this whole time, though. He wouldn't be able to sneak away without our notice. Hmm. <clears throat> then I take that to mean you knew he snuck away to find Mavana, and you're now taking his side. I thought your party stood for good. We do stand for good. We didn't know anything about all of this. Then will you side with me? Restrain the wizard so that I might delve out justice. Qual and the other Arakakra are not sure how to respond. They listen to the words of all, trying to decipher whose side they might take. They could be persuaded to join you in the fight if it comes to that, or they might simply wait to see what happens. This isn't their fight. Uh, excuse me, but if Mayor Rain is planning on killing me, then I'd appreciate the backup. If he isn't going to listen to reason, then it's gonna be a fight. I've been thinking, you realize that there had been a time jump in the story awfully fast, Merrick. Right after we got out of Ma Mem's pocket dimension and made it to Maple Peak, you figured it out pretty quickly. Suspiciously quickly, if you ask me. Donna, don't start this. We are supposed to be a team. I'm trying to look out for the team. Maybe you weren't a part of it all along. Don't be stupid. I'm just saying, maybe you used those moments of teleporting out of the pocket of Feywild in order to do some time shenanigans, and Benjen and I wouldn't be any wiser. How exactly would I have done that? How should I know? You're the wizard. The argument is somewhat interrupted by the arrival of Argothrax, who noted that Quell and the other flyers had fallen behind. 
He descends from above, transforming into his humanoid form. What is going on? Has something happened? Mayor Rain quickly fills him in on why they are there, and Argothrax listens, pensive. Truthfully, I don't know members of the party very well. He looks over to Donna and Benjen. As they have known Marek the longest of anyone, he trusts their insight above all. How am I supposed to have messed with time, Donna? That's like a godly ability. I wouldn't be a level one wizard if I had such powers. Maybe you are concealing some of your power from us. This is so stupid. Can't you see that someone's just trying to sow discord between us? All I know is that you're, you're part wood elf. Elves can have lots of weird magic. Now you're resorting to racism. Fantastic. Mayor Rain is an elf too, you know. And I'm sure he has lots of weird magic. My point stands. I can see both sides. Both versions of events are possible. Your friend might indeed have used some unknown magic to give himself time to act without the party knowing. Or this might be an imposter who can disguise themselves in order to, like Marek said, sow discord. I defer to you and Benjen, who know Marek best out of all of us. Donna, in your mind, you hear the same voice that came from your dream. Trust yourself. Be a protector. Trust yourself. Ugh, I don't know what that means. Can't they give me another hint? Ben, I don't know why you have us deafened, but Donna can't seriously be thinking that I did this. This is just stupid. I uh, know. I don't know who we can trust, but we're supposed to be all friends, aren't we? We're a team. We can't let him hurt Marek. Benjamin, we've got to make a choice here. I don't want to hurt anyone. Oh, I'm so confused. I'm so upset, Ben. I don't like this game anymore. Ah, Benjamin curls up in a ball on the ground. It will be enough for all of you to step aside and let us do our work. Them stepping aside is the same thing as siding with the mayor to kill me. Guys! Benjamin and Donna, what are you going to do? I don't know, I don't know, no. I don't, I don't, uh... I don't know. All right, Benjamin has been reduced to tears on the ground. Donna, what about you? I, uh... Do you believe your friend to be guilty? I'm not sure... Should I take that to mean you have reasonable doubt? I, um, but I have to trust myself. I'll, I'll, I'll draw my trident and point it at... At... At Merrick? You idiot. Let's roll initiative then. Donna, you are a moron. I can't believe this. I am standing firm in my choice. I rolled a three. Holy shit. I rolled a 10, hell yes. Mayor Rain and his guards each rolled a 15, 14, and an 8. The combat order will go Rain, Armored Guard, Donna, Mage Guard, and then Mara. What is the point of this? I am going to be dead by the time it comes to my turn. Isn't Benjen going to join in? Uh, I think Benjen's stuck sobbing on the ground. First up is Rain. He's going to attack three times with his scimitar. And one swing hits, four slashing damage. Oh, that's it? In a blind rage, Rain rushes forward with his blade, slashing at Merrick with more anger than concentration. Perhaps it is because of that. He only manages to land one of the hits. He steps back after the attack, breathing steadily, willing himself to calm, though you can see fury burning in his eyes. If he steps back, can I make an opportunity attack? Sure. I think this is the first time we are using that in the campaign. I am scouring my character sheet to find anything that will save me. I'll use my quarterstaff for the opportunity attack. Does a 19 hit? Yes, though, Rain tries to parry your attack with his scimitar. Unfortunately, it isn't enough to stop the blow. That's one damage. Holy shit. You will pay for what you did. You will pay with your life. I didn't do anything. Still going on about that? Save your lies for the gods. Next up is the armored guard. He draws a trident from his back and lunges at Merrick. He wields the trident with two hands and attacks three times in a flurry of swipes, and two hit, dealing 19 piercing damage. He is silent, but attacks Merrick with the same vigor as Rain. Wait, we should talk about this. I have a truth potion in my inventory that I can take. It is a bit late for that. I see you are now desperately grasping at straws to preserve your own life. I didn't think Donna would actually side against me, I... Well, we have an opportunity to hear more about that since it's Donna's turn. Donna, what are you going to do? 
Merrick is at low health. A swing of your trident could finish him off. I want Merrick to drink that truth potion. Ah, uh, well, the thing is, we're now non-combat. An entire round takes six seconds, let alone a single turn. There's not enough time for Merrick to do that. He should have done it. I should have thought of it before the combat started. Damn it. It is still your turn, Donna. Merrick is extremely wounded. Aren't you going to attack? Um, well, I, I thought he'd be dead before we got to my turn. You coward. Still trying to get others to do your dirty work for you. Shut up. Those could be your last words. Are you going to attack or not, Donna? Donna, he's our friend. Don't do it, please. It seems Benjen has recovered from being curled up on the ground. Donna, if it has to be like this, then let him take care of it. Don't let it be one of us, no matter what happens. We are supposed to be a team. We are friends. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Donna, even if you back down, it is too late to dissuade Rain and the others from their attacks. His eyes burn with a fanatical justice, kindled by the loss of his love. I'm not going to attack, but I'm not going to stop them. I'll go stand next to Benjen. You absolute coward. I don't deserve this. Then it's the mage's turn. He casts Shatter. Merrick, you will need to make a constitution saving throw. What is even the point of this anymore? Fine, I rolled a nine. The spell is a success then. Rain and the armored guard must also make saving throws and the armored guard succeeds, but the mayor rolled a critical failure. Not like it matters. Even if they take damage, I'm gonna be dead. How much damage did it do? 17 thunder damage. I'm downed now. Unless someone goes over to save me, this is the end. Shouldn't we? If Benjen or Donna go over to help him, then Rain will interpret that to mean that they are now on Merrick's side and will attack again. Right, I, I, I don't know what I should do if they attack. Would Argathrax and Quall and the others help? Then it'd be a bloodbath either way. Argathrax would stomp everyone to bits. Then we'd be wanted for killing the mayor. But it's self-defense, isn't it? I don't think Salt Wish's justice system cares about that. They didn't when we fought Cyrene. Yeah, I guess you have a point. Uh... So the mayor won? Yes. Between the party and mayor, Rain lays the body of your fallen comrade. Finished then. It's done. Mavana, I have avenged you. Now you can finally rest. Benjen and Donna, I thank you for your cooperation. I wish you luck in your future endeavors. Uh, right, this is gonna sound insensitive, but can we take Merrick's supplies with us? Given his crimes, I would like to take his items and look them over in Saltwish. Ordinarily, I would allow you to have them, but with the circumstances. I get it, okay, um, so we just continue on just like that? This feels so bad, I don't like this, Donna. The team is broken. It's not broken, Benjen, we're still here. This feels so bad, doesn't it feel wrong to you? I don't really know how I feel. I feel like I've failed. I was, I was supposed to hold us together through all manner of challenges. I Seeing your stricken faces, Argothrax speaks up. You made a choice in the name of justice. You must stand by that choice now. No offense, but that doesn't really make me feel better. It was meant as counsel, not comfort. If you seek comfort, then I will repeat Donna's sentiments. You both still have one another. The story is not over. There are trials ahead. He's right, we've got work to do. I'll just feel so wrong, Donna. Speaking of, Barack is being awfully quiet. Well, his character is dead. He can do nothing now but sit back and watch. That's hella boring. And whose fault is it that I'm dead? Your own, I still didn't trust Merrick. This is stupid. I'm not having this conversation with you. Fear not. If your hearts are truly connected, perhaps you will all one day see Merrick again, and whatever sins he is guilty of, he might have learned from them. I can only hope. Murder is kind of a big sin to learn from. Yes, well, he is now in the hands of the gods. Go say a prayer for him, even if he was a bad guy, Donna. Uh, that doesn't mean he was a bad guy. Now you're purposefully talking nonsense. We should get moving and get back to Melodia City. There's work to be done. Yeah. Still, oh, can I take Paul with me? The Raven sits atop Merrick's body, unwilling to leave his master. I can speak with him, though. I, I'll tell him that Merrick isn't going to wake up the, 
He should come with us now. Poe looks down at the fallen Merrick, thinking. After a moment, he turns away and sits down, still unwilling to leave, and now unwilling to talk. No surprises there. It's an evil bird. Aren't you the one to pick out the bird for him? You, uh, you picked out an evil bird. No, I didn't. I picked a regular bird. Merrick just used wizardry to enchant the bird. Mm, I don't think that's how it works. Shut up, Benjamin. You're a bard, not a druid. Fair enough, I guess. Let's get out of here now, okay? We'll just keep moving. We can talk about things once we get to Melodia City. You'll get to, you'll get to see Mills again and talk about fishing. Doesn't that cheer you up? A bit, I suppose. Ben, we're going to be stuck here with Benjamin moping. Let's move along. All right. Qual and the other Arakokra take flight once again, and Argothrax joins them in the sky. The remainder of the flight to Melodia City is quiet. Qual, uncomfortable, remains silent. There isn't much to say to a party who has lost a member after discovering the treachery of that member. Argothrax lands first in the jungle, using the cover of trees to transform into his humanoid form without attracting too much attention. The Arakokra are able to land at the edge of the forest easily with Donna and Benjen. Thank you very much for assisting with the travel call. It was my pleasure. I am sorry about what happened. Me too. In times like this, I always struggle with what to say. Even more so since you discovered some uh, unpleasant things about your companion. But uh, as I tell to all of my men, Sometimes there is nothing you can do but move forward. That is true. Thank you for the consideration and advice. Of course, you all... Uh... You both have been an immense help to Maple Peak. There is no doubt that our town will grow into a prosperous settlement very soon. And no hard feelings to you, Donna. You are always welcome again. Right, yeah. See. Si. Goodbyes are difficult. Perhaps then I should not say goodbye. But say, I will see you all later. Yes, we'll see you later, Qual. Argothrax emerges from the forest to wave off your Arakokra friends, and the party sets off to Melodia City, visible from the edge of the forest. The sun is beginning to set. Surely, once you reach the town, the inn will be bustling with customers, new and old friends to meet again for a drink. With that... I think we should wrap up the episode. Thank you all so much for watching. Barak, it's been an honor to have you on as a player. If you could, stay back after the episode so I can take your character sheet and make note of some things. Sure thing. I really enjoyed my time, Ben. Is he really? Yeah. No, not my sweet buddy. No. It'll be all right, Joe. We can all still get together for lunch or something. All right, I guess I'll see you then. Bye, guys. It's been fun. All right. Can I see your character sheet, Barack? Here it is. I don't know what you have planned, Ben, but it sounds interesting. I've got something cooking. And this allows you to take the short vacation you had been wanting to take while not messing up the story. I feel bad for Joe and Donald, though. Well, I have been planning on killing one of you for the benefit of the story. Jesus, Ben. It's not like I'm a sadist or something but it'll make this next arc in the story all the more interesting. Right, you mentioned the possibility of a new class. If you don't want to multi-class, I understand, but the option is open to you. Let me know. Okay, I'll give it some thought and let you know before the special session coming up. I won't say more, so please look forward to our upcoming session. You'll have a better understanding of what's going on once we sit down to play then. I also need to organize another player to join in order to make the table more interesting. I have someone in mind, but we'll have to see if they can clear their busy schedule for us. All right. I'm really looking forward to the session now. Can't imagine what's going to happen. But Merrick is sort of dead, isn't he? We'll have to wait and find out. What uh, does that mean? There is much to come. I don't want to spoil too much. It's going to be an episode no one wants to miss. With that, we'll close off for real this time. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, if you made it this far, scream at Ben for killing off Merrick, but put it under another comment so you don't spoil the surprise for other viewers. Sure. Yell at me if you want, just as long as you like the video and subscribe. We'll see you all next time.